Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Happy Saturday. Welcome to day three of ThinkyCon, the final day. Woohoo. It's gone relatively smoothly so far. Um, <laughs> hopefully, that continues. Hopefully, we don't have any major like internet connection issues. It's kind of surprising we haven't. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm totally just jinxing it right now. On uh, could somebody in the chat please tell me if everything's good and I can be heard? All that good stuff that would be useful to know uh and hello hello yes this kind of sounds like i can be heard people would be saying other things <laughs> if i couldn't <laughs> Alrighty. um so yeah uh as usual um uh, the schedule, if you want to check out like, what's coming up today, like it's it's an action-packed day. I think it's probably the most packed day because all the talks are half an hour long. Um, so if you want to see what's coming up, head to thinkgames.com slash thinkycon. Uh, and the schedule's there and it should show you in your time zone. It should be useful. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and then... Uh, and just as a general reminder, any questions in the YouTube live chats, um, I'll treat, kind of try and keep track of during the talks. Uh, but I understand for the first talk, uh, the speaker is going to be in the chat answering questions. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then uh, also any extra questions that we don't get time to answer during the day, uh, we can take to the Discord, which is thinkgames.com slash Discord. If you're not there already, you can join via that URL. Uh, and there are threads for each talk where you can ask your questions. And just to repeat things I've said before, but in case somebody's joining for the first time, we have a newsletter. We're on various different social media platforms. Please head to thinkgames.com and you'll find those things. You can join our newsletter, which is really neat, and our social media, which is really neat. It's all really neat. It's also going to give you more thinky games. That's what we want. Uh, and then... Um, uh, once again, another reminder that the talks will all be available afterwards. The VODs of the streams will be available immediately after the stream's finished, uh, but we'll also be cutting them up and uploading the talks individually in the coming days uh, when I get around to it, I guess. Um, alrighty, so our first talk of the day comes from B Deshi Dev, who is in the chat, Fahim Faisal. Not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but B Deshi Dev uh, is in the chat and it's a recorded presentation, uh, but he's in the chat and can answer anything that comes up uh, while it's going. So uh, let me go set that up and be back in a second with a talk for you all. Interaction charts. How to know and pace what your players know. This is me, Bidish Dev, for ThinkyCon 2024. So let's start with who I am. Uh, I'm a hobbyist and a developer who's been making small games for a few years. I've made a few puzzle games where the focus was on mechanics that are intentionally break the game. So this is a previous game, Control Override, and one of the things you can do is then grow the platform so that you're inside of it. And using that physics bug, you can bypass the lasers. So this is an example of using intentional physics bugs as mechanics in control override and in my current game compress space uh, has a, a space folding mechanic which you can see demonstrated in the gif uh, as you might expect this mechanic breaks the game in half in a good way and the game is built around that so as my games feature weird mechanics uh, tutorialization is something important to nail and this talk is about several design tools i'm using for a compress space for this purpose the background of this talk is that uh, a month ago I was in the exploratory phase for development for Compress Space. I made about 50 puzzles across different mechanics, but I wasn't sure how to organize present them. So my first thought was to use typical digits. Uh, in most puzzle games tend to have a saw or sine wave like difficulty curve, where you have a set of levels based on some mechanic or something, and the difficulty starts from low to high and draw in peaks and after peaking uh, it drops off at the next set of levels and which introduce a new mechanic or so, uh, something and then it, the, it repeats that pattern uh, across the whole set of levels for the game 
However, I had a lot of mechanics, and some levels combine multiple mechanics together. Level A and B can be closed difficulty-wise while still having different mechanics, but it might not make sense to put them sequentially. So my next thought was to have mechanic level difficulty chart. I'd have separate difficulty charts for mechanic. For example, in the first level set, the green mechanic is in introduced at lower difficulty and it peaks at the end. And in the level set 2, the red mechanic is in introduced at lower difficulty and it peaks and it the green mechanic is used as well. And it, However, it is used as a different difficulty level from the level set 1. However, this still had a problem. It wasn't granular enough for me. So, one way of thinking about mechanics is wide versus deep. A mechanic is wide if it has multiple independent aspects that need to be taught separately. A mechanic is deep if at least one aspect of the mechanic has a lot of room for exploration. And by aspect, I'm meaning some sort of research or interaction of the mechanic. An example of a deep mechanic would be pushing boxes. Even vanilla Sokoban can have really easy to uh, extremely hard levels just based on block pushing. Most mechanics are something at least somewhat wide. Two levels under a white mechanic can have similar difficulty but focus on different aspects of the mechanic and it wouldn't make sense to put them sequentially based on that. In compressed spaces case, uh, space folding is at least a wide mechanic. It could have simple interactions like the one on the left where you fold the gap and then you push the block across which is a natural interaction. And unnatural interactions are the one on the left where repeatedly folding vertically into a single line and then you jump over it and you unfold it to get a huge vertical height boost. So this is a really weird niche interaction that is uh, very hard to teach. So how can we ensure proper tutorialization across a whole host of aspects such as this? In other words, mechanics are not an effective unit for tutorialization. In fact, most puzzle games teach mechanics in a very small scope. They have a very simple level where you can do at most one interaction with the mechanic and then subsequent levels introduce more interactions slowly. So, um, puzzle games tend to use teach mechanics on the interaction level. So, what if I made an interaction level difficulty chart? So, uh, before we proceed, let's define what interaction is. I'm saying that interaction is any specific action or behavior that a mechanic allows for. And interaction can involve one or more mechanics. Here is an example of a single mechanic interaction. Pushing the box only involves the box mechanic. Here is an example of an interaction with multiple mechanics. I'm creating a gap by horizontal folding and then pushing the box and letting it fall to clear the way. So this utilizes three mechanics, horizontal folding, the boxes, and gravity. As for how I actually make interaction charts, I basically just went through each mechanic I had across those 50 levels. Then for each mechanic, I listed the interactions involving that mechanic and then went through all the levels and for each level i listed each interaction the level utilizes and the difficulty level for it and if the difficulty was zero the and then it would be a tutorial level and a hundred for the max difficulty and instead of ge generating the charts by hand i made an edited tool for programmatically generating the interaction charts so this is the edited tool i made for dealing with the interaction charts um it is fully data driven so I'm representing each interaction as a scriptable object which is a unity specific asset format for storing data. This is the one for the laser mechanic and as you can see it lists the interactions for the mechanic. There are seven interactions here. Uh, one of which is the laser activist power source interaction which involves the laser mechanic and the laser power source mechanic. Uh, this is a, a multi mechanic interaction. Similarly, there's an interaction walls block laser, uh, which only involves the laser mechanic. Uh, I'm not representing walls as a mechanic in the game currently, but you could. Uh, similarly, this is the uh, suitable object for the black hole mechanic. It lists five interactions, and we can see that all of the interactions involve the laser mechanic. So we can assume that the black hole mechanic uh, tends to interact a lot with the laser mechanic. Uh, now, as for the levels, I also have a scriptable object per level. Uh, this is the one for uh, for the laser into fold one level. And we can see uh, for each level, I'm listing the interactions utilized by the level. Uh, this level utilizes three interactions. Move into fold by vertical fold. Move bend laser into fold through black hole. Bend laser through hole interaction. And for each interaction, I'm also listing the difficulty the level utilizes it in. So these two interactions, the level is utilizing them as zero difficulty. So the laser into fold one level it could be thought of as a tutorial level for these. Uh, the other interaction, bend laser through hole interaction, is present at a difficulty of nine. So this level is actually testing the interaction at a higher difficulty. So this is not a tutorial level for this interaction. 
and we can see the charts on the left each line or curve in is uh, the difficulty chart for a particular interaction for example this is the one for the bend laser through hole interaction and the points on the chart represent levels so this is the one for the level 47 which is laser into fold one this is the one for the level 51 which is laser into fold two and the height uh, or the value of the chart at a particular point level is the difficulty for that interaction so at uh, this level laser into fold one has uh, the interaction bend laser through hole at a difficulty of nine and we can see the progression of the interaction bend laser through hole throughout this chart it um, started at zero difficulty in this level black hole light bending one and then progressed to um, three difficulty in this level um, level a uh, black hole light bending two and then continued and we can it peaked at the difficulty of nine in this level laser into fold one and after peaking it was present in this level at difficulty eight laser into fold two so as we can see the interaction chart gives uh, us a view of the interactions progression in difficulty throughout a se sequence of levels so I'm using several notations here. Um, a so you can see that for this interaction, some of the points are square shaped, while some are um, circle shaped, and some of the lines are filled, while some are dotted. Um, in my game, there are levels that are optional, and ones that are on the critical path. The ones in the critical path are represented with a circle shape and a filled line, and the ones on the optional path are with the square shape and. Uh, with a dotted line so this level no umbrella has a square shape and is an optional level optional levels can afford to have much higher difficulty so it's worth using different notation for them to see if any spike in the chart is due to an optional level or not in the case for my game another bit of notation i'm using are these concentric circles so this level um laser uh, parallel uh, fold it does have multiple interactions which are represented by these concentric circles uh, if you look at the level then we can see that lists three interactions each of which are at zero difficulty now if i do these points normally then these points would overlap each other and i would have no way to know like this point if it it had this uh, single circle belong to one interaction or multiple interactions easily uh, so when the level has multiple interactions at the same difficulty level oh then i just draw the points bigger so that uh, i can visually see that this level has multiple interactions and if I hover on them, I can and find out which interaction it is. So that's the just I add a little bit of notation to make it easier. Now these are the interaction charts for the laser mechanic, and all of the interactions here involve the laser mechanic in some way. Uh, but these levels could also involve other me mechanics, and it would be helpful to visualize that. So the tool also does that. So if I turn that on, it will visualize those mechanics as well, and it's a bit of a mess. But I'll try to explain. Um, so the interaction charts or curves with the squiggly lines happen to be interactions that don't involve the laser mechanic. For example, this uh, interaction chart is for the gates block fold interaction, which only utilizes the gate. This one uh, is for the gates open when powered interaction, which also utilizes the gate. And none of these ha involve the laser. And this level utilizes the laser interaction, laser into fold two, and several non-laser interactions such as the gates block fold, gates open and powered, and gates uh, out of fold through hole interaction. So with this, we can see uh, which other mechanic, a given mechanic or interaction, tends to appear with uh, across your level sequence. However, uh, as you can see, it's quite visually messy and hard to understand. There is actually a better chart format for this, for uh, tracking this thing specifically, which I will go get to a bit later in the uh, talk. Now, interaction charts have several traits that I've observed while trying to use them. I've said before that the difficulty charts in puzzle games tend to follow the saw or sine wave pattern, where it starts low, increases, peaks at the end of the set of levels, and then the whole arcing pattern repeats across the rest of the level sequence for the whole game. Now, interaction charts also follow a similar arc shape, however, not quite this in the same way as um, normal difficulty charts. For example, for the laser mechanic, these are the interaction charts, and this one, um, what well, laser can fold, starts at this level, level 30, at difficulty of zero, and then uh, it reaches its peak in this level, um, laser parallel fold two, 
a, a difficulty of six but it continued to be used beyond that level a, beyond that point uh, at the same difficulty level in laser fall three or at a lower difficulty level in of three at backflip laser and a, what's interesting is that the uh, there's another interaction uh, lasers activate power source that is utilized in level 43 and you can see the level 43 uh, this, this interaction follows a different path it is introduced at zero difficulty in black hole light bending 2 and then used alongside the um, a laser can fold interaction in the uh, back to laser level and then continues to be uh, used and reaches the peak of difficulty 8 in swapper rule level uh, the swapper rule level so uh, by plotting all the interaction charts for all interactions for a given mechanic in this case the laser we can see the uh, introduction and uh, tutorialization and the growth of a single interaction throughout its level sequence which is uh, level 30 to level 61 alongside other interactions we can also see how they're combining with each other so this is how interaction charts let you uh, visualize the player's knowledge progression across a given sequence of levels now i've said before that interaction charts only have points for the level rules that the interaction or mechanic is used in or the black hole mechanic this is the set of levels now assuming you're grouping your levels by mechanic then uh, the interaction charts for a given mechanic would exist only within that group in most cases and we can definitely see that the black hole mechanic x group is this and it only exists within this group let's look at a mechanic that doesn't do that so this is the interaction chart for the blocker box or the pushable or neatable box that i've shown a bit a while ago and we can see that has a lot of interactions and it, it looks a bit more chaotic than the previous one and it also involves a lot of um, optional levels than the previous one but um uh, let's ignore that uh we you can see that the most of the levels for the blocker box mechanic are located in this range level 13 to level 29 however there's a single level um no umbrella which utilizes the, which utilizes the uh, blocker box mechanic um the a uh, it uses the box pull box push and the close horizontal gap and push interactions involving the box now if we see the other interactions present this level we'll see this one so while blocks laser so the blocker box mechanic despite mostly being used in this group oh, is also present in this group and also the laser mechanic and if we go back to the uh, laser level a interaction charts then we can see that the laser span of um, levels also you know involves level 40 here now when a given mechanic exists beyond its initial set of levels then this means that the mechanic has interactions beyond what I we in the initial scope I planned for it in this case the box had additional interactions with lasers so that's why it showed up beyond its group in a level involving lasers interaction charts have several other traits that can provide further insight for example the span of an interaction chart tells you the, the span of levels it uh, is the given interaction is present in. for example this interaction pen laser through hole starts at level 41 and level ends at level 51 so it is present in the levels in the span and we and this interaction um lasers activate power source starts at level 42 and then aids in a level 46 so that's a level 42 to 46 is span for this interaction and we can see the spans of each interaction and see, we can see how they overlap so we can keep, better keep track of which interactions we are introducing and how many interactions we are trying to push on the player at a given more uh, level Another interesting trait of interaction charts is the number of points in the chart. Uh, the more points, the more levels the interaction is used in. For example, this interaction, Ben Laser Through Hole, is used in five levels, whereas this interaction, Ben Laser Through Into Fold Through Black Hole, is used in two levels. Consider some extreme cases. For example, uh, if the interaction chart only has one point, for example, this uh, uh, inter interaction Ben laser out of fold through hole is present in the laser into fold 2 level at zero difficulty so this is the only level with this interaction so maybe it's a, either a gimmicky interaction or maybe we just haven't managed to explore it enough the shape of the curve is also of interest for example this interaction atomic block blocks laser only has a flat curve so maybe we could uh, introduce new levels easier and harder levels to make the arc more curvier or this uh, this interaction chart uh, Ben multiple laser through same hole has a very sharp rise from zero to six. So maybe we can introduce some intermediate levels else to smoothen out the curve or uh, add more levels after this to make the curve uh, longer.
regardless by plotting it in interaction chart we can clearly see cases like this where we can expand the game further so what is the benefit of this whole approach the first is better understanding by breaking down each level in terms of interactions we get a clear idea of what each level requires slash teaches and this lends to identify gaps or spikes in the player's knowledge progression and then add levels or reorder them to smooth out the curve Another benefit is that we can visualize the player's knowledge progression across a game level sequence, across multiple interactions and see how they combine across these uh, levels. And we can also see which mechanics or interactions a given mechanic uh, often appears with. Another big benefit is that this is fully data driven. If I see issues in progression, I can reorder levels and regenerate the charts. And also the shape of the interaction charts give me a guide for how I should be organizing the level. For reference, this is how the interaction chart looked when I just had a random assortment of levels. As you can see, it's all over the place as expected. But when I made this interaction chart tool, I knew that I'd be expecting to see arcs like this. And I simply just um, kept on reordering the levels until a, I could get the arcs to look nice. And then if I found any gaps in, in the uh, interactions, uh, like it didn't start at a, a low enough difficulty to teach properly, then I would make more levels. So utilizing that, uh, I could uh, easily organize my say, set of 50 levels. The other thing is that li listing interactions for each level gives you a lot of data. And that data can be used for more than just interaction charts. For example, since we know the interactions for each level and the mechanics a given interaction uses, we can generate a puzzle matrix. And we don't have to stop there. Uh, we can generate interaction matrix that is instead of pairing mechanics we can pair interactions this gives me gave me an adx80 mat matrix which is too large to be useful but let's try something smaller we make an interaction matrix for a single mechanic that is we make every possible pair of interactions for that mechanic this gives a quick rundown of possible utilizations of a single mechanic and also try generate the interaction matrix for a pair of mechanics so this gives us an idea of all possible ways we can combine two mechanics together so, uh, so for example, the the, the bend laser interaction uh, paired with the uh, move hole to bend light out out interaction uh, for the black hole, about in about two levels. So the data from interaction charts can be used in more than just matrices. So this is what I'm calling a mechanic level evolution chart for the laser mechanic, and the way this works is that when the mechanic is a uh, paired with a uh, new uh, mechan different mechanic that we have haven't seen before so far in this level sequence uh, the chart goes up for example for the laser mechanic it occurs first in this level laser parallel fold and the chart goes up by one level there and then in this level straight shot it is paired with the new mechanic blocker box and we can and then in the next level um no umbrella it is paired with the black hole and laser parsers mechanic so we can see that while the first occurrence of a, 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 another mechanic with this uh, laser mechanic increases the height of the chart, uh, subsequent appearances of the same mechanic uh, are represented via um, checkered squares, whereas the first uh, occurrence is represented via field square. And the subsequent occurrences while do not increase the height of the chart. So basically, the chart is only increases in height when we pair the mechanic with a new me mechanic that we haven't seen before. For reference, let's look at the evolution charts for other mechanics, for example, the pushable box mechanic or blocker box. So it occurs first in the common ground level and with, alongside the gate and switch uh, mechanics. And we, as we can see that the mechanic is paired quite often with the gate and switches. Uh, and then on subsequent levels, it is paired with the horizontal folding, vertical folding, horizontal fold blocker, the stations and so on. So as we saw in the interaction charts, uh, we could visualize which parts, which other mechanics it was present with, but it was very hard and messy to follow. This is a clearer format for um, analyzing uh, how which mechanics a given mechanic appears with. Hence, I'm calling it the mechanical level evolution chart because it charts the uh, growth of the mechanic. So this is useful for figuring out how you're pacing the mechanic and how often you are and when you are introducing or combining the mechanic with um, other mechanics across your level sequence. And this is another chart format that I'm calling the interaction level evolution chart. It is the same idea as the mechanical evolution chart. However, this is for interactions. So this is for the blocker box mechanic and the chart here goes up every time we, we have an interaction that we have not seen before utilizing the blocker box mechanic.
for example it was first <clears throat> seen in this level the common ground one and we started with the box push interaction the gates open when powered interaction the box gravity fall interaction and the box activate switch interaction and then in the next level that uh, we're seeing that the it is paired with more new uh, interactions such as box blocks fall cross caps box pull and so on so we can this is a pacing tool to keep track of when you're introducing new interactions involving a given mechanic now in comparison to the mechanical level evolution chart um, this will be mu much taller because there are more interactions than mechanics it's more granular both are useful for pacing and give you different idea ideas about different aspects of uh, how you're pacing the levels another benefit is validation we have difficulty values for each level across multiple interactions so we can write code that does basic validation for example we can check if the first occurrence of interaction is a tutorial at zero difficulty we can share if it check if any tutorial level tries to introduce multiple mechanics and so on so this is a basic sanity check but um, the data driven approach is what allows us to do this data also doesn't have to come from interaction charts if, for example they can come from analytics uh, we can estimate the completion time of a level based on how many interactions it has and chart it alongside the actual completion times taken from analytics so uh, i'm using a simple um formula for that here i'm estimating the difficulty based on the interactions i have I have a flat a uh, base difficulty and then add to it based on how many interactions the level has so this gives a very bad approximation of difficulty but it gives it in terms of the complexity of the level the amount of interactions it uses the accuracy doesn't matter the shape does so i plot it and and what i'm actually looking for is if the uh, spikes of the curve align with the spikes in the uh, actual analytics data. The red one is my estimate and the green or blue one are, are the correct ones from the data. We can see that it sort of aligns in some cases but in, on particular levels it is much higher my, and we can see that for this level the estimate is much higher than what it actually is. So maybe my perception of the level and this actual difficulty is different. So what are the issues with this? Uh, first thing is since it's, it is uh, a chart, it requires a linear sequence of levels. Uh, but this doesn't mean that you can have a linear path. Um, as said before, my game has a critical path with optional levels as branches. And I just uh, create a linear sequence by taking the critical path and then adding the optional levels. For example, this is level 24, level 25, then the, some bon sequence of bonus levels, and then level 26 again. So it's easy if your game is mostly linear, otherwise you can still create a chart from some ordering levels such as grouping them based on a mechanic, then sorting them based on difficulty, or you can generate a sequence from some graph traversal. Elephant in the room is that leveling interactions takes time. Uh, to, to this I have to say that you are never at 100% productivity and the leveling is a low effort task and I mostly labeled my set of levels when I was commuting from my full time job. And secondly, you don't have to label everything, you can still get benefits if you level things partially. So to summarize, when should you be using interaction charts? Firstly, when your level structure easily allows for it, i.e. mostly linear, or your mechanics are wide, or you want to better understand pacing and tutorialization across your levels, across multiple mechanics and interactions, or you want to exhaustively explore every combination of interactions and mechanics. By simply thinking of interesting combinations of interactions, we can come up with level ideas. So this can be another tool in your tool set in addition to puzzle matrices. Thank you for listening and if you have any questions you can reach out to me on twitter or you can check out my games on bdhdev.isha.io thanks loved it that was awesome thank you bdhdev for that talk amazing visualizations i've seen like people do like attempt to track similar things in like spreadsheets but never with such cool visualizations uh so that's super neat once again um since that was a pre-recorded talk uh and we'll be moving on to the next talk now if you have any extra questions there is a thread in discord thinkinggamescom slash discord that you can join the discord you can go to that thread in the talks channel and you can ask any additional questions yeah that was a wonderful talk indeed agreed all right folks um just gonna go uh set up for the next talk so see you in a moment
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are here with our next speaker, Mari Nolan, who is going to tell us some things about escape rooms and their intersection with video games. Very exciting. So uh, just a quick reminder, if any questions come up throughout the talk, please post them in the YouTube live chat uh, and tag Thinky Games to make it easier for me to see them. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we'll take questions in Discord afterwards um, if we don't get around to answering them all. Anyway, over to you, Mari. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. So thanks so much to everyone watching for coming to my talk. Let's get into it. So my name is Mari. Nice to meet you all. I'm based in the United Kingdom, and I am, as Joe just said, going to be talking about escape rooms as thinky video games beyond the screen. So as it says on screen now, I'm a thinky game designer by trade. More specifically, I work freelance across a lot of mediums from like escape rooms, board games, video games, basically anything that has some kind of puzzle or thinky element, count me in, I love that kind of stuff. And when I'm not designing games, I like playing them. So of all the different types of thinky games that exist in the world, I like escape rooms best. In fact, as of last Sunday, and actually this slide is wrong, it says 450. As of last Sunday, I've played 448 rooms. I was a little bit overconfident that I would just manage to squeeze two more rooms in, but close enough. Um, but yeah, that's who I am. And so knowing all of that, it will come as absolutely no surprise that the topic of conversation is going to be escape rooms. More specifically, I'm going to talk for the next half an hour about the origins of the escape room industry as an example of thinky video games beyond the screen. So where like thinky video games and escape rooms sit in relation to one another in like history, I guess. So I'm going to touch upon the history. I'm going to touch upon the overlaps between video games and escape rooms. And then I'm going to pivot more to talk about like the shared lessons between the two genres before rounding off with a few thoughts about like, where do I think the beyond the screen genre will go next? So like, where is the industry now? Where I expect it to go next? And then, yeah, if there's time to questions at the end, we can have those at the end. So if you're watching, as Joe said, if you're watching on a live, drop them in YouTube, or I will be on the Discord afterwards. Um, there is a channel for this chat and I'll be in there all afternoon. So yeah, lots to discuss. Let's get started. First of all, what is an escape room? Biggest question. So I've just, I've written on the screen that a physical, an escape room is a physical experience where teams of players are locked in a room in order to play a game requiring them to solve a series of puzzles within a certain amount of time to accomplish a goal, typically finding the key to unlock the room. However, more complicated than that. As you can see, I'm also going to go through the history about like that definitions change a little bit of time. I mean, today we more imagine it sort of like typical gameplay is you're locked in a room for 60 minutes. You're going to be finding keys. You're going to be deciphering clues, rummaging through drawers, pushing mysterious buttons and seeing what they do. Basically, it's like a physical location, but you're fully immersed in the designed environment to solve puzzly adventure challenges. So my next question is, well, how long have they been around? And the answer to that is it depends. Escape rooms are a very, very new industry. So I've got a little timeline here and I've pulled out a couple of key dates. Um, we could go back as far as the 1980s to see something in similar in the form of like British TV shows like Crystal Maze and the Adventure Games long before I was born. But so I'm told they were very escape roomy. Um, it wasn't until sort of 2003, 2004 and 2007 when you start seeing actual escape rooms that players could actually come and physically play in a physical location. And then, of course, sort of from beyond 2011, they kind of take off across the world. So they start in Japan, but then they kind of roll out across Europe and they roll out across North America. Sort of 2014 and beyond, I would say, is when they get really popular in North America. But typically, as like an escape room enthusiast and someone who talks about the history a lot, I like to pinpoint that 2007 date as kind of one of the most important ones in escape room history. So the company up on the screen is called Scrap. They were kind of like the first people who actually sat down and were like, we have this concept of an escape room and we're going to make an escape room and we're going to call it an escape room and it's going to be the first escape room. So they, when people say, what's the first escape room? I say it's Scrap. But I'll get into a little bit more detail on that in just a second, because what I actually want to do on this slide is I want to focus on the definition for a little bit longer. If I go in with my imaginary pen and paper and I cross out the words physical and a team of, I want you guys to hold the new definition in your mind. So it becomes then an experience where players are locked in a room in order to play a game, requiring them to solve a series of puzzles within a certain amount of time to accomplish a goal 
typically to find the key to unlock the room. Cool. And that sort of sounds like a video game, right? So I'm going to go further and I'm actually going to start listing off a couple of like thinky video games that predate escape rooms by a long time. And we can talk about how many of those actually fit the definition and why. So first of all, I've got this game called Behind Closed Doors. So this was like a text-based adventure from the 80s in which you played the Balrog and you've been locked in your room by mischief makers and you have to escape. The second one I'm going to mention is um, Mist, 1993. So that's a first person point and click adventure. It still exists today in various different forms like virtual reality. And you basically wander around this island solving very escape room like puzzles to unlock more of the island to sort of, well, eventually succeed and escape. The next one is The Seventh Guest, also from 1993. So this one is a very theatrical puzzle adventure set in a haunted mansion where you go from room to room, I guess, to escape. And I say I guess because I'm actually still playing this game. I'm playing the virtual reality version of it, so no spoilers. I'm assuming you escape at the end, but I could be wrong. Uh, the next one on my list is uh, Motas, so the mystery of time and space. Again, similar thing. You solve riddles, puzzles, and escape from locked rooms. And last, but definitely by no means least, I've also got The Crimson Room from 2004. This one's super important. It's talked about all the time in the escape room world as being like the first of its kind as well. So how many of these fit the definition? I would say literally all of them. And actually, I would love anyone in the chat to drop more names of like puzzle games that fit this definition from like before the first escape rooms, if only because I want to then go away and play them. But yeah, there are absolutely tons of them. I mean, even if we take one of them, so like if I pause on the Crimson Room, because I found an old save file very recently and I got to play it quite recently. And the opening line was this. I drank too much last night. I thought, what time is it now? I felt thirst of the throat. The bed was different from usual. Is this a hotel? No, it does not seem like a hotel. I'm shut up. I have to escape. That, my friends, is literally an escape room. In fact, it sounds like the briefing I've had to like hundreds of different escape rooms. So it's perfect. Textbook escape room. But then I pose the question, if escape rooms already existed, then why did we, well, go and make escape rooms and call them something totally different? And that's basically the topic of this talk. So it's like escape rooms as the early thinky games that went beyond the screen into reality. So going back to this slide for a second, because I want to just stay on the history for a little bit longer. If we consider that real life and like video game world aren't so different, we can point to loads of examples of times where physical activities in the real world also have a video game counterpart. So even thinking about the most popular video games today and the ones I play all the time, like not just in the thinky genre, essentially a lot of them are real life activities that we just recreated in a digital format. And I'm not just talking about games like Lawn Mowing Simulator, which is an absolutely fantastic game. I'm talking about like even older games like tennis turned into Pong or like you could say Lego became Minecraft or like the very normal activity of commanding an army and invading your enemies became total war game or like quitting your job and living on a farm became like Stardew Valley. So all that to say is video games like overlapping with real life is not a new thing. It just usually happens that way around. We take an activity we like in real life and we're like, oh, let's make a digital gamified version of it. Um, but what is so important about escape rooms is I think this is one of the best examples we have of this happening the exact opposite. So like a digital experience being taken into the real life. Um, many of these designers literally of the, like the companies you see up on your screen said that exact same thing. Like, here's a great thing happening in the digital space. We want to make it real. And if you want proof, I'm going to go back to Scrap. So Scrap is the 2007 one in Japan. And I pulled out two quotes from one of the designers of the very first escape room called The Real Escape Game. Um, their designer was called Takao Kato and I pulled these like quotes from different interviews. But essentially, the top one says that uh, I was thinking about doing some kind of new event and the girl sitting next to me said she was hooked on an online escape game. So I tried to make one. And that's the truth. Could not be more simple or more cut and dry. The second quote's a little bit different. It's actually more about books, but I think the rules still apply. So he said, I wondered what interesting things didn't happen in my life. No, why interesting things didn't happen in my life like it did in books. I thought I could create my own adventure, a story, and then invite people to be a part of it. I mean, that's how escape rooms were invented, I suppose. And one more interesting side note is the photo you guys see up on your screen actually isn't that very first room. It's an escape room that Scrap, I believe, are still running, but one of the rooms they run today. Interesting side note, because 
because even though we're only talking about 2007, this is ancient history in the escape room world. So these photos are just lost to time, I think. Again, if anyone can find one, please send me one. I'm so curious. But yeah, I like to think that like, while the technology has probably changed a lot, the concept hasn't changed that much. So this photo will do for now. But yeah, let's get back into it. So I have done a lot of explaining so far on the what. Now let's talk about the why. So why make an escape room? Why are they popular? What on earth is going on in this strange branch of the thinky game genre? Well, to be honest, I could talk about the topic for hours, but I only have like 20 minutes left. So here's the abridged version. I think escape rooms thrive because they're social activities. Um, I would even go so far as to say that since all of those early video games that I mentioned on the other slide, even, yeah, like the way human beings live and interact and communicate with one another has changed. On the one hand, you have things like the rise of the smartphone. But on the other hand, you have things like the total and complete integration of social media in our lives. So there are like a ton of studies that show things like the youth of today. And by that, I mean anyone millennial and younger spend a huge portion of their paychecks on experiences rather than stuff, at least compared to like any other group before it. So people are going out there and they're spending a lot of money on experiences, social activities, and then correlate that statistic with the fact that there was this big boom in escape rooms in like 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014 in the US. And I think just a lot of business owners saw escape rooms as like some kind of get rich quick scheme, which spoiler alert, you will definitely not get rich running an escape room. So please don't try. <laughs> but I think that's part of the reason they kind of took off. Video games, on the other hand, much more solo activity, and in particular, thinky video games. And for sure, there are loads of exceptions, like so many multiplayer thinky games that are absolutely fantastic. But in general, I think as a trend, the more puzzly thinky video games are a little bit more solo. And so today, despite being a lot more connected in terms of like my phone, my phone's right there, for example, like people can text me anytime, any day. Despite being more connected, I think as a society, people do feel more disconnected. So therefore, I do believe that like a lot of escape room success is bringing, a phys bringing the medium beyond the screen into a physical, tangible, and most importantly, social experience. I think there's like probably a parallel here to be made with how like people who love like first person shooter games, for example, feel going into paintball for the first time. But again, like here's the catch, uh, paintball predates like first person shooter games by probably a decade or so. So again, like many video games are created in the image of a real life activity, but very few things begin their life as a video game and then go on to see like big success outside of the screen, like beyond the screen in person. It's a unique case study and I think a unique challenge. But what do I mean by a unique challenge? I'm talking from the game design point of view. So what does it mean for us game designers? New slide. I realize there is so much going on this slide, by the way, but don't worry, I'm gonna share a copy of the slides in the Discord after, so you don't need to read anything, but I'll just, I'll just talk about it over the top. So yeah, game design theory, or as I like to name this slide, what did escape rooms steal from video games and what can video games steal back from escape rooms? So today we see video games everywhere in the escape room world. In the middle of the screen, I have the big old thinky tree where there are two divergent branches where video games and escape rooms came from. Honestly, if I was gonna plot the real thinky tree, this would be 0.01% of the thinky tree. But the part we're interested in today is escape rooms and video games. So the two genres branched off and now they do look kind of different. But yeah, what did they steal from one another? What can they take back? In thinking about escape rooms first, I think there are plenty that kind of incorporate gameplay mechanics and narratives and tropes from Thinky Games. So you have things like rooms that make good use of like a single use inventory system or like quest tracking or like checkpoints in an escape room. You've even got sort of real life rooms where like the gameplay itself is structured like a video game. And I'm thinking now specifically of like, during lockdown in the escape room world, we saw a lot of like live avatar escape rooms pop up where you could follow along on a video and literally control your games master around the room and be like, pick this up, jump, grab this kind of thing. You even have escape rooms today, which are basically based on video games. So not quite an escape room, but there's this experience called the Lara Croft immersive experience in London. I believe they've just announced their opening one in Seattle as well. And that's actually going to be run by one of my favorite escape rooms in Seattle called Hourglass Escapes. But I mean, yeah, you can't get any more like obvious than like an immersive puzzle experience literally based on a video game. And for all of that, 
I think escape rooms haven't forgotten their like thinky game origins and I love that but they do do a few things very differently so on this slide um I've pulled out a couple of like game design beats to discuss further obviously I could talk about this for hours but just a few off the top of my head for the purposes of this talk on the left hand side we've got uh, directing the players so unlike in a lot of video games with like a well-placed pop-up or a speech bubble, escape room designers generally don't get to control what the player's doing or even like what the players can do in a room, like what controls do they have available to them. So instead, we, we escape room designers, can draw their attention to things like creative lighting or the layout of a room to like point to a certain clue, like subtly or not so subtly. It can even go so far as like the games master running the escape room themselves, literally being like, you need to start here with this puzzle or this clue. Of course, players may not always go for those nudges. That's true of every game ever. I mean, I play a lot of games with my little brother and we sort of spend five minutes doing the quest and then we then we just try and clip through the walls or we like decide to fly towards the sun. Like we are not playing these games how you're supposed to be. And the same with escape rooms. I've seen people do the most bizarre things in escape rooms. Ask me about it later on Discord, it's hilarious. But anyway, I think one of the most interesting takeaways, the escape room, world in terms of that can give back to video games is like how do you handle game design when you're not using pop-ups or handy ui or a glowing object to indicate which item you can pick up again we can play with light sounds tools visual layout they're, they're all like excellent things that a good like level designer or a layout designer could use um but when we're thinking about thinking games even more important because the player's goal is to kind of get to the puzzle and solve the puzzle so you don't want to sort of overwhelm them with too much going on in a level you want to gently guide them and if that's not a pop-up if that's not ui then there's a question of what is that so yeah first game to the lesson the second one i wanted to mention is the inventory system so really quickly if you've ever played an escape room you probably heard the rule that like once you've used something it's done many escape rooms even give you a little box to put your items in so once you've used a lock once you've used a key you can put it in a box and it's done to the game designer and me, I'm like, that's just an inventory system. And yeah, it totally is. But it's now such a common room in escape rooms, like we take it for granted. Um, what I think the Thinky video game can learn back from that is about those limitations though. So unlike in a video game, I cannot, I don't know about you guys, but I cannot carry 10,000 health potions I'm never gonna use, 20 swords and 100 cheese wheels. I, I just can't do that. Escape room designers and escape room game masters have to be really delicate about what they do give their player, how many physical items are in the room, what needs to be carried from one room to the other. You have to take a single object and be a lot more clever with it. So even if it's just a simple piece of paper and it's like, here's your dossier for the mission you're gonna do in the escape room. What is that dossier and like, how can it be used later? Maybe there's something about an object or an item that then has to be used in a, in a new way. Cause you can't give the player hundreds of things taken with them. You can give them one or two and they have to be very clever use of space. So yeah, what does it mean for puzzle creation? It's, it's an interesting question about like the kind of limitations that we have on designing a puzzle for a physical space. The next um, thing just to mention is in my notes, I've written the first person experience, but on my slide it says player as character. Same thing. An interesting lesson borrowed from Thinky Games is this, well, all games, I guess, is the player as a character. So in a video game, you can be anyone, literally anyone. You can be human, animal, the dragonborn. You can fly kick someone off a mountain. You can you can be a superhuman person with special abilities. In escape rooms, not so much. You are just you. So you might sometimes be someone else. Like you might have a special ability or a job. I recently played a game. It was like an exploration theme game. And I got the role of like linguist. And so I had a keyword that I could decode secret text snippets hidden around the room. None of my other people on my team like had access to what I had, but it was very cool. Amazingly easy to code this stuff in video games. So as a designer of both, like I would kind of take something like that for granted. But in thinking of the way that game design theory that like, how could that apply the other way? In the escape room, we can't code special abilities. Like I might, I might be the linguist, but I'm still just Mari. I'm just Mari who has the key to solve this particular puzzle. And then I get my own personal like, yay, aha moment. And in some ways, that's a more interesting player moment than if I was someone else. And what I mean by that is like me, Mari, I solved the puzzle. I didn't use superhuman strength. I didn't cast a spell. It's a little bit more satisfying and it's for certain like not necessarily the right thing to do in every video game, but something I like to consider. Like is the player a character or is the player themselves? It's a good question. 
Um, last but not least, on the left hand side, tutorialization. Uh, all everyone, most people know what tutorialization is, so I'll just speak very briefly about like the escape room side. Super simple question in escape rooms. Most escape rooms do not have the time or the space to tutorialize puzzle solving. Most escape rooms are around 60 minutes long, maybe plus minus five minutes when the games master can give you a briefing, and but usually they just say don't break anything. So the game design challenge is someone who's not involved in the games master briefing, but who is maybe involved in the design of the room, is how do we tutorialize what the player does and how do we tutorialize how the player can solve a puzzle? And that's something that is borrowed from video games, like thinky video games all the time, like how to do that. There are so many amazing examples of this in video games. Like my favorite style of tutorialization is just trial and error, like with a gentle learning curve, just a little bit of trial and error in a very playful way. So I actually recently played the Lock Digital demo, which is just out and it's amazing by the way. But that game in particular has players discover new words and their magical effects through like simple trial and error. So you like, you write a little word and then it does a little magical effect and you're like, oh, okay, I've learned something. This is so similar to what you do in escape rooms. You find a lever, or you find like a weird little button, you push it, you make a mental note of what happened. And you're kind of like gently tutorialized through the different levels of puzzles you encounter in a good escape room. You can be very playful with it. You can be very physical with it. Um, and it has a similar kind of like tactile aha effect to playing like a very satisfying puzzle game in the same way. So yeah, because escape rooms rarely tutorialize the puzzle solving, it just throws people directly in. It poses an interesting question when you consider what the game design lesson taken back into thinky puzzle games as a video game is. Like, can it be more in world? Can it be more playful? What if we did away with the UI and the pop-ups? Like, what does that look like? I think, yeah, maybe yes, maybe you can do away with all those things and still make an excellent puzzle game. It's an interesting question when thinking about this more video game side of it. Which leads me to the second set of lessons I wanted to discuss super quickly under the header of game design theory. And these are things that a little bit flip that. It's like what escape rooms do well and what I borrow from escape rooms all the time for video games. So the first one, limitations and freedoms. I'll chat about them in the same way because in, in essence, they're basically the same. Unlike in a video game, all five senses are involved in escape room. So you've got smell, taste, sound, sight, touch. I've played amazing escape rooms where it was like a chocolate factory and everything smelled amazing. And I've played escape rooms where like you had loads of like little jars of things and you had to like sniff them and like taste them to figure out which was which and identify flavors. And um, I don't know about you, but I've never done that in a video game. Similar things, but not the same. You can't have a taste puzzle in a video game. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, but I'm very glad to be proven wrong. But what we can do with video games is play with a lot of other cool things. We can have time loops. We can have flying. We can have fly kicking bad guys across the mountain kind of thing. Like, But the point is still there. Across different mediums, we as designers get to play with different senses. And so no matter what sort of thinky game someone's designing, the takeaway from me is to think creatively about the rules of the constructed world. And what I mean by this is escape rooms we're constrained by silly, trivial, trivial things like laws of physics and gravity. But as a designer, that's kind of cool to like be constrained by something and have to design around a challenge. Maybe in a video game, we can't have a taste puzzle, but maybe you can have a puzzle where you eat something and it affects some other aspect of the reality of the game or gives you another clue that you see in a different way. Like there are very fun ways to play creatively, but within the constructed rules and the reality of the game world that an individual puzzle game is set up to be. But yeah, and then the last thing on my just uh, I was about to skip slide then, but I just remembered audience very quickly. Understanding audience. This goes for creating any puzzle game ever, but more specifically with escape rooms, we get the added challenge of playing with the size of teams. So it could be as few as two players, could be up to 12 players, but you don't want in a, the biggest escape room, one person solving and 11 people standing around watching. So considering things like the specific demographics of a group is incredibly important for escape rooms. And yeah, goes without saying, but I love to pull that back into video games as well. Like maybe the player, maybe it's a single player game. So maybe there isn't a second player and they're working with them. But how do I split the puzzle across different places to allow for a player to explore? How do the players interact with the NPCs? Where are the clues kind of like mixed up? If we think about the environment as another player, it's a very fun way to kind of imagine different design challenges. So yeah, game design theory, big topic 
many thoughts. If you want to discuss this further, I'm all is, but I will otherwise just skip to the final point of my presentation, which is the future. So if I'm saying that thinky games beyond the screen are escape rooms, what happens in the future? Well, put simply, I don't know, but I can make some educated guesses. First of all, will the escape room industry continue to grow? Honestly, no, we've hit market saturation. Since 2020, the number of escape rooms in, like have been declining year on year. But what we do see instead is we see different things popping up. So escape rooms grew in popularity because designers took thinky games and thought, let's make this a real thing. And now we see it with other genres. So there's this really amazing experience in London called Phantom Peak, which is basically I've never played Red Dead Redemption, but I would describe it as Red Dead Redemption in person. It's like a massive Wild West world where you can like find puzzles and talk to NPCs and like discover things and log your points and track your badges and stuff. Amazing concept of almost like an open world RPG, but again, in a real physical experience. We also see sort of the rise of like the popularity of games in like China. I think they're called like murder rooms. And it's a multi billion dollar industry where you go and you dress up as a character and you solve a murder and you sort of have a scripted interaction with actors and other players. And yeah, if if murder mysteries aren't thinky games, then I don't know what are. But another example of another genre of thinky game beyond the screen that I barely even touched upon, which could have a whole separate presentation about it. And that's not even taking into account emerging like technological advances. So virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, it gets better and better every year. And every year I'm excited to see the kind of thinky games that are coming out of those. So for sure, if I had to say one thing I would expect to see in the next five to 10 years, a massive explosion of amazing technologies and assume that's whatever you, I don't know what these technologies are yet because I haven't seen them, but I would expect to be seeing amazing technologies, creating really amazing puzzles in different ways. So yeah, that's pretty much all for me. I've tackled a lot in a very short amount of time. Hopefully I've managed to impart some kind of thinky game knowledge or interesting things to think about. As I say, um, I might not have time to answer questions now because I'm glancing at the time, but I will be in the Discord if anyone wants to chat. Anything escape room, thinky games, anything at all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mari. Uh, yes, there's not much time for questions, sadly. Uh, although you did answer one of them anyway, just through your talk. Oh, amazing. Um, <laughs> so he was asking about the future, what you thought about the future of escape rooms, so that was your last slide. Perfect. Oh. <laughs> um, so yes, any other questions that uh, you have, please take them to discordthinkinggames.com slash discord. There's a thread in the talks channel there for this talk. Uh, and once again, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Mari. Uh, it makes me want to go do more escape rooms. <laughs> I really wish I did more do of them. Do it. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm going to go set up for the next talk. Um, and once again, thank you uh, to Mari. Alrighty, folks, time for the next talk. Uh, for this talk, we have another pre-recorded one sent to us by Dom Camus um, about, well, it's called Puzzles Are for Supervillains, uh, which sounds very fun. Um, before anybody asks, this, this, I'm sure there'll be questions about it anyway, but this talk does not have slides. It is purely, you just get to look at Dom's face for 25 minutes. It's wonderful. <laughs> that's how it's intended to be uh and of course because i'm not sure if dom's in the chat uh i know he has been for some of the uh, uh some of the talks previously i'm not sure if he's around but uh you'll be able to ask questions in discord anyway let me just go set it up and we'll be back in a second
Good afternoon, ThinkEcon. I'm Don Camus, and uh, this is my talk about how puzzles are for supervillains. So, I started thought, thinking about this when I was chatting to someone about Alexander the Great and the Gordian Knot. And I imagine that most of you know about the Gordian Knot, but I'll just briefly summarise. So Alexander the Great was in the process of invading Persia, which uh, is not a small job. Uh, he came to a place where there was a, an ox cart tied up with a, a large and complicated knot and was informed that there was a prophecy that the land would come to be ruled by whoever could separate the cart from the post. And, you know, this uh, untying this knot was obviously going to be a, a very tricky puzzle. So, in the, uh, in the version of the story which we now typically hear, Alexander drew his sword and cut through the knot. Uh, by separating the cart from the post, as instructed, uh, and indeed he did go on to become the ruler of the land, so the prophecy was fulfilled. Um, when this is discussed on the internet, uh, it's, often, it's often pointed out that Alexander had a huge army with him, and although uh, this place was the, um, the capital of the old kingdom of Phrygia, this is Gordian, the place where the the Gordian knot was. Um, nonetheless, there was no real possibility of, of resisting his army. It was enormous. So um, so it sort of made sense to say, oh yeah, you know, you cut the knot. You, you Genius, you're a genius. You fulfilled the prophecy. So now we don't need to fight you. Um, but in fact, uh, like, um, like many myths, uh, there's more than one version of this story. And the version of the story that we have that is Arguably, I mean, I'm not a historian, but it's arguably closest to history because it is allegedly um, based on an account from someone who was there at the time. Um, tells the story a bit differently. So they, so there was indeed this this ox cart and the knot, and there was indeed this prophecy that whoever uh, separated the two would become ruler of the land. Um, but there's there's two things about this. Is firstly, it wasn't it wasn't really a a random challenge. This uh, this ox cart apparently had a lot of significance because the the previous line of kings of Phrygia had been had been chosen um, by means of uh, another prophecy, which said that the the next person that came to the city would become the new ruler. They were without a king at the time, and. Uh, as I've heard it told, literally just some random peasant rocked up and they were like, great, you're king now, congratulations. And the ox cart was tied up and then subsequently not removed. Um, but, you know, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't intended as a challenge. This knot was simply there. The, uh, or at least it probably had not just been used to secure the cart. Uh, it likely had been tied by the priesthood for you know, some some ritual purpose, you can say. Um, and when Alexander, according to this version, came across it, um, he didn't cut it with his sword at all. Uh, to start with, he spent a while trying to untie it, and then he realised that what he needed to do was to to pull the linchpin out that it attached the knot to the pole, and then it became significantly easier to unravel. Um, which makes more sense, because why would you secure your ox cart to a pole in such a way that you couldn't remove it, right? It's a, it's a strange thing to do. Um, but, you know, I'm interested in puzzles. What struck me about this version of the story is, is, wait a minute, we have a historical version in which Alexander is actually solving the puzzle, which is, you know, it's admirable as far as I'm concerned. And then we have the retold version, which has become very popular, in which he just cuts through the rope, um, which not only doesn't really solve the problem, but 
you know, as has been pointed out, is um, he could simply have refused to engage with it at all. What, what, what's gained by cutting through the rope? And you get people casting this as an example of lateral thinking. Um, but I'm inclined to see it as more of a cultural thing. Is There's this this kind of cultural feeling that if you are faced with a hard problem and you can just bypass it entirely, that that is somehow admirable. And, and that's the thing that's, that struck me as interesting. So, so let's talk about puzzle games. So the, the Gordian knot was supposed to be very hard to untie. Right? It's the, kind of the point of it in the context of the story. And as as puzzle solvers, but more than that, as puzzle designers, we care really a lot about how difficult puzzles are. Um, and I had a quick look through, I, I couldn't resist gathering some of the data. The word hard is actually used more than the word fun in all the puzzle design communities that I'm involved in. Um, which, you know, I. I, I can't have been all that surprised, right? Or I wouldn't have looked, but it's interesting. It says something about how we engage with these ideas. And um, I think it does make some sense. Right? It's, not, it's not a crazy thing. It makes some sense because it's a question in part of accessibility, um, by, by which I mean uh, who can play a puzzle game? It's a kind of a gating thing, right? If, you're, if your puzzle is hard, then some subset of the players just can't play at all. And so they definitely won't have any fun. Um, but the other side of the coin is, unlike some types of game, it's, it's in the nature of puzzles to require some amount of difficulty, because if a puzzle is too easy, you, you arguably get no gameplay at all. Uh, it's like um, you just immediately see what you have to do. You execute it. There's no thinking, right? And the the thinking part is is something I enjoy. And if you're watching this, it's probably something you enjoy as well. So, so you know, it's a, it's an important part of what's going on. Um, so this idea that you know you've got some some need for difficulty in puzzles, but the the whole uh, the whole question of puzzle design is about how hard you should make your puzzle. Um, it, it's sort of obvious, which which made me wonder: is it is it actually true? Like many th many things which we take to be obvious turn out not to be true at all. And I started to think about another way of of looking at it, which is a lot of the time when I personally give up on a puzzle, so I try and solve it, and then I. I eventually don't solve it and I move on from it. It's not actually that the puzzle is so hard that I couldn't do it. It's um, it's that it becomes kind of demotivating, is I, I no longer want to solve it. And whatever it is I'm going to get out of solving it is not worth the effort I would have to put in. So it's, it's as though these puzzles are, uh, are not impossible, but just demotivating. And so if that's if that's why we are concerned by uh, by, the, by the whole issue of hard puzzles, then there's this related question of well, what what is the payoff for solving a puzzle, right? Because if the if the payoff is we feel a sense of achievement, then you would think perhaps that the harder a puzzle becomes, uh, the more sense of achievement we would get. And so no matter no matter how hard the obstacle became, we wouldn't get this demotivational effect. Um, and I think that what's, what's going on here is it has to do with the reason why uh, solving things like this, doing hard things does motivate us, uh, or seemingly. Um, and it's this whole question of, uh, of of rating yourself. So there's a kind of it's a kind of ego thing going on here, right? It's like if if I can if I can solve hard puzzles, then then I too will conquer all of Persia. You know, it's uh, um, 
it's a, again it's a culturally valued thing it's like the to be able to overcome a hard challenge you, you receive a sort of uh, not reputation because no one will ever hear about it but you you you're made to feel good about yourself by a, a sort of a big complicated system of cultural ideas and um you know uh having gone through the school system myself in the 1980s um this is a, this is something that that comes through the way that education works or it certainly used to this idea that that you should always be competing with everyone around you and that there are rewards for the people who do well um and you know if you if you look at the kinds of people who play puzzle games uh you do get a lot of people who have who have sort of done well for themselves academically like who came through the school system they did well and um, so it's, it plays into that same mindset to overcome this difficult challenge. Um, and I was, I was thinking about this in the context of, um, of competitive video games. So puzzle games, at least in the video game space, they tend not to be very competitive um, in the sense of directly competing with another individual. But if you think about sort of mind sports like sort of chess and go and bridge and that sort of thing, they, they are competitive. And then if you think about video games a little bit outside puzzles, again, there's lots of competition. Um, and in this case, what, what I had in, in mind was um, a lot of the time with digital games, it's possible to, to match make amongst thousands and thousands of players because some of these games are huge. Um, so Blizzard Entertainment, who, uh, who make uh, Hearthstone and Overwatch and things like this, um, they have a policy of configuring their matchmakers so that they always try to uh, to match each player with someone as close to their own rating as possible. And th these ratings are very like chess ratings, they work in a similar way. Um, and online you see lots of complaints about this from the players, like, you know, people don't like it. And I was thinking that's very strange because on some level you know they, it makes perfect matches it's like if you if your opponent is always at exactly the same level as you um but it was a, it was a psychology thing is people didn't like it because it meant that they were winning half their games um regardless of how well they played so you know you could uh you know you could log on and pay very little attention and you know be chatting to your friend playing Hearthstone with one hand or whatever and you would win half your matches or you could be absolutely focused and you could practice you know 40 hours a week or whatever and you would still win half your matches and it you know it somehow felt very unrewarding um but also i think there's an element of um people who are quite competitive uh they're often used to situations in real life where they do win more than half the well, win more than half the time and you know that that kind of primes your psychology to not like losing at anything um which you know coming back to puzzle design that's a that's a problem right we're, we're trying to design puzzles to entertain people we don't want to make them sad um so this there's this rather nice quotation that i'm fond of which um uh we don't quite know who originally said it. Uh, we think uh, it was a guy called Don Marquis, who's a, a, he was a, a newspaper columnist in the US, uh, sort of roughly a, roughly a century ago. Um, but the, the quote in question is, if you make people think they are thinking, they will love you. If you really make them think, they'll hate you. Um, and you know, it's, it's quite a sharp uh, observation on human psychology and you, you, you can see it all around you if you I'm not I'm not talking about the puzzle world so much as just in the wider world this is this is the case um, people don't seem to enjoy uh, the kinds of thinky pastimes that uh, that we like um, and so yes yeah, so I think it's you know thinking about this idea in the context of puzzles it's like hmm, what, what does this tell tell us about puzzle design how, how we want to go about designing puzzles and like particularly in the context of this idea that you know that people like to win so you've got you've got on the one hand if you present people with a with a real challenge uh that they'll find it on some level distressing uh or maybe 
Uh, and on the other side of the coin, if you don't present them with any challenge, you have to somehow create the illusion that they're, that they're succeeding or that or they won't find it fulfilling. Uh, puzzles don't do this. Um, you know, I, I did look around for some examples. Puzzles don't do this. And I think that's, um, you know, it's partly the culture of the puzzle world. It's, it's partly because it's just not very practical. Um, but other other types of games have occasionally tried. Uh, you, you know, you've had video games. I think there was there was an example in one of the Metal Gear games where you're uh, you're trying to um, to struggle through this this corridor. It's uh, it's full of microwaves or something. But it's you know the protagonist is getting uh, is getting harmed by it, and you have to um, you have to hammer the button on your controller really fast. Um, but the problem is that if you fail, the character just dies, which is which is boring, of course. Um, you just have to you just have to redo it. But the designers wanted it to feel like you'd only just made it through, and so the challenge um, like auto calibrates itself to how well you're doing, and so it, so it's in some sense the whole thing is fake, um, which might be okay in a game like that because it's a story driven game. But it, you know it's. I, I would feel bad about that in in a puzzle, right? Um, so um, so this is where you know I, I found myself at the at the title of this talk because it's well so we seem to be in a society which admires people cutting the Gordian knot and thereby bypassing puzzles, and we have this thing where actual obstacles on some level make people hate you. So puzzles are for villains, right? I mean, this this doesn't sound good. Um, and then you know, you then have this thing where okay, so the you're watching a movie or something, and the heroes are fighting off you know waves of anonymous thugs. Um, but you know, <laughs> they're they're not throwing puzzles around, right? So it's so it's not just puzzles are for the bad guys. Puzzle puzzles are for supervillains. They are the um, you know the, the the nemesis, the arch enemy, as it were, is it, it's one of their tools. Um, so it, in puzzle design, is is this all that we're doing? Is it just a, a contest, like a mental contest, between uh, puzzle designers and puzzle players? Um, and if so, is 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 that is that even something we want to be involved in? Is that good? Um, so, as you would have guessed, um, my answer to this is no. This is this is not how things are. Um, and so, what I want to do is to present another way of looking at this, which uh, which I think um, could represent an improvement on the way that these things are often talked about in the puzzle community. Um, I think we do often talk about puzzle difficulty a lot. We talk about difficulty curves a lot in ways that don't necessarily help our design. Um, and so it's possible that we can do better. Um, so the point of origin of this, uh, of this idea was actually something that I made, that when I made it, I didn't realize how important it would turn out to be. Um, and this was in the context of uh, I published a, a small puzzle game called The Golem, and uh, this particular thing was not part of the game. It was in one of the menu pages uh, describing the game when you, you first load it up, uh, and it reads: "No matter how great or small your accomplishments, to take time to think about a difficult problem is a beautiful thing." And what was surprising about this is that this was by far the number one thing that got talked about and quoted and retweeted and so forth after the game's release is something about it just seemed to resonate with people. And it was as though I had accidentally said something that these people needed to hear and I hadn't realized and maybe they hadn't realized either. So once this happened, I then, you know, I then returned to this thing and thought, oh, so what is it about this? Um, and I think what it is, is that 
it gives puzzle players permission to enjoy what they're doing. Which, you know, it seems extraordinary because it's like they're playing a game. It is at their leisure time. Why would they not enjoy it? But I think sometimes people don't. And it's because of this whole sort of competitive ego driven side that this, this idea of overcoming a challenge, it can feel a bit like work. Um, and I have heard people say sometimes that, you know, I say, oh, I make puzzle games. They say, oh, I don't play puzzles because they feel too much like work. Um, so what I want to ask today is, can this way of looking at things be not just for players, but can it also become a guide of sorts for puzzle designers, for us? Can it teach us how to make better puzzles in some way? Um, so we have this, you know, we've established an impassable object is demotivating. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> I've certainly felt that myself. Um, so what can we do about this? Well, we could find ways to, to enable the player to, to pass an obstacle that they're stuck on. And, you know, this is, this is not a new problem in puzzle design. People have thought about this. Um, and the other thing as well is that, as well as helping people pass seemingly insurmountable obstacles, can we help them to enjoy the process of solving even before they succeed? So that, you know, so that being stuck is fun, right? Because if all they're doing is staring at the thing and thinking, I can't, I can't work out how to pass this. You know, that's, that's not a necessary property of a hard puzzle that they can't, they can't work on it at all. Um, and conversely, when we make easy things, I'm not suggesting we just make hard things, when we make easy things, is there some way to make it so that even if you pass an easy puzzle in, in seconds, that it's somehow still interesting? Can we do that? And so, so the problem with this as advice is that if I say, um, <laughs> if I say make things motivating and fun, that's, that's not useful advice, right? Because it's, it's so obvious. Any, anytime, um, I mean, this, this comes up in, in many, many contexts. Anytime you can take a piece of advice and invert it and, and the backwards form of the advice sounds like complete nonsense, then the advice wasn't really useful. Um, so I think that the real message here isn't, isn't make things motivating and fun. The, the real message here is don't reject your puzzles because you, you worried that they're too hard or too easy. Um, like that's, that's the real mistake that people make, right? And, um, you know, we've come up with all these, well, I haven't, but the community has come up with all these tools. So things like, for example, letting people play levels in different order, that helps with people being stuck. Um, optional difficulty levels. So most, most games don't have this, but sometimes you'll get a thing where it's like, you know, complete the level. Can you also do this other thing at the same time? It's, it's like a difficulty level. Um, hint systems, they can be very good. Um, in fact, brief shout out to the Sokobond Express, which I played earlier this year, which uh, has a really nice hint system because it manages to help you without actually spoiling what you're doing, which is, which is impressive. Um, but yeah, all of these things, all of these mechanisms, I think are actually distractions from what, from what we really need to be doing, which is making sure that the core puzzle is actually interesting. Um, and that might sound obvious as well, but apparently it isn't because, um, so I, I run a Steam curator group. Um, it's not that large, it's just puzzle games. And as a result of this, I often get sent free copies of puzzle games. like, you know, play this, write a review. Um, and I, I almost always decline. Um, and the reason, like by far the number one reason why I decline is because the the developer in question has made a puzzle game. But that's all they've done. They've just made a puzzle game. And in just a few seconds of looking at what they've done, I'm like, well, I have no interest in playing this. And it's not because they've done a bad job. It's because they've made something that is like the 
the core mechanics are something I'm not interested in exploring. I can see that it's going to be possible to make puzzles with them, but there's nothing, you know, largely because I've played too many puzzles, right? But um, there's nothing there that really grabs my attention and makes me want to play. And it, 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 we're back to this idea of it just feels like work. Um, so uh, just a couple of, of kind of uh, summarising remarks to sort of condense things down. So uh, there's a, it's a nice quote by, uh, by G.K. Chesterton who said, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Um, and so that's, that's my conclusion from the player side of things, is if we're going to play puzzle games, give yourself permission to play badly, because if you're constantly assessing yourself and forcing yourself to be, to be, you know, sort of quick and clever and all the rest of it, there is that risk that it will start to feel like work and you're you're missing, I think, the most enjoyable part of the hobby. And then from the design side, uh, as a designer, be an art gallery curator, not a supervillain. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to find an interesting puzzle, right? Something that people will want to solve. And then your job is to find the best possible way to show the player what's interesting about it. Like that's, that's the business of puzzle design. And it's not about setting the right difficulty level. It's not about your difficulty curve. It's not about the order in which players solve the puzzles. Find something that's worth their time and then show it off in the best way that you can find to to give people the maximum enjoyment you know to to let them share your joy in what you found and that's the end of my talk thank you very much for listening uh i would love to take questions but actually i'm not really here this is unfortunately pre-recorded um i'm off playing other games but uh if you if you put questions uh, in the, the Thinky Puzzle Discord, uh, then I will try and get to them when I return. Thank you very much. Well, a wonderful talk from Dom there. Thank you so much. Incredibly insightful. I love talks that completely reframe the way we think about things. Uh, and there's been lots of great chat in the YouTube chat about that. And I'm sure that will continue in the corresponding Discord thread, uh, thinkygames.com slash Discord, because that wasn't live. If you want to ask Dom any questions, please head over to the Discord and find the thread and please ask any questions there. Yeah, incredible talk. Uh, and yeah, um, The Golem is a wonderful game and wonderfully difficult. And that quote from it, I've tweeted out that quote from, from the game multiple times because it is, it's lovely. Uh, it really reframes the way we think about difficult puzzles. All right, time for our next talk. Uh, see you in a second uh, while I go set up.
Hello, everyone. We're back. We are back with our next speaker, Kate Killick. Hello, Kate. Uh, she is going to be talking to us about how she started her, her studio recently uh, with a stranger. Uh, it sounds very fun. Um, as a uh, reminder, if you have any questions throughout the talk, please post them in the YouTube live chat, and I will try and keep track of them. Um, and then if there's time for questions at the end, we will try and ask them to Kate. Um, if not, then we'll go to Discord afterwards. You know the, the, the way it works by now. Uh, all right, Kate, over to you. Cool, thank you. Uh, yes, so thanks for coming to my talk, starting a thinking studio with a stranger. Uh, I'm Kate, I'm a game designer by trade. I've been working in the industry for around 14 years now. Um, I am also a bit of an indie game generalist person, so I do a little bit of programming, a little bit of art as well but by no means to professional level. Uh, and I'm also an extrovert, which I say because I think it gives a little context to this talk. Um, I really thrive working in a team environment. I enjoy collaborating. And I really don't thrive when I'm stuck in a room on my own for an extended period of time. So this is where it all started, me about age 11. Um, I think this is about when I first started trying to recruit people onto my creative projects. So. I remember going to secondary school, trying to pitch ideas for like a, a, some kind of online teen magazine. I don't even know what the idea was. Um, to some of my friends at school, it failed quite badly. They um, thought I was quite weird, probably got me a bit of a reputation as a nerd for the rest of my school life. Um, and later on, as an older teen, I also spent some time making like a Neopets inspired uh, virtual pet site and recruiting people off online forums to try and help me with that, which did get further, but still. Uh, and then skipping ahead a little bit to university, I was studying game design and I joined this competition called Dare to be Digital uh, with a student team. We won the competition and from that we uh, released the game, Mush on Xbox Live, ended up winning a BAFTA. And I think that was when I, it really kind of solidified the goal in my mind that I wanted to be an indie developer and, you know, that was the career path I wanted to take. Uh, unfortunately, after we did the first project together, the team kind of dispersed, you know, we'd finished our degrees, people wanted to get jobs with incomes for some reason, um, and I didn't have a programmer anymore, so I didn't have any way to try and put together a demo, especially with the tools available back then. Um, so yeah, I didn't really get anywhere with pitching, like I tried to pitch more games to Microsoft, they're like, where's the demo? So I gave up on that, um, I took a brief de detour of maybe 10 years <laughs> doing other jobs. I did UX design, at like appointment booking software. I worked as a game designer, senior game designer, and ultimately game lead on uh, at a startup called Mojiworks, making games for Snapchat and uh, Facebook Instant Games. And I've also worked on quite a number of different projects uh, for educational games and games for children and other mobile projects. And pretty much the whole time I was doing those different jobs, I was going around this little thought pattern where I knew that I wasn't doing exactly what I wanted to be doing. Um, and I knew that in order to do it, I needed to get through that challenge of like having a prototype and having a demo. Um, so I would try it out. I would, you know, make a start on trying to build something and improve my programming skills. And then I would get to this conclusion, like making games on your own is actually really difficult. You know, it requires so many different skills. and also, sometimes you just need that extra person to like bounce ideas around and get some fresh input. Um, and I would kind of feel like a little bit of a failure for, for finding this so difficult. Like I would look at famous, successful solo indie developers and think, you know, if they can do it, why can't I do it? It sounds so simple. Um, but then ultimately, I'd kind of come to the conclusion that I need to find a collaborator. So uh, especially hopefully somebody who could code better than me, could help me work on more innovative ideas than what I could do on my own. But then I would have no idea how to go about doing that. Um, so you would think maybe that after a certain amount of time in the industry, I might have met someone through work that I could work with, but I always came into the same problem, which is people who uh, have the right skills are generally the people who already have jobs and therefore don't have the free time to work on side projects. Um, I think that working in startups probably made this even harder for me because the teams tend to be very small. You don't meet like a large number of people. 
And they also tend to be quite emotionally invested in the startup that they're already working in, maybe don't want to do another startup on the side of that startup. So I, I was kind of pretty stuck. Um, and then up to 2022, I had left my job, mainly due to like mental health in the pandemic. I'd been freelancing and doing contract work. And then I joined the Astro Fellowship Program, which I'm sure some people are familiar with here. That was um, 18 months that I then had funded to kind of do two things, like develop new ideas for games and also just improve some of my coding skills. Uh, and I kind of started it off here. I was like, right, I'm just going to get stuck in. I'm going to build some prototypes, see what happens. Um, I made loads of thinky game prototypes. I, I don't know, I think I put 10 on my itch page in the first few months. Um, I got to, uh, I was kind of doing them maybe one to two weeks prototype, just like churning them out. And I got to maybe halfway through the fellowship and I started to think, Okay, this is actually quite hard. I'm getting a bit fatigued with just generating all these ideas um, and generally feeling that struggle of working alone for an extended period of time. So I had chats to my mentor about it and I came to the conclusion, as usual, that I need to find a collaborator and that I could spend the rest of my fellowship kind of just doubling down and focusing on trying to find somebody to work with. So the first question I needed to ask was, what does my co-founder even look like? Um, at first, I didn't have anything very specific in mind. I just knew that I needed them to be able to code, preferably better than me, um, so that we could work on more interesting things. And also for them to be a nice person, because I just half of it was I just wanted someone to collaborate with, to come up with some fresh ideas, give me some new inputs. Um, so that was my starting point. And the next question is, where are they? How am I going to find them? Um, I knew that they probably weren't in Norwich where I live because there's about 10 other game developers here and I already know all of them and I share an office with like nine of them. Um, so that was already a no-go trying to meet them in person in my area. Um, but one of the things that had helped me since leaving work that I'd ended up doing was spending a bit of time on game development subreddits. I mean, I'm not a massive fan of Reddit, but I had uh, found it quite helpful just to kind of lurk around on the forums and especially like answering beginner questions and helping people out and trying to give them a bit of advice, always like just a nice thing to be able to do with your time. So I wasn't necessarily seeing that many experienced developers posting on Reddit, but I thought I might as well give it a go because I don't know what options I have. Uh, so I made this post um, just that I was looking for a collaborator to do some game jams or like small test projects with. So the first thing that happened uh, talking to people on Reddit was that I quickly found people will try to recruit you a lot to their own project, their dream game, or maybe something they've already got underway. Um, so that was the first thing to add to my checklist is that I need someone who's going to come up with new ideas with me. Uh, but I had a lot of different calls with people to just chat to them, get to know them a bit. And I ended up doing a few different test projects with different people. So these usually happened um, over the course of a few weeks, kind of on and off while they were generally working in another job at the same time. Uh, I made this first one on the top left, which was a, uh, where you play as a ghost manipulating objects around the house to influence your friend who's the bear, <laughs> um, to try and figure out the right sequence of uh, interactions that you have to do to get the bear up and out of the house. Uh, so I made that with an Australian developer. The one at the bottom was a physics-based music puzzle where you kind of bounce around these little musical seeds and then you try and time it to match the melody that you're given. And then on the top right, I also made this game with a friend that I'd actually met in person in the end um, at a game dev event in Spain. And uh, we took a bit longer with this project because it was going quite well. It was a first person cat game where you have to figure out how to get various items around the house. Um, we actually put that one up on Steam and showcased it a bit, which went pretty well. But uh, in the end, I'd done all these projects and ultimately none of them did turn into long-term collaborations. But it did help me to figure out a little bit more of what I was looking for. First thing, time zones, Australia, too awkward. <laughs> Although we're all quite used to kind of working asynchronously now with remote work, um, there's definitely a limit and Australia is definitely past the limit. Uh, and then 
compatible collaboration approach, which sounds pretty obvious, but um, essentially what happened was one of the projects I did, the person was kind of too attached to their own ideas. So we ended up, when we couldn't agree what to do, we would just make separate little prototypes to prove out our ideas and not really agree. And that didn't feel like a super healthy dynamic. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, I had a collaborator who would be like, oh, puzzle design, oh, that's your problem. You have to figure that out. Just tell me what to do, which again, wasn't that useful for, for what I was looking for. Um, so it just kind of highlighted that I, I needed to find the right balance and that can be quite a subtle thing to look for. And then lastly, I needed someone who did have some ambitions to go into indie development as like a proper career at some point. Um, so one of my collaborators was about to start a family, another who was maybe just looking for some stable income. And I realized that, you know, although that was fine for those early test projects, it was potentially a bit of a waste of time if, if they didn't have any long term goal to do that. So I kind of got to this point after the three collaborations, which I think had maybe taken place over six months or so in the end. Um, I start to feel like Reddit's not really working out. I Maybe I'm just going to put a pin in that. Maybe just verging on to going for another loop around. Um, and then I saw this post. So I was cautiously optimistic, seeing that there was another experienced person looking for an indie partner. Uh, I could see already quite a lot of kind of green flags in this post that I looked at. They obviously can code. They've got a AAA background. That was a big tick. Uh, they mentioned that the eventual aim would be maybe to make money on the side, which I read as they do want to do indie development, but they're realistic about how easy it is. Um, the collaboration they talked about was 50-50, which felt like a good sign. And they also sounded like they'd had a similar experience to me in trying to be roped into other people's dream games. So I knew that they weren't coming at it from that angle. Um, and yeah, we had a call and I established that they are quite a nice person and they lived in a fairly suitable time zone. So they, um, are based in California, which, you know, is not necessarily ideal still, but seemed more manageable. And she did have plans to move back to the UK at some point. So we did a prototype together, um, this person who's called Sky and, uh, the collaboration went really well. The concept we came up with was quite depressing. It was uh, this game about scrapbooking and sorting out memories, figuring out where they go into the scrapbook, and uh, but also memory loss. So you're having to leave things behind and maybe you're going through like a uh, mental health problem with losing memory. Anyway, we, we didn't go <laughs> too far with that concept in the end. But uh, yeah, the collaboration went really well. It was pretty clear that each of us just having a level of experience that we had, not just in our fields, but also in team management and project management, just meant we could work together like in a very seamless kind of professional way. And then we got accepted onto the Wings Elevate program. So this was an accelerator that would give us three months to build a demo and a little bit of funding as well. So we could hire a freelance artist. Um, I think we got accepted maybe about April last year and we knew that we had a few months to prepare and then we would have around three months to do the accelerator and build the demo. So my problem was solved. Um, I'd found a team, I got a prototype, that's done, right? Well, obviously not, because uh, now we had to figure out how to actually work together on like a more serious basis and try to build a proper demo. I don't know if this graphic makes that much sense, but <laughs> I was trying to summarize the three biggest challenges that we faced over that period of kind of more serious development. Um, they pretty much all come back to time though. Time is just not enough of it. It's pretty hard to, to organize uh, within the situation that we were in. I know it's a problem with remote work generally, but even more so when you throw time zones and other work commitments into the mix. Um, so just to explain this a bit, that essentially over the course of a week, we would have maybe two hours, two different hour slots where we could actually talk to each other synchronously on a call. There were kind of other bits where we might be able to chat on Slack very briefly, but more or less our work schedules and awake being awake schedules were just not very um, compatible. So yeah, then the question becomes, how do you work in that with that kind of constraint? Um, so some of the things that we did to try and overcome this challenge, although uh, yeah, we still did find it difficult and 
we kept kind of bumping up against this problem. First of all, just being really efficient and prioritizing very harshly with those little segments of time that we did have. Um, that can be quite tricky because you often end up only talking about immediate blockers and trying to find time to talk about stuff like what are our, what's our potential vision for this company if it goes ahead, you know, what's our business strategy, all that kind of stuff can really fall off the agenda a little bit. So we would just have to make sure um, being pretty harsh about what we could spend time talking about, but then also just scheduling ahead, like, okay, in three weeks, we're going to have this half hour to talk about our business plan, because if we don't do that, it'll never happen. Um, doubling down a lot on the asynchronous communication that we did have. Um, I was writing a lot of very long Slack messages, lots of threads, kind of trying to leave a summary each day that's very organized, that then the other person could come in and respond to everything quite methodically, because you really don't want to be missing things when you don't have that um, synchronous time to uh, figure out what's happening. And a lot of use of Miro. Um, this is just one of many, many Miro boards that we generated to just do this kind of uh, quite quick documentation and just um, keeping it relevant. I'm not a big fan of documentation in general, so this was not my natural way to do things, but it was just a necessity with the situation we were in. Uh, and another thing is just ooh, go back a bit. Um, making sure that we flagged when things were starting to get miscommunicated, because normally, I guess, if you're having a conversation with someone in person, you can kind of tell if your point's not coming across or you're getting misunderstood. When there's a delay of one day in between every reply, you can't really afford for things, you know, it'd be like a week before you've actually figured out what the other person's trying to say. So we just had to get very good and um, making a lot of conscious effort to identify if that was starting to happen as early as possible so we could just book in like that 10 minute slot to clear up that one issue that's somehow got got past us and then patience which is again maybe not my natural <laughs> approach to things but um especially the times when you know i was fortunate enough to be working on this full time thanks to the fellowship program for some of the development period and the rest of the team weren't necessarily um, we, as well as Sky working on the code and doing her full-time job, we had hired a freelance artist, Ellie, who was also doing other work. So we just had to try and be really realistic about what we could achieve. And with that also just being as open as possible about any frustrations that might be coming up, any potential burnout that might be, you know, starting to arise. Um, I think, again, that combination when you don't know someone because you know I'd never met them and I'd only ever spoken to her in the context of talking about the game dev um, and you're also having very little crossover time it's there's really no way to know what's going on with them so we just had to be very conscious of that and make sure that we were making a little bit of time to check in and be open about what's going on in our lives I think that's part of why this collaboration worked really well as well um, just because we both are quite open and honest people. So we were able to kind of build that connection. So since we started uh, around last February, I think, we uh, went to the accelerator, we finished the demo, we've got a Steam page up, we've been to a number of showcases. Um, we even won a couple of awards uh, last month while we were at GDC. And we finally met in person at GDC a few weeks ago, which was amazing because we had a whole week to chat about uh, all the stuff that, you know, just hadn't had time for and also to get to know each other a bit better. Um, so, yeah, I feel like the hardest bit of finding the right co-founder is behind me now. We just have the next hard part of trying to get a publisher and another hard part of trying to make a good game. So if I had to summarize uh, my advice for anyone that's in a similar situation to where I was uh, at the start of last year, the first thing would be, you never know where a good collaborator might come from. You have to stay quite open-minded. Uh, even Reddit can surprise you. There's a lot of people lurking on there. Um, so just always explore every avenue that you can. Secondly, that it is a process of trial and error. You don't really know until you try to work with someone whether it will work out. Um, they might seem really good on paper, but for some reason, they just don't turn out to be the right person, or maybe vice versa. Um, and yeah, it's important to know when to call it quits as well. If it's not working out, that might just not be compatible and it's not, um, you know, it's not necessarily 
saying anything about you or them, it might just be not the right fit. And then finally, it's okay if you don't want to do it alone. It's not a reflection on you. It's not the right way for everybody. Um, you know, I've had to kind of accept that I'm not the best at solo work and that I work, as I said at the start, I just work better in a team. I am quite extroverted and I get a lot of energy from collaborating with people. And it is possible to find the right person, even if it ends up turning out, even if it ends up being an internet stranger. Thank you, that's my talk. Um, and yes, also wish list our game piece together. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you, it was wonderful. Uh, I love your point about like, cause I think there are so many people who like maybe they can make a little game or whatever and they can design great puzzles or whatever and they get it in the head like, oh, I'm a solo developer, I can do everything, I can make the biggest game. I I, I fall into that trap as well. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's nice to kind of have a reminder that like, you know, you do have to work with people. And even some of the people we think of as like solo developers, they, you know, they work with so many people on their games. So it's great to hear that. Um, I had a question for you that I would like to ask. Um, so you mentioned using Reddit. Uh, I guess the first part of the question is, was that a specific like subreddit you were like looking for particular people? And then my other part of the question is, do you, do you have other resources for finding people? Anything you would suggest? Yeah, so the subreddit I think that I was posting on was r slash inat that i need a team subreddit um which is also where my co-founder i think posted in the end um which i think is the best one to look in and i do think there are more people lurking and not posting than you think who are maybe more like serious developers um other resources it's tough because you know one thing that people always recommend is going to game jams but i had been doing that my whole career as well and generally finding that people come and jam and then like they go back to their job mm -hmm. um so yeah i i can't think of what else i tried i think i i did also try to join various discord communities but yeah i think the, the reddit sub works because it is very much set up for that format of finding collaborators right you know you don't have to like filter for people who are in the same position as you because you know they're in yeah. the same position because they're in that subreddit yeah it's yeah, a great yeah. way of thinking about it um all righty if no other questions uh pop up uh all right we'll say thank you to kate again thank you so much it was a wonderful talk um we're gonna set up for the next oh no there's a break now there's a break we get half an hour break uh and then the next talk will be after that uh, so see you all then. There's lots of thanks coming through in the chat. Uh, great talk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, and of course, if anybody has any additional questions, uh, please head over to, uh, oh, there might be a question here actually that we could ask quickly. Uh, I'd love to know if you and Sky had any strategies for dealing with disagreements. There we go, that's a good question. Ah, oh, that is a good question. I, do you know, in terms of the game development, I don't think it really came up because I think we're both so used to working in a team environment and, you know, kind of just at the the level of seniority that we both are in our careers. I think we just see, it, you know, that kind of thing. It's just part of the process. So no one's taking anything personally and it's just uh, like trying to justify why we do this or that decision. But I think we also did um, have a bit of an implicit understanding of like because I'm on design and guys on code like we also have our areas that we're willing to trust each other I think we did put a lot of trust in each other to like be able to vouch for our different disciplines if there was something where we didn't agree that's really nice I I, I would like I wonder what the experience is like if it's like two designers like paired up or yeah like, does it then become a bit more is there a bit more friction there yeah I think that's what I meant about trying to find that balance because I don't want to work with a programmer who's like I don't care about the design but I'm also like I still yeah you still need to understand who's ultimately got responsibility for which area i mean i'm saying this she might completely disagree <laughs> <laughs> sure she doesn't um thank you for that question Shervin. all right so yes any additional questions um there is a thread in discord thinkygamescom slash discord uh the thread is in the talks channel uh and i'm sure kate will be there to answer any additional questions uh and thank you once again kate we'll go to the break right now and see you all after that
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. After that break, hope everybody got some water and a beverage. I know Rachel got a beverage just now. Very handy to have. Uh, um, alrighty. So uh, next up, we have Rachel Haliva, who's going to be talking about a very, very important topic, which is how to pitch your thinky game. Uh, as always, if anybody has any questions, please leave them in the YouTube live chat. Uh, and if you could tag Thinky Games, that would be great, because uh, then I'll be able to see them. Um, and otherwise, and if you no, know, if there's time, we'll try and answer those questions at the end of the talk. All right, Rachel, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Howdy, folks. Uh, great to be talking to you today. Many thanks to the Thinky uh, Games team for organizing this conference for us. Um, so yeah, let's talk about pitching your Thinky game. This talk is geared less towards providing detailed information on how to structure a game pitch. There's a lot of great resources out there, but this talk is instead geared more towards taking a step back and providing a framework to think through how to approach and structure your game project through the lens of pitching and thinking about how to align the goals for your project with what you're creating. All right, so first things first, who am I? Why should my perspective on this topic be exciting and relevant to you? So I'm Rachel Haliva. I'm the biz dev and scouting manager at Astrological. We're a newer publisher uh, and once nonprofit fund that exclusively in, like publishes thinky games. Um, and for the last couple of years, I've been managing our process for sourcing and signing games. And so I've looked at thousands of thinky games through the lens of sourcing at Astra, as well as through our fellowship selection program, um, supporting the New Voices grant program. And I've also helped with various curation groups like the IGF awards and also the thinky awards. Uh, so have a sense of things that aren't just important commercially, but you know, critically when someone's looking at a thinky project, what, what are the things that really matter? Okay, and before we get started on thinking about how to pitch a thinky game, I feel like we have to also take a step back and clarify what we mean by thinky. Even though we're at ThinkyCon right now, um, one can never be too clear about what they mean when they use the term. So when I'm using this term and when Astra is using this term, uh, we're referring to games that have that embody certain design principles and where logical reasoning is centered in the moment to moment gameplay experience. So the core principles that uh, I'm talking about when I'm talking about thinky games is the sense of progressive complexity that leads to mastery. Um, all, all of the games that I'm going to be discussing are games that have a gradual learning curve where players are asked to master increasingly challenging problems. So not just logic driven games or soccer band games, but also thinky deck builders, thinky tactics games, thinky management games. And another important principle that all of these games have is they have clear transparency of information where they're giving the players the tools and clarity that's needed to engage with them so that players are reasoning through problems rather than guessing, using guessing and chance. And another important property that I'm referring to when I'm talking about thinky games is that all of these games have some element of emergent thinking. So players are not just, you know, solving simple problems through the game. They're using evolving strategies and play styles um, through the introduction of new tools, mechanics, and systems that cause a player to interact with the game in a new way or uh, go deeper as they play. Okay, so in my line of work, I talk to a lot of developers, ranging from hobbyists to professionals, developers that are brainstorming to developers that are actively pitching their games to me, and so on. And there's no right way to make a game, and there's no right sort of game to make. But something that I do often see in my line of work is developers having goals uh, that are misaligned with some with what they're trying to create, and that can cause a lot of confusion for a developer who's wondering, why am I struggling in the pitching process? Or even for a developer who 
doesn't want to pitch their game. They just want to make something cool and interesting. They might be struggling and wondering, why am I not able to get people to play my game? Or why, why am I struggling to uh, find popularity on certain sites? And so I think it can be really important to know what your goals are as a developer and what you want to achieve with your project and make sure that's being represented in your design and project choices. Because you, you could be approaching this from a lot of different angles. Maybe you're someone that just want, wants to make a game that explores an idea that's interesting to you. And you're not very concerned about having commercial upside from the project. Maybe you're a solo developer that wants to put a really cool idea out there and you don't wanna work with a publisher and it's okay if your game doesn't have like a strong return for you because you just wanna be able to make your next game that explores an interesting idea. That's a great angle to be approaching your work from. And you can kind of take more risks. You can be in a riskier subgenre or you can uh, have a different focus. But if you wanna make a game that has commercial appeal and potentially find a publishing partner or platform interest, then you should probably be approaching your project from a different angle. Maybe thinking a bit more critically about the unique properties of your game or what subgenre you're working in or even things like your aesthetic. Um, and then if you wanna go a step further than that and you have big lofty ambitions of making a game that has really targeted commercial appeal and the potential to reach really big, broad audiences, then you would wanna think about your work and yet from yet a deeper angle of, okay, how do I make this experience really engaging overall? And I think, so as you've like, you're thinking about your goals, you're thinking about what you want to do with your project. It's important to try to gut check your assumptions about how certain games do or what's possible in certain spaces. Um, it can be really easy, especially if you're deep in the thinky community, for example, you know certain games really well and those games are, might be highly revered in your community. And so you might have certain assumptions about what's possible in a given space. Uh, it, it can be really fun to actually try to gut check those assumptions using publicly available data. So what you see here, I, I've used sites like Video Game Insights or SteamDB. Um, I currently use Game Discover Co a lot. Um, it's a paid site though, so it's a little less accessible. SteamDB, you can just get like a plugin for your computer. But as you're starting to think about, you know, what your goals for your project are and the space you want to work in and the things you want to try, it can be nice to go and check some of the games that you're, that are similar to the project you want to make and just see, okay, how did those games do and what's possible? And sometimes you might be surprised. Maybe a game that you were underestimating did better than you thought, or maybe a game that you're very familiar with and you hold in very high regard, maybe didn't sell as many copies as you would have thought. And there's something interesting to reflect on there. And so as you're you know, going through the process of thinking about what your goals are for your project and then looking at similar games out there and kind of going through those steps of gut checking your assumptions, it can also be really nice to try to understand the landscape overall for your project. Um, Different subgenres have different floors and different ceilings for success. Typically, you want to be in a subgenre where the demand is higher than the supply of games out there. So you'll see in some subgenres to the right end of this top chart, um, puzzle, for example, there's a lot of puzzle games out there. And this is just using the broad tag puzzle on Steam. There's, there's a lot of puzzle games and there's not as many people playing those games. Uh, you'll see some, something very similar with the platformer genre. Okay, there's a lot of platformers out there. There's not as many people playing those types of games. If you look at uh, the, the left side of the chart, you'll see like, okay, there's a lot of people that wanna play city builders. There's not quite as many city builders out there and so on for deck builders. Um, 
And I'm not saying this to say, hey, you should only make games in subgenres where more people are looking for games than there are games out there. But I think it can be a helpful framing to just understand um, whether, whether you want to make a commercial game or not, but uh, especially if you are making a commercial game, uh, what the landscape is like, what you're going up against. And then if we try to just hone in on the performance of like, what are like the key thinky subgenres? Like what's, what is the opportunity space for me as someone who wants to make a thinky game? Um, I didn't really break down all the different thinky subgenres. There's so many of them. Um, there's so many takeaways and things we could talk about, but I think there are three in particular that are really interesting to me to think about. Uh, pure puzzle is one where I see a lot of folks from the thinky community um, wanting to make games in that space. And one interesting thing, just thinking about like pure puzzle games overall, it can be a difficult subgenre to stand out in. You know, we all, there's a lot of, there's a lot of puzzle games coming out and it can be difficult when games when puzzle games have complex rule sets that can't be easily understood if it's being shown on a YouTube stream or a Twitch stream. Um, games like Viewfinder or Portal um, stream really nicely because they have these simple rule sets uh, that I can easily understand in a GIF. Uh, so just thinking about, okay, if I'm approaching that space, how 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 can my game how can a puzzle game be explained and understood um, in order to stand out in a space that has a lot of games in it and players have a lot of choice? How how can I make sure players look at my game and understand exactly what they're going to be getting? And then talking about a different type of thinky subgenre, deck builders. Um, I think deck builders is a really interesting space to be experimenting and making a project in. It's really strong, um, especially like looking at recent releases like Cobalt Core. Um, I just think there's a lot of opportunity to play with a, this set of mechanics uh, of roguelike deck building and infusing things like tactics into them. Um, and it's a space where if you are trying to make a commercial project, um, you have a greater chance at finding an audience uh, And then a thinky subgenre that I honestly just love to see more games in is the programming subgenre. There's some really big successes in programming games uh, like Opus Magna or Human Resource Machine, but there's not that many people making games in the space. So I, I think you know it's it's definitely a difficult type of design to approach, but the more I, I'd love to see more folks trying to experiment with programming games. Okay, so we've talked about thinking about what your goals are as someone designing and pitching a thinky game, thinking about what the landscape for games is like overall, and then thinking about the different types of thinky subgenres. Sub um, so when you're going when you're going through the process of like okay, I have a game, I'm ready to pitch it. Really try to think about the subgenre that you are working in and what are the challenges of those subgenres just to temper your own expectations or figure out, okay, how, how do I communicate what's unique about my game? Thinking about the detective subgenres in particular is just an example. If we look at the space, um, there's a lot of games that come out and do have breakaway success, uh, but there's also just a lot of different games being released in this genre on Steam, meaning that it is hard to stand out, but those that bring a really unique mechanic or framing to the detective genre have a tendency to find a foothold with audiences. Um, Return of the Oberdin, that's a, that's an older game, but um, really strong art style, really unique uh, system, strange horticulture, 
brings like the mechanics of Papers, Please into a cozy atmosphere in a way that's really stand out. But just kind of looking at the landscape, you can definitely get a sense of there's a sliding scale of opportunity. Some, some of these games sell a lot of copies and then the further you like go down in the range, um, there's a lot of titles in the middle range. And then there's a lot of titles that, you know, come out and just have more moderate success and can struggle. Okay, so we've talked about understanding the landscape and reflecting on like the different opportunity spaces and what's possible. So now that we're thinking about just pitching our game, um, you definitely want to have a strong sense of what makes your game unique, uh, no matter what sort of genre you're working in. And it's important to have a really like uh, a bold art style or a unique mechanic to stand out. It's also important to try to have a unique twist on a system players are familiar with. Cobalt Core does this. Uh, it takes the roguelike deck building of something like Slay the Spire and infuses it with the deck tactics grid-based tactics um, in a way that's really fresh and interesting. Another way to stand out is to bring a new feature to a genre that makes it more appealing or mashing up a genre. Against the Storm does this by bringing a roguelike structure to city building in a way that makes it possible to not have to sink 20 or 40 hours into a campaign just to experience the full gamut or range of mechanics in a city builder. Instead, you can have a 20 minute run where you get to dive in and see the impacts of managing a small city. And lastly, when you're pitching your game, um, no matter what subgenre you're targeting, you want to ask yourself, why would a player play your game? Um, Consider what's missing from the subgenre you want to make your project in. Consider why someone would dedicate time to completing your game. If it isn't clear in your pitch why someone would finish your game, then they might not engage with it in the first place. Um, an example like this in a puzzle game might be that uh, I, I get to experience this really unique mechanic and then something about it is going to change and the way that I interact with the whole world is going to change. And if that's clued to me as a player before I play it, then I'll definitely want to stick around and play till the end, or that might be the reason why I buy the game in the first place. For a deck builder like Slay the Spire, there's a really clear point at which I get to say I've demonstrated mastery over a system. I've experienced all the mechanics. Um, similar for a game like Factorio, I have this really clear goal on the horizon I get to work towards. I'm building all these production lines for the purpose of like trying to create a rocket. And because of, because of that, I have something that's pulling me to engage with the game in the first place and continue on in the experience. And you also want to understand what is important to or desired by certain game audiences. Um, if you're making a soccer band, then there's, you know, there's been a lot of entries into the genre, but if you're in the thinky community, you are uniquely positioned to understand what do people who play soccer band games want to see? What would feel fresh? What's something no one's tried? Um, and if you're trying to experiment with a new subgenre that you might not be as deep in the community of yourself or play as many games in, you can always try to go to the communities of people that play those games and figure out, you know, what are the people who play these games constantly looking for? What, what do they want to see? Um, I love going to different subreddits and just kind of looking at the things that players are constantly asking for in different communities. Um, the thing,
And yeah, so that's that's my talk on pitching your game. Just a recap, the, the thing to focus on here is um, what are your goals for the game that you want to make? Do you want to explore an interesting idea? Do you want to try to make a commercial game or find a publishing partner? Are you trying to, are you trying to have a game with a large upside? And based on whatever your goals are, um, thinking about the subgenre that you're working in, the way that you're presenting and finding your mechanics and the way that you're innovating within that space to connect with players. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, Rachel, so much. That was wonderful. Such great advice that many people uh, uh, definitely need to hear. And there's lots of appreciation for it in the chat as well. Um, a few questions did come up, so we'll try and get to those now with a bit of time for questions. Um, so, uh, Video Space Games in the chat uh, asked, would you tend to, tend to agree with the other talks? I think they're referring kind of to like Lenefi's talk and uh, Zalavir's talk, um, where like redoing the framing of the thinky aspect might get broader market appeal. Yeah. I think that you don't necessarily need to emphasize that your project is a cerebral game in order to hook players. I think sometimes it can feel important to emphasize like this game is really hard to get people to want to play it, but that's not necessarily the thing that like the fact that Factorio has a difficulty ceiling isn't the reason why people like to play it. Um, people like to play Factorio because it's deep and complex and there's a lot of things to learn. Um, and I think approaching it from that angle invites more people in. Um, one of the most interesting discoveries I've made recently is that some people see Factorio as a cozy game. Um, there's like a lot of chatter around Factorio in the cozy like subreddits. And I think when you take a step back and you don't find the need to frame your project as like aggressively thinky, you might be surprised who'd be excited to engage with it. Fantastic answer, thank you. Uh, we also had a question, so it's from uh, from Mari. That um, uh, it kind of sounds like you maybe sort of answered it because you. I think the question was asked, and then you went straight to a slide that sort of answered it. But I think there's still a good question there, which is um, super curious if you have any thoughts about the murder mystery slash detective genre. Of course, you had a slide about it, um, but I guess the big question at the end was: Are they difficult to pitch to thinky publishers? I think that detective games, there's a lot of interest in detective games. And I think there are definitely publishers out there who are eager to explore the subgenre. Um, it, it, it can be viewed as a difficult subgenre to find big success in. So that can be a reason why it might be harder to find a partner just because depending on, you know, the scale of the like, budget you need, it might be seen as, oh, a, a, a moderate bet is that a, a detective game will only do X amount. And it can be very easy for the amount that you need to be very close to that expected success level. Um, I would definitely, but I would definitely, if you're working on a detective game, just focus on what's unique about it and a unique art style, a unique presentation, because there's there's constant hunger for detective games. So, I think one of the key things to take away from your slides, from some of the charts, is that like looking at the numbers of sales that different games make, like you've got to people have got to think about what the publisher is expecting this game to sell. It's not just about yes, like, what does my what's, what do I think my what do I want my game to sell? Yeah, like, publishers have expectations. It can, it can be really easy as a developer to think about your project from the lens of this is what we're excited to make. This is what we're excited to explore. This is the size of our team. So these are the needs we have to support our team. And then you go to a publisher, you go around and try to talk to publishers. And it might be really confusing because um, we, we've approached this in a way where the amount we're paying ourselves feels really fair. And that might be true. But from a publisher's perspective, 
if their goal is to see a return on their investment that makes them be able to not just return the funding they've given, but continue to grow and support more games, um, they have to have reason to believe that that's possible. So definitely something to think about if your goal is to find a partner, get a certain level of funding. Absolutely. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions through actually. Um, so the next one that came along, this might just be a, uh, uh, like just a question about uh, some of the numbers in the slide. Uh, Parabox tagged as having 95,000 copies and making 95,000 US dollars. Oh, there might have just been a typo there. If you want to use Steam DB, so yeah. the numbers I have, I found using Game Discover Code, which just scrapes public information that's available on Steam. Game Discover Code does have a paywall, so I would recommend people use Steam DB. And it doesn't have quite as much information, but if you go there, you can look, you can get some sense of copies sold and things like that. And it's just really nice to go and double check. Oh, how how many co copies did this actually sell? I'm surprised constantly uh, by how well some games have done, and then games that I am a huge fan of. I'll sometimes be really shocked to see. Wait, I I would have assumed this did, this deck builder did the same as others, but it actually did like a tenth as well as a medium sized success. There was a lot of shock for some of the numbers that you did show in the slides. Like, oh, that only that many, that sold that many copies. Um, okay, next question. Um, do you think there are ways to frame a mild hook in a more appealing way or fumble and frame a good hook in a bad way? I definitely think people will sometimes struggle to actually communicate what makes their game unique. Uh, oftentimes I'll see pitches where people will focus a lot on here's how the overall system works or here's what the mechanics are. But when you don't frame it in, this is an inter interesting interaction I can have, and this is the impact that that interaction has on the overall experience. Like take the witness, I do these panel puzzles, and then I will start to have insights about the world overall and solve large world scale puzzles. That's a really interesting hook. If the game was just described as, I'm just drawing lines, um, and <laughs> these are all the different types of lines I can draw. That's not quite as interesting. And that's funny because that is when you when somebody tries to describe that game who hasn't played it, they're just like, oh, you just draw lines, right? That's basically the description. And that, I guess that yeah. shows that people can take that impression from seeing clips of a game like The Witness or whatever. And that's why you shouldn't be um, worried about spoilers when you're showing off your games because it doesn't it doesn't actually like ruin an experience for a player to see a cool gif of, oh, I go through this portal and then this crazy thing happens <laughs> um you know they just see it and they think it's cool you as yeah. the designer will always have more context on what it means but people are going to forget by the time they play your game i think it's really fun to go back and watch trailers of games that you've already played and you're like oh surely they won't show any spoilers and there's always loads of spoilers throughout the uh yeah. the trailer and it's like because it helps helps people uh get interested in the game all right sorry all the questions um Gal Green has asked, you mentioned at the start that transparency of information is a core aspect of Thinky Games, right? Uh, in your opinion, how much RNG disqualifies a game from being considered Thinky? Any amount? Randomness. It's definitely a sliding scale, right? Like there's some tactics games where randomness is a key factor. I think what's important is my ability to make predictions about what I can do heavily impacted by randomness. If I can't form any sort of strategy, then I'm not thinking, right? But if I can form a strategy and I can make reasonable predictions about what's going to occur, then I would consider a game thinky. And then there's definitely ranges of games that use less randomness. I can think more. Um, but Absolutely. I wouldn't say any amount of randomness is a DQ. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, all right. Uh, so Fahim here is asking, uh, is that the next question? Yes. Uh, are virtual slice slash demos important for evaluating a thinky game pitch? What do you look for in them? And does it differ based on subgenre, pure puzzle versus, say, detective games? Uh, whether or not you have a vertical slice or a playable demo is going to matter more 
depending on have you released the game before? What sort of game have you released before? Um, so if you're Yeppy Carlson, uh, the cocoon limbo guy, like you don't really need a vertical slice or a demo. If you're a dev that's starting out, um, you, it's going to help you a lot to have one of those. Um, and something I see a lot in playable demos is people will focus on having a lot of content in just to show, oh, these are all the different things you're going to be able to do. These are all the different systems and mechanics. And usually that can feel um, like a bit of a waste because what I'm looking for when I'm playing uh, one of those is what's an interesting choice I'm going to make or what's one interesting interaction. Like when these two mechanics um, happen at the same time, like what, what's the interesting thing I get to think through? I would focus more on a moment that really showcases like a meaningful insight or a meaningful choice someone has to make rather than having a ton of content in. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the for the answers. Um, there's more questions coming through, but we don't have time. We've run out of time. Um, so any other questions, please take them to the Discord, thinkygames.com slash Discord. If you're not there already, there is a thread for this talk in the Talks channel. And I'm sure Rachel will be around to answer any additional questions. Thank you again, Rachel. And see you all in a moment for the next talk. Thanks, Rachel. See ya. Bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are here with our next guest, Farhan Ruizala, to talk about art for tech people. 
uh, I feel like this will be very useful for me. Uh, <laughs> um, so once again, as I always say, if you have any questions, please leave them in the YouTube live chat uh, and tag Thinking Games so that I see them. Uh, people have been doing that well so far. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll try and answer them at the end. All right, okay. all right, over to you. Okay, hello. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, uh, for coming. This is a bit of a weird rambly talk. I hope uh, it has a point for you. But yeah, I, 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 the, the title of the talk is Art for Tech People. And the idea is a weird reframing about my experience of coming into the visual art world from more of a programming uh, background and how, how that uh, impacted me and how I, I think about art and my process for making art for games. Uh, and yeah, I mean, just a little bit of presentation. I'm Ferran Sala, known as Rain Drinker Online. I'm a game programmer and designer. Um, and I've, I've become a little bit of like an accidental artist and pixel artist. I started dabbling and because of indie reasons, having to do game jams, landing in some indie companies, I've had to take it a bit more seriously. And I ended up teaching pixel art even like at, at uh, college-like level uh, together with programming. And I make some silly little games we will talk about slightly at the end. I will block slightly. So yeah, um, I mean, thinking about visual art as a programmer, if you've not had like a formal art education or you've not dabbled a lot in it, it's very scary, you know? There's, there's some general advice that you will get. I, I just put these three lines here. I don't think this is, bad advice i don't i just don't think it's very useful so this talk is kind of an exercise in reframing this in a way that i feel is more helpful to tech-minded people uh, take everything i say with a huge grain of salt this is very my experience my opinion kind of thing and it might not work for for some kinds of people but i just think there's some interesting ideas there about how to think about making art or learning art or becoming better at it and having a bit of an eye for art, I guess. Uh, the first one is this one, no? Just have talent slash or practice. Uh, people will say, no, you don't need talent. You just need to practice. It doesn't matter which one of the two you do. This, at uh, the end of the day, it just sounds like get good, no? Like they're just telling you, you either have to have some fundamental quality or you need to do something through time to gain it. And it, I don't think it's very actionable. Uh, this this is a speed paint. No, we, we go online and we see someone doing a speed paint. This is his mindset. I guess this is a bit of a flex, though I don't think it's amazing. It's just good because I, I'm I'm not that like I'm relatively new to the world of art. But yeah, you see speed paints like this online and you just go, okay, that looks good, but you, you don't see it as a stack, you don't see it as a process, you don't you, you can't really catch the choices. There's obviously choices here made, made by the artist, but they're fast and they're very flowy, obviously, that this is sped, sped up. No? So in a sense, it, it, it can just feel like this. Whenever you go online and you see art tutorials, it feels a bit like the how to draw an owl meme. No? Like one, draw some circles, two, draw the rest of the fucking owl. Like there's, there's a lot of choices in here, like a lot of technique, a lot of ideas that are just lost in the sauce and a lot of art tutorials are about how to make a specific thing and that's not i mean obviously if you make specific things a lot of times you end up with some general knowledge but it's not the most useful and it's very frustrating uh, to try to imitate and follow like recipes because it, it's basically like telling someone who's learning programming this you know like one write some conditionals this is how an if works and two code the rest of the game like it, we're to obviously talking about very different layers. It's true that a game is made of code and the game has a lot of conditionals in it and you need to know the conditionals to make the game, but it's not the conditionals. Like there's a whole other layer here that's that's being lost. This is like to our fortress, I choose it because it's a very, I guess, programmer focused, uh, programming focused game. So yeah, just first step of reframing is let's not talk about practicing and having talent. Let's talk about making better choices. But that still is a bit of like a get good. What does it mean for a choice to be better? Uh, so my next step is always to suggest if we have to make better choices, let, let's instead commit to making less choices. Because if I make less choices, I, may, I can make each of those choices more interesting, more intentional, uh, and more aware of them. Like I don't, I don't want to rely on my intuition because if, if I'm a programmer, I, I probably don't have a lot of good visual artist intuition. And that's something that you need to develop through the years. So I, I'll just try to make less choices. 
and make them with more more intention. So I, I'm I guess I just suggest that you overthink stuff. Uh, as a pro if if you are a programmer, you know how much programmers overthink code, and we sometimes think that artists do not overthink their art that much. That's a kind of magical, divine inspiration thing, and there's some of that, but some of a lot of that is just subconscious. There's an, a, a lot of layers of overthinking. I mean, every artist will be different, but I think for programmers actively overthinking stuff can be very, very helpful. I mean, overthink has a negative connotation to it, but you get what I mean. By overthink, I just mean being specific, being intentional, having like a specific purpose in mind every time you make a choice and make choices that are big and there's breathing room between the choices and you can see them as individual choices and like study them almost. Uh, this is in red because this is obviously false. Uh, I'm trying to make an analogy. Uh, if if you are a programmer and I tell you like that the mark of a good programmer is that their code runs correctly on the first try, you would tell me that I hope that most programmers would tell me that that, that I'm crazy. Like this makes uh, no sense almost. And I even I'm I'm willing to flip it completely. Like my take would be that the mark of a bad programmer is that they expect their code to run correctly on the first try. I, I teach programming and I teach pixel art and uh, I can I can make that parallel very confidently. I'm surprised how willing students are to code lines and lines and lines of code and not press the play button once uh, because they that's what they imagine like a good programmer does. And I have to repeat them. No, every time I write a line of code, I almost always I just press the play button and I doubt myself. I overthink stuff. I check stuff constantly. So I can apply that same logic to art. No, like the, the mark of a bad artist is someone who expects expects their art to look perfectly on the first try, expects all the pixels to land on the correct place uh, magically and never have to, to overthink it and go through it and redo. And I mean, the, the conclusion of this is like that, in my mind at least, surprisingly, which might seem counterintuitive, masters are almost always more willing to restart, retry and throw away work than beginners are. Beginners have this pressure to land the plane on the first try and to not be willing to really overthink and go through it and look at the details. Uh, you might agree more or less with this, but I, I really think it's a relatively, it might be very obvious to you, but to, to me, it's a kind of like a counterintuitive uh, discovery that um, the more people throw away their art, the more people doubt their, doubt their art. That's more correlated with skill than with lack thereof, I guess. Uh, the second thing I had in this in those three first uh, quote unquote bad advice is that feedback and critique, and I just mean like people that will say you have to receive feedback and critique, you have to look at your own art also critically and try to feedback it yourself. But what what does that even mean? Like how is this actionable? Am I just showing my art to people and asking is this good? Like am am I doing this? Am I am I hoping for? for my my mom to put the art on the fridge no is is how how can i get anything from this uh, we tie our personal value to the value of our art a lot more than than usual uh, so there's a weird dynamic there and th th this is an idea that i i find interesting and we'll see if, if you if you guys agree but uh i i found this this kind of posts on twitter this is from someone who's very professional uh, but there's examples with people who are more more uh, beginners, which is someone posting a character and going like, make an assumption about this character and I'll tell you if you're right. No, that's a bit of like um, a, a little game that people play with their followers as, as artists. And at some point I just went, wait, this is just someone going, please, could you compile this in your machine and tell me what kinds of warnings, errors, things show up? like? This is debugging. Like this is someone debugging their art. In this case, it's someone who's very professional and probably want to understand if someone tells them something they didn't expect, they won't take it as, oh, I need to fix this. But when I've been doing art for, for games, I found it extremely useful to have some piece that I did and show it to someone and say, what comes to mind? Like, please run this art, I guess, in your own machine your brain and tell me what kind of things come up i won't ask them like is this good do you like it you can do that like that's feedback and probably the other person will give you useful advice uh, apart from yes or no 
but this this shift in mentality of I have this piece of art that I want to um, achieve a specific reaction other than this is good, this is bad. I'll show it to people and see if their reaction aligns with the, with what they expected. And kind of making the parallel between that and the process of debugging code, uh, running code and seeing if the output that, that shows up is the one that you expected made me have like a different relationship to producing art in a more, I need to make art for this product in a more um, tactical way, I guess. I don't know which which one is the word, but yeah, there's, there's this other example. It's not quite the same, but it's related where there's this trick, you know, that artists use, this is faked. It is not the actual same picture flipped where they say, oh, you have to flip your canvas every now and then to break your familiarity with the picture and realize that your anatomy is wrong. And artists love this trick because when you're doing art, you don't have a lot of quick tricks that you can apply to test if something is working. That's something that we're very used to having in programming. We have testing, we have debugging. I can add like a print in my code to see what's going on. We don't have a lot of that in art. So when artists find a little trick like this, they, they love it. Like they recommend it. They, it's very useful. It's something very actionable. And I, I see that as almost like artists engaging with their art in a tech-like manner for a second, and they can get a lot of benefit from that. So if you come from tech, you can try to think more in that sort of framework. Uh, it's just it's just an example, no. But uh, wait, I, I reordered this slightly. But yeah, um, I mean, w one of the conclusions is, and this slide is a lot of discourse. It's a bit like tricky to convey what what I mean. But um, I don't agree, quote unquote, with how this image of the curtains were blue. You might be familiar of it. It has created a lot of discourse. Is being used. Like I agree with part of it. But I think it's very important for people making art, any kind of art, uh, visual art or otherwise, to intend stuff when they're making the art and to interpret intention from the art. That doesn't mean that there's an interpretation that's correct, which is kind of what this image is criticizing, like a teacher that says the interpretation must be this and you, you say otherwise you're wrong. But I also don't agree with the curtains were fucking blue for no reason, like artists make things intentionally and even when something just came out slightly randomly it has reason like someone had to write that word blue like it, nothing is random the the chair you everyone is sitting on at some point it was a blueprint on someone's hands and they had to actually decide the the length of every piece of the chair nothing is random everything has an intention behind and your work as an artist is to intend and to interpret intention very intentionally, I guess. Uh, so yeah, what, what I'm suggesting is the reframing of have feedback and critique instead of talking about just feedback and critique and asking is something good or bad? We want to think in a problem solving manner, in a, I guess, thinky puzzle programming techy manner. I think that's useful. It might not be for some, but I look at a piece of art and I go like, what does this do? Does this work? What does it need to do? What does it want to do? Like. Um, there's there's a lot of distance between something being good or bad, which means not that much, and something being useful or something communicating a specific idea. And that's conversation that's much easier to have. So this is the reframing. No, we're not talking about receiving feedback and critique. We're talking about debugging art. We're talking about art as problem solving. And I, I think that's more useful to not attaching your personal value to your art and thinking, is this good or bad? It's just... Uh, easier way to think about the process. If you're going to be making lots of art, if you're going to be making a full game, you want to think about what do, do I want to get from this? Is it solving the problem I have? It might feel a bit less soulful, but I don't think it is. I don't think tech is soul, soulless. I don't think programming is soulless at all. So I don't see why thinking about art in a similar way makes it less valuable. So I, I think that's a useful framing. And the third one, and one that scares people a, a lot, is like the idea of developing a style. You're an artist, you have a game that you want to make. A game needs to have a strong style. You need to have a strong style. You cannot just be copying things. Uh, but as, as with the other advice, this feels not that actionable. Like, what, what does that mean? Does, does that mean that I just copy enough people where it's 
it's a mesh of everything and what what does this mean no and there's another reframing relating it to tech and to programming that i i came up here which i think might be useful and I, this is another like slightly controversial slide i guess but uh i think you most programmers like that spent most more than like two years programming if if i say programming is not about writing code that works they will get what i mean like it obviously is but it's also very much not like that's just the final layer there's a lot of stuff on top uh, programming is yeah i mean what i tell to my students is like programming is not about getting the machine to understand you that's a given programming is about getting other people to understand you and having a system having a process so i i can apply the same logic to art no like art is not about just making images that are nice to look at and i i apply the same logic that i applied in in programming and i added this little footer here where uh yeah um also given the 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 advent of ai uh making code that works and images that are nice to look at it's a low bar to clear even if you don't think like uh, uh, ai art is beautiful i don't think that's interesting uh, ai art importantly like it's careless it's it's just nice to look at and we can do better than that uh, and we have to and it's interesting to try uh, so my point here is like everyone understands that you can write code that works you have a layer up there that's like software architecture or having a good framework having like all these principles that programmers love to talk about no all these uh, things with acronyms and and model view controller and like uh, whatever there's tons of this you, you get what i mean uh, but with art we think about making art that looks nice as art but the framework i guess or the system that gets you to make art that looks nice what is that like can we talk about art architecture and my kind of idea here is like this is what style is a style is a framework that gets you to making art that looks nice you can develop final art and you can develop your style you can develop your framework you can have a system um so this is kind of the the refraining reframing no like we're not talking about developing a style we're talking about developing a framework, uh, uh, which is your style and which basically consists in any process you can trust, some some tools that you believe in, some system that you can follow uh, with some confidence, no, um, whichever whichever it is, uh, developing a confidence in a, in a process. And uh, yeah, this is something that I also tell uh, students often, which is that in games, especially whenever you're making a big product, uh, consistency is a lot more valuable than quality. Just like in programming, having a good system or framework is a lot more valuable than any of the specific things it produces or any of its parts. And here I'm just gonna go with some examples from games that I think kind of make that point from something like Pizza Tower, which I absolutely adore, but like any piece of art in this game by itself could be very rightfully considered considered messy or like unkempt, even ugly. And the game is absolutely beautiful because I, consistency is a lot more valuable than, than quality and care is a lot more valuable than quality. And there's clear intention of why they made this like this. It's not a random choice. It's it's not like this because of no reason. There's there's a lot of care and intention behind it and it is felt. Uh, and even something like Squishcraft, which is a thinking game, you might know it. And it's it's it wore the fact that the programmer didn't know how to make art in its leaf and went. But this is what style is. This is what care is. Like there's still care behind this. There's an intention. There's a an, an idea behind the, the visuals of this game. And it really works even with everything. Uh, and I, that's that's what, what I mean with like the, the style, the consistency is more valuable than any specific asset that you end up making. Uh, which which comes to this, you no, know, like practicing art is not about finally making the image that will make everyone cry and it will make all your, your previous practice worth it. It's kind of about turning yourself into an art engine. Uh, in programming, you could be developing your game's engine, and then with it, you make a game. Uh, in art, 
you are the engine. I mean, you could include in that like, oh, I found these cool brushes that I'm very confident in, or I decided to work in this specific medium where I feel really comfortable. That's part of the engine, but it's mostly about your confidence in some method, something that you can confidently do and you know that you'll get a good enough result uh, consistently instead of just chasing um, just the image, the pure beauty, which is very fun to do, but it's not a way to develop a style, develop a framework for making for making art. Yeah, so this is the reframing, basically. Instead of developing a style, we talk about style being your framework, finding a process you can trust, and squeezing whatever tools you like, even if it's not the best ones, if it's not the, the most fancy ones, to force them to make art, to treat them with care. You know? And I have another example here from Thomas Was Alone. This is a game that's visually, it, it doesn't have a lot of inspired strokes of the pen. This is a game made by someone who knows how to do lighting, uh, light, lighting in games, knows how to do shaders, knows how to do physics. So this the Vistom Manifesto, it's like, just make art that's ugly but consistent. Make art that's simple but clean and elegant. Make art through shaders, through physics, through code-driven visuals. Like if you're a programmer, just treat those with the respect you treat a, mach a machine that can do art. Like make art through control randomness and procedural noise and make any art that could not be held in a PNG that someone could cannot do like any speed paint. Like it's it, you're using your personal tools to make visual art that you can give care to uh, and think, overthink it, like treat it with a lot of care and respect and give it time, make less choices, make less, more intense choices and make it, make something interesting. And uh, what's the next slide? Yeah, uh, there's, there's this secret, this presentation is secretly about why I love pixel art because it aligns a lot with this stuff. If you actually want to make PNGs, if you want to make assets for a game, um, this is the reasons why I love pixel art, and I just go quickly through them. Uh, fundamentally, like pixel art is very friendly to tech people. You don't need any masterful stroke. You don't need any intuitions. Uh, if you have a 10 by 10 canvas, those are just 100 choices you have to make. And if you make each of them intentionally, you're going to get some art at the other end. And you can think about each of those choices really easily. For example, this I have just, I want to make a flower. I have a 10 by 10 canvas. I have a bunch of colors. I restrict myself in the resolution. I restrict myself in the palette and I can make flowers. And I can think deeply about why I placed each of those pixels there. And that's very useful to develop this intuition that if you have not been doing art since you were a child, um, otherwise you might feel like you're lacking. Uh, so that's that's what got me into, into the mess of, of pixel art. Pixel art also has an insane amount of reliable shorthand rules and terminology that makes it a lot closer to programming, like things that they go like, oh, no, this is, you should never do this. Like, this is a jaggy and jag, jaggy lines are bad and you should avoid them. And those are rules that are very useful to start. And then later on, you can uh, break them. Like, I'm not a pixel art purist. There's enough of those. But yeah, um, there's a lot of, of procedures already set up. You're standing on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of processes that are pre-made and you can follow. Uh, it forces you to limit yourself and make fina finite, finite and bold choices. Uh, you can restrict the palette and commit to a palette. You can restrict the resolution and commit to a resolution. This is uh, like piranha plant piece with just four colors. And it's so fun to work with less colors because you need to be so creative and use this, the same color that in one place is the shadow in the other place is something else like it's it's very it's very techy like you need to come up with solutions that are specific and just go pixel by pixel and be very careful and th that's very fun to me i don't know as a, as a previous programmer and then it also forces you to be debugging your art constantly like it forces you into this cycle of like i zoom in i make some change I zoom out and I evaluate what the hell happened. What changed? Like, do I want this change or not? This example with a character where I literally moved, I think, two pixels in the mouth. And just the, the, the amount of expression change you can get from it, to me, is huge. Like, literally every other pixel in the image is the same. I made a very specific intentional choice. And I can decide, like, 
is the character that I want to make closer to the one on the right or the one on the left. And I can make that decision very intentionally. I just have to have time and get a little bit of speed of making those choices faster over time. But if you take enough time, you can make anything basically. And with that, uh, I can I can send I, I made a while ago for my students and I posted it on, on Twitter, like this pixel art compendium compilation of resources um, that that I've used in the past or that I respect with some tutorials, some software recommendations, some websites and communities that do like pixel art daily stuff like that. Where if someone wants to dip their toes in pixel art can can look into it. I will post the link on the Thinky Discord if someone uh, wants it or you can copy it here i made like a short url uh, and finally uh, this is shameless block uh, we just announced uh, log digital the art in this game is not mine but i it follows a lot of the ideas i have about art about intentionality and being very bold and charming and intentional and brutal and minimalistic and it's a it's a little thinky puzzle game that i'm programming uh, it's an adaptation of a, of a puzzle book uh, and we have the demo on steam so you can go play it if you're interested and uh, that's kind of it um I, I have this pixel piece with don't forget to love each other from critical role that i made a while ago just to close the presentation and i, I hope it was useful I, I always felt it was a bit rambly and that uh, it kind of has a point but really doesn't it says things that are both very obvious and very strange uh, I hope it added something to you. I will be answering any questions either here or in Discord. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I loved all your reframing of things into the tech perspective. <laughs> it's super inspiring. Um, we don't have a, we don't really have any time for questions really. And I think the one question did come up sort of answered by your last slide. Uh, Mario was asking what software you recommend for people doing pixel art. Oh, <laughs> it's right. <laughs> A sprite? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, for pixel art, like, it doesn't have a competition. I know that people who like using CSP for pixel art or even Photoshop, but to me, like, it's so honed for pixel art, a sprite, it's very hard to, it's not free, though. But I, I, I mean, in my compendium thing, there's some free alternatives uh, that I, I try to gather, but I really recommend a sprite. Awesome. I need to try it myself. Uh, yeah, there's not really much time for any other uh, questions. Uh, we need to try and catch up on the schedule. Uh, but if you do have any more, please head over to thinkyapes.com slash discord uh, and ask any additional questions you have in the discord. There's a thread for the talk. I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, and thank you once again, Farhan. That was wonderful. Um, and I'll see everybody else in a minute for the next talk. See you then.
Hello, everyone. We are back with our next speaker, uh, Connector, uh, who uh, many people will know from the thinking community, uh, to talk about a very, very familiar puzzle in extreme detail. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and uh, if any of you, like as usual, if anybody has any questions, please um, please do ask them in the YouTube live chat. Uh, and tag Thinky Games so that I see them, and then I can try and ask them if we've got time at the end. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll take questions to Discord afterwards. Uh, all right, over to you, Cresta. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Hurtado, Exeter. Uh, first of all, thanks to Joseph and to Ludipi and to everyone for making this ThinkyCon possible and for organizing and everything. I think it's been really wonderful three days with a lot of talks and i'm very excited to be part of it and yes without any further introductions uh, let's get to talking about the beautiful state graph of microban one but before that there might be a couple of questions like what's a state graph and what's microban one uh, let's start with the second one microban one is possibly the most famous sokoban level sokoban for those of you that don't know is a very it's a classic puzzle game where you control a player that moves in a grid and there are boxes and there are targets and you have to get all the boxes into the targets and you can only push a uh, one box at a time and that's it uh, this game is really simple but really it's really simple and really universal and has a lot of it has a huge possibility space so a, a huge snyder capacity as Elite would say. Uh, yes, yeah, so a long, a long time, a lot of people have been making custom puzzles for it. And 24 years ago, David Skinner released the, the Microban set, which is like 150 Sokoban levels, focus each of them very tiny and focus on a single core idea or Sokoban trick. And yeah, these are really wonderful levels. They follow the, the modern puzzle design sensibilities of levels shouldn't be tedious, they should focus on a thing, they should have a clear central idea. And yes, these are 150 wonderful levels. And Microban A1 is the first of this. So why this one in particular has got so famous? Uh, well, my theory is that it's because of puzzle script. Puzzle script is a hugely influential think in the thinking community it's an engine uh, for quickly making grid based games like like sokoban so in the default the default level of the default uh, example project for puzzle script is microban one which means that a lot of people have seen it so it has given it kind of like a meme status you know like just like the lorem ipsum test text that is used as the placeholder in web pages it's kind of like a, a reference. So it's tradition. If you are making a thinky puzzle game with like crates and walls and targets and so on, to include a, a reference to Microban 1 in your game. Even if your game has completely different mechanics, it can, and you just need a random Sokoban level, it's, you will usually use a Microban 1. But yeah, that this is Microban 1. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about the shape of Microban 1. I'm here to talk about the state graph of Microban 1. So what's the state graph? It's the graph of states. And let me show you a, an example. Here on the left, again, we have Microban 1. And right now, it's, there's no hidden information of this game. It, everything there is to know about the level is visible right now. So the player is here, this grade is here, that grade is there. So if we take a a screenshot of the level and store it here. Then, a, a, like this is a, a thing that exists. Then we can move and we can take, a, let's say, another screenshot. And each of these screenshots, it's a, it's a node in a graph, which you don't need to know what that means. But basically, from its new state is one of these circles, and they have a certain structure. So, from you cannot go from any state to any other state. You have to go through other, some other states first. And for example, here, note that if I move down and then up, I end up in a different state between this state and this state. 
they are different because even if the player player's avatar is in the same position, this create isn't. So it's a different state. And yeah, the state graph is basically a, exactly this. A, you start to generate the state graph. You just start with the with the initial state and just a, use brute force to to explore all of it and to do all possible moves. And this will generate a graph that you have all the all the information about the level should be contained here. And yeah, this is kind of neat, but why do we care? Well, it's because all the information about the level is contained here. So in some sense, this is like the true representation of a puzzle. It's it's a state graph. And this is this can be seen that like there's a reflection between this mathematical structure and the the process that we as players and designers uh, take when playing and designing these puzzles. So as a first example, here, for example, we have a note that we have a one-way arrow from this state to this other state. You know, the player moves up, and this is a one-way arrow. So as players, uh, we know that when a crate gets stuck on a corner, that's it. There's no way in vanilla Sokoban, there's no way to get the crate out of that corner. So we can we can know that like as a as a feel thing. But also we can discover that as a using brute force. Because if we look at the state graph, even if we fully explored all of this the whole graph, we could find that in this whole region like all the states in this region have the this grid here. So all of this region only has inbound arrows. There are no there are no arrows that leave this region. And this is like a mathematical thing that you can that you can check mechanically, which also but with which corresponds to part of the experience of solving the puzzle. And that's why we are interested in state graphs. Some other examples. Earlier, we heard Elliot talking about uh, key moves or bottlenecks. And this is also something that we care about as players and designers. And that is also evident in the in the structure of the graph. So here, let's say that the player starts in some state in this cluster. And if they want to get to the solution, which is over here, they must find the unique key move that takes them from one area of the state graph to another. And for example, we could very easily make a level with two bottlenecks, just place one until under, after the other, and that's it. And we can see that in the graph structure. And yeah, maybe we can like look at the state graph of a level. Uh, for example, this could be a level with a lot of dead ends because the player can explore very deeply in one direction without actually getting closer to the solution. And once they commit to a direction, they cannot go back. These are one-way arrows. Um, yeah, here's a last example. This could be, for example, a very tight level because at each point in the level, it's just you have very few options, but also a very deep level because there's a lot of stuff you have to do to get to the goal. So just by looking at the, the state graph, we can like get a feel of how will this level uh, feel like uh, for a player. OK, so now that we know all about state graphs, let's look at the, at the complete state graph of Microbank 1 and see what it can tell us about the, the experience of playing Microbank 1. Uh, here, it takes a bit of time to, to load. Note that the, even if this is a very, very tiny level, since mo each of the parts can move independently from the others, uh, its new possibility, like its new create position, multiplies the the number of states, which means that from a very tiny level we had we get a huge state graph. And I don't know about you, but when I look here, I see nothing. Like this is just noise. This is not. This is not beautiful, and we cannot use this to to gain any insight about Microbank One and 
what about the puzzle. And this is because it's too granular. We need to, to abstract a bit. So for that, let's take inspiration from the player. The player, when they play Sokoban, usually they are not thinking about each individual key press. Instead, they are thinking about higher level goals like moving boxes. So from the point of view of the player, they are not thinking, I'm going to go down, 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 right, up. Instead, they are thinking, I'm going to move the left box up. And for, for them, this is just one state change. So we can see here, for example, all of these states they are basically the same. So yeah, what we are going to do is take all of these and collapse them into a single state because the player is in the same position for, for all of them. So now let's roll the state graph, but ignoring the player's position. And we can see that from the starting space state, there are now four options. Move this crate up or down, and move this crate a left or right. So if we expand the whole thing, the first thing we notice is that it's now much smaller. So that's a win. But also, more importantly, it has a lot more structure, which is very will be very important later. Still, it's a bit too many nodes to manually, manually analyze. So let's take another last step, uh, which will be to trim the sum of the, space, of the states. For example, if we look at these five states, they are basically the same, except that the left box is going up and down. No? But me as a player, I don't think of these five states as different states. I don't think about them as total. Because once this crate is stuck on a corner, that's it. Like I don't care at all about all these states. So let's uh, redraw the graph again, but removing the states where a crate is in a corner or where this crate is in this wall. And when we do that, we finally get to the to the beautiful state graph of microban one. And this is a tiny state graph as it should correspond to a tiny level. Okay. Let me rotate it a bit and a couple of aesthetic changes for the structure to be clearer. But this is just the, the state graph. OK, we can finally start. Let's take a look at it and use it to, to interpret uh, Microban 1. The first thing we will notice is that it has a very clear uh, two dimensional grid structure. So, a structure. If we look in the vertical direction, we can see that moving vertically is more or less is equivalent to moving this the left crate up and down. And doesn't matter where we are. When we move vertically in the graph, we it's, we move the left box up and down. And similarly, when we move horizontally along the graph, it's equivalent to moving the right crate closer to the goal. So the right crate has five steps to the goal, and they correspond to these five five columns in the graph. And also, it has like this extra space it can be in, which corresponds to this this appendix that grows out of the two dimensional structure. Okay, uh, so let's just let's forget about the level and just take a look at the graph. Given that we start here and we want we want to get there, uh, the rational or the the simplest solution would be to just move in a in a straight line. So we comp we just go from this state to this state to this state, and we would we would win the level. But of course, this is impossible because we cannot move from this state with these two crates here into this other state. It's just not possible because we cannot get the player here. The left crate being on the target prevents us from solving the right crate. OK, it's just not possible. OK, so given this, uh, our next uh, try could be uh, going up, then left, then right, then down to avoid this, this obstacle, which could, in terms of the level, would mean moving this left box out of the way now moving the right box to its target and then moving the left box back to its original position. But of course, this doesn't work because this is uh, all those arrows are one way. So the solution fails again. 
now the right box being on the target prevents us from solving the left box. Like there's a, it rhymes with the previous situation. So what's the, what's the actual solution? Well, it's this more convoluted path, which is equivalent, like in terms of the graph, we can see that it's more twisty than the magenta or the green paths. But, and in terms of the level, it means uh, start by getting the left crate out of the way, then half solving the right crate, then storing it in this extra position that is outside of the two dimensional grid. And now we can get the left crate back down and finally solve the right crate. And now we have solved microband one. And yeah, that's about it. I think it's really beautiful. How can we, how we started with a mathematical thing, a mathematical object generated by brute force, but like it reflects the actual experience of solving microband one. If you look at a, at a player with little Sokoban experience, approach this level, the first thing will, they will try usually is to push this box here and then they realize that it blocks their way, then they will get here, realize that if they finish pushing, pushing the box, it will block their way, and finally uh, find the correct solution. And uh, yeah, I think it's really unique how like there's a reflection between like the mathematical structure and the, the actual player psychology. Um, I don't know, I think, you are all now world experts in the beautiful state graph of microband one. But before, okay, this is all very nice and so on, but even better, it has some practical applications. Uh, and my favorite application of this is a plagiarism. If we have a concrete work of art, if we can produce like a, an abstract, a summary, uh, then we can take that summary and bring it back into another concrete work of art. And it's, this lets us create new works of art with the same, the same summary, let's say. So let's do that for microband one. Now that we know uh, how its state graph looks, let's use that to make a puzzle with the same state graph. So here's a puzzle. Uh, there are, it's a physical puzzle. Like there are two wires. Each of them has a, has a bit, like a, a ball. And the goal is to get both of them into their to their end of their wires. This puzzle is made exclusively for ThinkyCon 2024. Okay, so this one starts already solved. Let's just take the other one and solve it. But of course, this doesn't work because the purple being solved prevents us from solving the other one. This might be familiar. Okay, no problem. Let's just remove this, solve this and take this one back, but of course, this doesn't work either. The yellow being solved prevents us from solving the purple one. Okay, so what's the solution? Well, the solution is to find a, a new state where the yellow is, let's say, half solved, and now the yellow, we unsolve the purple one, half solved the yellow one, and now we can finish solving the yellow. And that's that's the solution for this simple puzzle, which should hopefully I'm not crazy and you see that it's more or less the same as microband one. And yeah, I think it's really interesting how there might be aliens out there. They might not have Sokoban, they might not have uh, boxes and pushing and targets and so on. But if they have puzzles, it's possible that they have one with the same state graph as microband one. Uh, this example is a bit convoluted. Uh, let me show you a real world example of plagiarism. And yeah, this is my level for lab rational thinking, which is a game that we made collectively in the Thinking Collective. Uh, one person, each person takes the game from the previous one, adds a single level or a single mechanic, or uh, changes the art and passes it to the next person. So when my turn came, I had no idea of what level to make. 
but luckily I uh, I knew about the state graph of microband one and I'm not afraid to do plagiarism. So I just took a simplified version of the, of the state graph with only the first two bats and made it into a level for this game. And in this level, there are two crates and two buttons. And I want, as a designer, I want the player to forget about this crate and just try to move this other crate directly to the button, which could, in the state space, would correspond directly move to the solution. And of course, this doesn't work. The trick of the level is that they have to get this box out of its solved position, use that as leverage to move the other box into position, and then resolve the original one. And yeah, this is a real level that in a real game that's made from from the state graph of Microband One. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just to recap, here's some. Okay, so like this is a thing that you can do. Uh, just to recap, uh, here's some actionable advice to close the talk. So, if you are making a thingy puzzle game, if it's like a, if it's a Sokoban like with grid base and boxes and so on, make a level with the shape of Microban One, uh, which just as a meme as a reference. But more importantly, even if your game doesn't isn't based on Sokoban, you can probably make a uh, one level with the same state graph as microband one and this is very useful when you need just one more level or you are a bit stuck and don't know what to do you need to design levels which is hard i think uh, just looking at microband one for inspiration and adapt it to the unique mechanics of your game this is like actionable advice that you can do right now if you are making a thinky puzzle game but more importantly i want all of you to keep an eye out for other plots because microband one i mean microband the set of levels has another more than 100 other levels and there's also microband 2 and microband 3 and microband 4 and millions of released puzzles so i think it's important to or it's valuable valuable to take a look at these puzzles and like see what plots they are using like try solve a puzzle try to write down the story that it's telling and then you can use that uh, you can put that on your tool belt for making your own puzzles not as a reference but as a tool in the same way that musicians have like their 251 chords or that writers have their three act structure like we as puzzle designers should have uh, some common plots or fables of uh, puzzles. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Um, you're now microband one experts. Um, yeah. Uh, any questions? I don't know if there's time, but I haven't been looking at the chat. So I... <laughs> thank you for the talk, Daniel. That was amazing. Uh, I thought I knew everything you were going to say because I'd seen like previous drafts of this. But then when you showed the lab rational thinking puzzle, I was like, oh my god, that's awesome. <laughs> right behind you of course it is uh and i love the idea of being able to take away those like like take those puzzles and just remake them completely and they just feel like completely different puzzles even if they're the same state graph it's fantastic yeah. uh there are a couple of questions Lots. i'll i'll try and ask them if we can get um we were a little bit behind starting so we'll go a little bit behind i'll be also on the discord cool yeah. I'll, I'll ask a couple of them anyway uh so plush lola has asked um is there a way to make state graphs for arbitrary puzzles? What tool are you using for Microband? Uh, yes, for this one in particular, it's a bit uh, handmade. But in general, as long as you code, like you can code your whole game as a single function. Like you can, is, you can code your game as a pure function that takes a state and an input and produces a new state. And as long as you can code your game this way, which is the case of uh, all turn-based games, first you get Undo for free, which is nice. And also you can plug it into any graph library and look at the result. Uh, for this, I'm using BizJS, which is like a JavaScript library for drawing graphs and so on but any graph library will work. Note 
that like this is just a microband one and it already generates this huge like for the general case it's not practical to draw the whole state graph so yeah. you can also like play the game and have pen and paper and note okay from here i can get to here like more high level states like create this stack to this wall uh, but yeah if you want to go programming wise there are it's possible I remember once trying to generate the state graph for Lacrimose head in Steven's sausage roll and just realized it's an absurdly large state graph on my, I think I, I left it running for like a day. It was like, oh, this is probably not going to actually finish. Um, anyway, we don't have time for any more questions. Oh, sorry, Daniel. And also, like, you can start by generating the graph and then, okay, this is too big, but, but I see it, like it has some structure, so maybe I can collapse these nodes. Mm -hmm. And like iteratively, uh, keep reducing the graph. Absolutely, indeed. Uh, so yes, thank you, thank you, Daniel, for that, um, and thank you for the questions. Sorry that we can't answer them all, but uh, Connexta will be in the uh, Discord. Thinkgames.com slash thinkgames.com slash Discord. You think I'd be able to say it by now? Uh, and there's a thread for this talk in the talks channel where you can ask your questions. Uh, so once again, thank you again, uh, and we'll just go set up for the next talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are back with our next speaker, Alexander King, who's here to talk about generating procedural puzzles from classic literature. Very interesting talk topic. Uh, once again, uh, if anybody has any questions, please leave them in the YouTube live chat. I will try and keep track of them. It makes it easier if you can tag Thinky Games in your question. Uh, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, and other than that, uh, I'll hand over to Alexander King to start his talk. Over to you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and yeah, thanks for for having me. Really pleased to be here at the the first uh, Thinky Thinky Con. And um, uh, my talk is actually maybe like a halfway point between uh, two that I saw yesterday. Um, Elliot Grant's about handmade puzzles, uh, and and Jonas Segre's about procedural ones. This is like about splitting the difference. Um, so um, I wanted to show you a bit uh, about um, uh, this game, uh, Dear Reader, and how it works and, and how we approach some of the, the design. Um, uh, just to, to introduce myself, my name's Alexander King. I'm a, I'm a game designer. I do commercial and artistic work. Uh, and I also teach some classes at um, uh, Parsons and the NYU Game Center here in New York. Notice that there are a lot of people in the uh, in the Thinky Game dev community who are also academics. I, I can't, it's shocking. Uh, I, I know. Um, uh, so, so, so I teach part time and, and also work as a systems designer. Um, and I didn't always make games. I think this, this is common for for a lot of you as well. Uh, I used to be an analyst, and I made uh, things things like this. This is an old recording dashboard, um, and I loved uh, spreadsheets. Um, but but being an analyst wasn't uh, wasn't for me, and so then I became a, a game designer. So you'll you'll see some influence of that uh, uh, later in the talk. Um, and by the way, you can tell this is a vintage uh, photo, uh, not because the monitor in the picture is is small, uh, but because even an entry level uh, employee had a cubicle um so that's that's how you know this is in in the olden days uh, now it would be a, you know like an open floor plan or something um so i'm here to to talk about uh, a game that i've been um uh, had a chance to help work on for the past um uh geez, a long time five uh six, five or six years called dear reader um so it's a it's a uh, it's a word game, uh, word word puzzle game uh, that where we procedurally generate the, the puzzles um, on the fly using the text of classic literature. Uh, so one of the main conceits of the game is that there's a variety of different kinds of puzzles, um, all operating on the text of of actual literature. And I'm going to show you more about how this how this works uh, in, in a minute. Um, and I'm, I'm one of the, the game designers, but a number of people worked on the game. Uh, so this isn't this isn't just me. Um, uh, local number twelve, uh, which was founded by Colleen Macklin, John Sharp, and Eric Zimmerman, uh, and almost everybody on the team, I think, except for our our developers, our, our programmers, um, is a is an academic in some form or fashion. Um, and uh, that gives us like you know particular affordances since uh, this is a like a part-time project um, uh, for everybody. So we're slower at doing everything, um, but um, gives us more time to, to kind of test uh, and iterate and polish and things like that. Um, so one thing I want to mention is Dear Reader is one of the, the launch titles uh, in Apple Arcade back in back in fall 2019, and it's been an Apple Arcade exclusive ever since. Um, so if you're not familiar with Apple Arcade, then I'm contractually obligated to inform you that it's an amazing subscription service where you pay $4.99 a month for access to an amazing and curated selection of games, which are free to subscribers, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, uh, but um, the I bring it up because it's kind of like an odd thing having a game that's that's like done well in um, in Apple Arcade because um, the like you're you're trapped in this in this kind of like you know walled garden like they've there's this walled garden called apple arcade and if you're in the garden it's great everyone's walking around having a great time uh playing playing your game uh but if you're outside of the the garden then uh there you can't see what's in there it's just this wall and you have no idea uh what's going on so it's it's kind of a bummer because it means that the game isn't um particularly accessible so because you can't just go and easily play it um and uh so um uh but it has been beneficial because you know outside of the the walled garden it's like you know it's it's tough for uh smaller smaller devs on on mobile um so it's like maybe it's maybe it's not so bad so but i bring that up because it, it makes it harder to kind of just go check out that check out the game um and so if you haven't uh, heard of it that that's probably why but in that little walled garden uh we've been been hanging out uh for for five years we, we have a, a good size player base uh, we've been have players who've been playing it for for years um and so i'm, I'm really really proud of that um and it's been um uh, uh you know uh 
uh, has uh, enough uh, of, a, of a player base that's been able to sustain our, our core team working on it, uh, continuing development for for almost five years now, um, uh, in, in a, on a on this kind of ongoing part time basis. Um, and also, um, uh, it used to be called Lost Words, and then we changed it right before we launched. Um, so if the if you like backed it on Kickstarter under a different name, um, uh, that's that's why. Uh, and there's a really great talk uh, from GDC 2019, uh, but by our, by our lead designer Eric Zimmerman on the, the iteration process of of um, uh, when it was called Lost Words so that, that that I recommend. Okay, so so anyway, um, I want to talk about the the, the main topic, main topic this um, uh, mixed approach um, uh, that um, in, internally I, we started calling artisanal uh, procedurality, um, maybe um, uh, maybe as a joke I think at first, and then. Um, uh, it, it just sort of sort of stuck. Um, so so here's my. I'm not really proposing this as like a, a real term, um, but but just for the just for uh, purposes of discussion, uh, this artisanal procedurality um, as a sort of compromise uh, or, or, or synergy. Um, so the idea is that uh, aspects of the game are handcrafted um, and aspects of it are are procedural. Um, and I think there's a this is like an interesting tension in a lot of. Um, uh, games in the in this kind of space, right? Where, on one hand, if it's uh, handcrafted or, or, or artisanal, you have um, you know a lot of control. Uh, you can you can make sure all of the individual puzzles are, are high quality, um, but it takes a lot of work um, to do it, and it, and it doesn't scale, right? Um, and so. Uh, you know, the, if it's procedural, then it's it's you have this infinite amount of content. Um, uh, although it's like also labor intensive to make, um, just in a different different way, uh, and um, uh, can can often be be sort of trickier. Um, it's it's procedurality isn't a, a, a panacea. You can you can get infinite generation, um, but you can run into. Um, I've always liked uh, Kate Compton calls the like in infinite bowls of oatmeal problem, like that you're generating all the stuff that is technically unique. Um, but but indistinguishable from each other. So so um, there's like all sorts of um, uh, issues on, on both sides of this. Um, so uh, like like I mentioned, the 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 game uses the text of of actual literature. So it's a, we're we're taking advantage of, of public domain uh, books. Um, we launched with like. 50 books, and we have like four or five times as many of that now. Um, a lot of like greatest hits of the public domain, um, but also some like cool deep cuts and, and, and so on. Uh, oh, and our art director, John Sharp, does all these very stylish covers in this um, cool mid-century modernist uh, aesthetic. So uh, the way that we turn a, a book uh, into levels in Dear Reader um, isn't just cleaning the text file and um, uh, dumping it in, um, because there's a real design challenge with using like real text um, as as a basis for puzzles. Um, the text has to be well, so we, you do have to process it. Um, you have to like remove all of the weird characters and standardize the m dashes and that sort of thing. I uh, like got really good at it regex over the course of this. This was like one of the first things that I was I was doing on Dear Reader was uh, cleaning all of our our, um, uh, our our text files um, so that they could be be processed uh, the same way. In, in game. Um, uh, uh, oh, and I should mention, as I'm talking about this, sometimes um, people think that this is an educational game when if I'm talking about it. Um, and uh, it's something a playtester said as well when we used Alice as the tutorial book. That used to be the, the the first book that you would get. People would be like, "Oh, this is really fun," but like, um, so like this is like like an educational game for kids, right? I would be like, "No, no, it's just a you know, it's just a regular game, just a game, game, game." Um, so then, uh, like, because books have such a strong cultural association with like learning, I guess, and like that, so that people think it's a learning kind of game to like help you help you read books uh, or something like that, um, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but this is this is squarely uh, like in the books are are fun, just just a game sort of thing. Um, and we changed the, the tutorial book to Pride and Prejudice. Um, and then people stopped thinking it was a educational game for kids. And instead, they would think that they had come up with it themselves. And they would say, hey, you know, you could you could make you could sell this to kids to get them to read books, and we would say, "Oh wow, yeah, great idea," uh, but but um, kids don't have the five four ninety nine that pay for Apple Arcade, so I guess it wouldn't work. Anyway, anyway, so we uh, we we we're taking Alice, and we we want to um, put this in game. Uh, so we've cleaned the text. Uh, and then um, we put it into this uh, CMS system um, that, that we have for managing 
just this sort of thing. Um, because we we don't actually use the entirety of every book. Um, it's it's too much text. Um, so we have like our level design process is um, the the person who's chapterizing the the book um, is going through and, and taking out um, a sort of snippets, which is its own um, a really difficult um, challenge because um, not everything, not all text like plays well for for puzzles. Like it, it, it you know, lots of um, uh, lots of short snippets of dialogue like doesn't make for good puzzles. Each line is too short, like paragraphs work better and, and, and things like that. Um, but uh, this isn't like, this is real, just like real text that has linguistic meaning. Like it, you can't just take what you want. Like it has to kind of, we still have to be um, getting the the semblance of, of, of um, the, the book that you're, the book that you're reading. And, and so there's a real challenge with um, curating the, the text that we're using uh, for, for puzzles. Um, so now that we've done that, um, we, we're, you're going to take the, um, uh, the, the text, um, so like Pride and Prejudice, uh, and when you play through it after it's completed this, uh, this process, um, you are um, going to play through some, some puzzle using this text that is like scrambled it in some way. Um, so so the, the mode that is, is playing on the, on the screen is, is one called Swap, uh, where um, it goes through and it switches the order of a bunch of words, and you're trying to reconstruct the, the original text. Um, uh, but it's not just a one one kind of puzzle. Um, so um, here's the exact same thing in Pride and Prejudice, but this time it's rearranged, which is flipping lines instead of instead of words. Um, and so uh, we've got um, over over twenty different kinds of puzzles um, uh, like this. Um, and so the the puzzle uh, then is is getting um, uh, generated on on the fly, and the the solution to every puzzle, though, is always the original text. Like you're, you're always reconstructing the the original text of the work. Um, so English grammar is like a heuristic for solving these puzzles, um, but won't always help you because um, authors break the rules of of English grammar all the time. Um, so in playing, you get to like have this weird word level perspective or like 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 bookworm level crawling through the text. Um, and you get a feel for language in a way that's like really difficult to describe. Um, as you're playing a particular author, you you kind of get this sense for how they write because you're you're always reconstructing um, the, the text. Um, and so that's like the cool thing, right? Is, is that this is totally procedural, um, that we are not handcrafting the puzzles. They're assembled 100% on, on the fly. So we can take the same a portion of text, um, like this this first part of um, uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, and make we have uh, like a mode where different words are anagrammed, or one where uh, you have to you have to fill in part of a part of a sentence, um, or one where you have to just find uh, a certain word, uh, or one where we've taken out lots of letters and, and you have to assemble the letters, um, or one where uh, it's sequence again, but it's uh, you have to do it in the right order, um, uh, or uh, the swap, the one that I mentioned before, and and so on and so forth, a uh, whole 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 bunch of these. Um, and so uh, when you open up uh, a, a given book, um, it's randomly picking um, uh, from these. So so you're never going to get the same um, uh, as you as you play. You're going to see lots of different different kinds of puzzles uh, and and play through. Uh, even the same text that you've played through is going to be different every time you play it, um, which is really funny. So when the game launched, the like game solver website started like a guide, posted started posting guides for the game, which is like really amazing. Um, but I feel really bad for whoever like you know like played through the game and and then like to like transcribed the solutions to to playing the the, the first level of flatland one of the one of the books in the game um but like yes it's, oh sorry it's like it's not going to be this way literally the next time you, that you play like so it's it's like useless as a uh, as a as a walkthrough um so uh, we can have uh, different puzzles on the on the same text um and we can have the uh, the same uh, puzzle uh, with the same text, but we can also change the difficulty um, because as soon as something is procedural, uh, right, that you have all of these parameters uh, and those parameters you can adjust. Um, so uh, one thing that we want is over the course of a, of a chapter, uh, we want to have a difficulty ramp um, so that like, um, you know, gets gets more difficult uh, as, as you play. And it wouldn't be really possible to do that by, by hand and certainly not with 
the volume of text that we have and, and the, the number of puzzles. Um, you can't handcraft it all. Um, but it, it also can't be completely random. Um, we we did try like all sorts of, of things uh, that, that were like fully procedural and things like that. Um, but it was it was really difficult to, to balance. Um, so so that's our artisanal procedurality and 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 I'm I'm using this difficulty kind of player difficulty as the example case um, uh, for you. Um, so on the elements of difficulty that are artisanal um, is the the fact that we are are curating the the books. Um, we have we have um, uh, for for launch uh, we, we had uh, a, a dedicated curator, um, a woman named Mehek Khan, uh, and then and since then uh, uh, somebody on the team, Karina Pop, has is um, uh, like or the main. Uh, contribution that uh, she's doing is, is finding books and, and making sure we're, we're having a diverse selection of authors and, and things like that. Um, uh, all, all sorts of all sorts of cool things. So so the like we're picking what books there are. It's it's not random or just surfacing random text. Um, and then like I mentioned, we're also curating the text of the of the chapters themselves, um, and um, uh, you, you know pay, paying a lot of attention to that. So there are a lot of handcrafting elements to make sure that like the the substratum that the procedure is running on is is well equipped uh, for it, um, and then the the puzzles themselves are like hand designed, like in the sense that we just like, we're not randomly generating the design of the puzzles. Like we, you know, they're uh, they were literally handcrafted, like um, uh, a, a lot of these by by playing different, um, you know, with different mechanics that use words and and things like that. Um, uh, so we're like. We have a finite number of puzzles, I, I, I guess, and uh, that they were they were doing. Um, and the the other things that we're um, uh, uh, proceduralizing are that difficulty ramp that I that I mentioned. That we want the 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 first page to be easier than the last page of a chapter. And we want it to get harder over time. Um, and it seems like we should do that, like proceed like the. The way that that happens is procedural, but we define uh, in in actually a lot of detail like what that how that actually happens. So this is one of the the um, our, our backend spreadsheets. Um, for a given mode, it's like we have all of these different levels of difficulty um, that that have, have different start endpoints. And for every single puzzle type, we have to like hand specify like what is like what is an easy swap. Um, an easy swap is it swaps four words. Um, and like a really difficult one is it swaps 10 words. Like all of this was discovered through a lot of play testing and, and iteration, like finding what's what's too difficult. And what's So all of the bounds of these parameters have to be kind of like, um, you know, uh, uh, tuned, tuned to find the, the bounds of the, of the procedure. Um, so um, a lot of these are, are just sort of, yeah, traditional, Hand-designed gameplay elements, um, but um, but like I said, you can't can't do everything that way. Um, so the the breakpoints um, uh, of the puzzles are are handcrafted, but but what we didn't do is craft like what words get picked. Um, so instead, we we have a procedure um, that crawls through the text and is just making these choices on on what to uh, what to swap. Um, it is like so much more involved than you might think to, to do these kinds of puzzles. Um, like one of the, it's like a, uh, no one's, no one's ever going to clone Dear Reader because of the amount of labor that it takes to like, you have no idea the number of like, oh, you, the one where we're, we're pulling out letters will like, or, we're, or the word swap, if you swap I with I, like the same word twice. Well, that's not very. That's not like very. That's pretty hard to solve. Um, you know, kind of fun. like. So there's each um, puzzle mode has a litany of rules behind it. That's making sure that the 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 thing that it's doing to screw up the text will then actually be solvable uh, afterwards. Um, and then that difficulty ramp uh, that I mentioned um, uh, was we also want now that we have all of these levers, we want these kind of interesting ramps. Um, and so uh, we have like a formula that is determining, um, you know, given the amount of text that we have and, and so on and so forth, how all of those parameters should be, um, uh, should be tuned so that we're getting that the kind of cadence uh, that we want. Um, uh, I have this twice. Um, and then uh, the, the other procedural element is like now that we have these parameters, is we can do things like we could have a we could have a twist is what was what we call is a is like our our 
um, our boss mode, uh, a sort of thing um, that has, uh, uh, we can now can like combine puzzles since we're making the puzzles, running the puzzles on the fly. Like we can do all sorts of weird stuff. We can make you play a different puzzle every single page or something like that, um, or other weird things like having to play the pages in reverse order um, and, and things like that. Um, so these are like the bosses uh, sort of of the game, but they're, but they're procedural bosses. And these two have their own spreadsheet of all of their difficulty ramps and, 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 and things like that. Um, uh, so um, the uh, twist design uh, ha has this kind of procedure element. This is the <laughs> this is part of the spreadsheet that details how twists work um, and, and all the different things like how how the difficulty should be should be tuned. Um, if it's going to mix different modes, how many modes is it going to mix and, and, and things like that. Um, so again, the the like I guess this maybe is is the I would maybe this should be an artisanal, but the the way that this is um, uh, affects the gameplay is is, is totally procedural. Um, and then I I mean I guess that there are aspects of the, the game that are neither as they relate to difficulty. Like the books themselves have intrinsic difficulty. Um, like uh, Sappho's um, poems uh, are just more difficult um, because the the language can, can be antiquated in its poetry. Uh, poems in general uh, tend to be more difficult, um, and so we have like a. Uh, a, a difficulty that we determine um, that when we put the books in the game, we, we classify them based on our sense um, and then actually later go and adjust if we find that we kind of got it wrong, um, something being easier than we thought or harder than we thought. Um, and then we also allow the players to select difficulty. Um, this came out of like literally years of, of play testing. Um, some players found that time pressure just ruined the game for them and makes it too stressful. Uh, and other people thought without without a ticking clock, like you could just take as long as you want to solve it. There's no pressure whatsoever. Uh, and so they weren't interested in playing, which is a really funny, uh, we ultimately decided on like the, the worst solution to that problem, which is just, you can pick it. <laughs> so we have different kind of like player selected modes um, so that if you are really turned off by um, uh, uh, time pressure, you don't have to have, to have it. Um, so, uh, in this way, we're, we're able to have kind of a, um, a, a difficulty ramp across the experience, um, but that we've tightly bound um, with all these handcrafted handcrafted elements. Um, and uh, there's like, it's like we ended up with, there's too much that you could handcraft, um, but it was so specific uh, that it, it couldn't be entirely procedural. Um, uh, so, so this is again showing the, the um, you know, the text that we're using, uh, we can we can run all these cool puzzles on it, uh, we can do it on the fly, uh, and all this stuff. Um, but getting to where this is just playable, and we could just do this, there's like a lot of handcrafted elements um, uh, that are that are in the wings bounding this this kind of procedural aspect of it. Um, but in mixing them, I think you can kind of get um, th this sort of like uh, a, a best of both worlds um, a, a sort of thing where um, you're uh, like the the procedure is, you know has has all these all these benefits um, but we're um, uh, we, we've like uh, set the the exact structure that it's going to be uh, doing it by um, and then I guess you know I, I haven't mentioned but like the, the game has all the like the usual stuff you would expect in in a, a kind of a, a, a game that you play on your foot like we have a daily challenge and stuff like that that this also helps support. Um, so like, I, I, I do think it's a, an interesting case, um, uh, working on Dear Reader and, um, that like a lot of game design is, is figuring out how to solve the particular problems. And so, um, like this, uh, of trying to turn this text into, um, uh, like the, the text of public domain literature and turning it into puzzles is like, it's pretty specific to to Dear Reader. It's not like a there's not like a big uh, genre, like it's not like a like a Sokoban game or something like that. This isn't a, a genre of puzzle types necessarily. Um, but the the kind of this this idea of um, uh, that that you don't have to just be uh, like oh in my game I'm we're just we're we're doing procedural puzzles. That's what it's about an infinite number of puzzles and and, and we're kind of committing to that or. Uh, no, no, we're going to handcraft everything, and and everything's going to be better because it's handcrafted. Um, you can you can kind of like have it have it both ways. Um, that that they're that and, and take aspects of those of both of those into account when 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 designing certain things. Um, so that's my that's my like the the takeaway from this. So so uh, not that you should use public domain. Oh, public domain is great. Big supporter of the. 
Creative Commons and, and all you should you should do that, but you should uh, uh, do this is, is proceduralize aspects of your handcrafted puzzles that like by taking something uh, you know if you have this kind of puzzle type you have a uh, this this um, this form of puzzle um, by having some aspects of it be have parameters um, that then you can do all this cool stuff on on the fly you can you can do your ramping and and, and all this stuff so I'm a big fan of procedural puzzles in in general. Um, but I'm also I, I also think that handcrafting your procedures is, is, is also good. like constraining the the bounds of the of the procedural generation um, and like you're 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 taking instead of this like oh it's this infinite number of puzzles it's it's tightly bounded within the this this kind of um, domain that you want um, and I think this is this is a good a good general case uh, lesson even if if the specifics of dear reader aren't um, uh, are the, the the kind of puzzles that we that we make aren't um, uh, universally relevant i think this idea of like uh, uh taking the best of both worlds here i think is um yeah something something i wanted to share um so yeah that's uh uh that that's my that's my my, my pitch on um uh, artisanal procedurality um and uh uh yeah uh, i'd love to love to take some questions and and uh, uh afterwards i'll i'll uh, uh be on be on the discord as well Thank you so much. That was awesome. It's great to see a game being represented in this talk that is like so different and unique, in like the <laughs> game that it is. Um, in fact, there was a question about you know for, for, like along those lines uh, in the chat uh, from Plush Lola. Uh, Plush Lola's had a lot of great questions over the last few days, um, and they're just wondering about the original concept for this idea. Where did where did you start? Uh, yeah, so I, so it, 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 uh, when I joined the project, it was a multiplayer game, uh, mm. and you you so yeah, it's funny. In the original conception, you you created the puzzle basically, like you would do the switching, like I would swap the words or whatever the different modes were, and then I would send it to another player, and they would. But it was like it's just immediately there were so many problems with this. The so you would get these random puzzles that were created by other people, and they would vary wildly in difficulty. Like it'd be like, oh, this was really fun, and then I'd get one that like Eric had, had designed, and it'd be impossible. And it's like, uh, and so then um, uh, we. Uh, yeah, gr gradually removed the the player to player element, and then that that's where we started doing this. Oh, like we if what if we designed them using like procedure? So like we kind of like we went through how we were designing them, and and then kind of just automated that, and 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 so that that's kind of how it got there. I, I bet when it was multiplayer, I bet people were really cheeky and were just like swapping words around the. Just yeah, really yeah. Exactly. All the things that we those those things that we discovered were because of you know the, yeah things that we had noticed in and yeah exactly yeah, yeah. It, 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 it totally didn't work but that was the the origin was this like finding words within words and and then and then kind of building from there. Cool, thank you. Um, so I also had a question. Um, yeah, please. And maybe you maybe you touched on this. I was doing other things uh, while you were talking and listening at the same time. Um, but I was wondering. I won't, I'm, I'm, I won't be. I'm not insulted. That's, that's fine. I know you're. I know you're busy. <laughs> Gonna run the stream. <laughs> I, of course. Uh, of course. I, uh, so I was wondering. So when you're, you know, swapping words around, were there situations, or did you encounter unexpected situations where you, uh, there were like grammatically correct ways of construct, like moving the words around yes. and swapping them, and they would be grammatically correct. And maybe even I could have, I was thinking like the situation where somebody says, uh, the door and the window or something, and like you could easily write the same thing, the window and the door, and it would mean the same thing. Did you come across those kinds of situations? How yes, did you deal with yes. It? Um, and we so there are, yeah, a lot, and, and again, this depends on the kind of the mode, like some of the, the ones that are spelling related, like mm -hmm. where we're removing letters have like a totally different kind of set of of things um but yeah exactly what you you describe uh, and we we would early on get uh and, and occasionally still get like a, a player will kind of report a bug and say like oh like this should be how the sentence is um and we just feel like well sorry like <laughs> That's not how Jane Austen wrote. It. So like, <laughs> like, that's like, a, like, you know, like that's that's not. Um, and that I think I think we we onboard players enough to that that like it's that it, the solution is always the actual text. Yeah, it gets you to this point where yeah, you the the how the it's it is sort of like maddening when you read the scrambled text and it 
is grammatical and you're like oh, all right well then like what how is she, you know like what's what's she up to here like how would what would, would the words are got to be in a different order or something mm -hmm. like that and, and that's part of the fun it's like you're, you're playing with language and in, in, in that way absolutely did you consider like it's making me actually think of um like in return of the obra din you have to insert words as your answers and mm. there are some situations in that game where it'll allow multiple uh answers and will accept any of them i guess in your case it's different though because you have like a source material that yeah so we, we and we avoid we try there's a lot of rules to avoid like things where there could be a multiple so like the when we do things switching or, or whatever the words that we're removing yeah. will avoid uh, where there could be a real ambiguity okay. about that as, as a result awesome um, thank you uh we probably should wrap up. I'll, I'll ask this one last question. Okay, so follow-up question from Plush Lola. Do you know about, because um, you said you joined the project and it was a multiplayer game. Do you know the origins for the original? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and the talk that I mentioned, so so 100 versions of Lost Words um, mm -hmm. goes over the, the original version was, it was originally going to be a Twitter game uh, that was like, you would, you would tweet and, and take out the letter, but it was this idea of like, oh, within the word, you know, within the word, designing is the word sign you know mm -hmm. like and and take and like that that mechanic and it was like how do we and then the 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 impetus from there was making a new mechanic like the idea was uh that the um uh, eric colleen and john really wanted to make like a a new kind of puzzle like and and so that's why there was this really long um kind of kind of play testing uh stage so when i had joined that the, it had been kickstarted um and had uh this yeah this whole multiplayer uh, sort of mechanic and then it was another two years of of, of play testing right that to get to smooth off the, the the edges there um and uh yeah even even i mean the uh the, getting uh, so many of the mechanics, like how it scores and, and things like that, um, uh, right, were really, really difficult. A colleague, um, I, I still remember her, I'll, I'll never forget the playtesting feedback that was like, you are wandering in the desert, you found a local maximum, um, and but it's not good, and this game will never be good. <laughs> it's like, and I urge wow. you, I urge you to abandon this <laughs> entire project. Um, and it was like, because it, 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 it was just not fun. Like, it was like, uh, uh, and then, um, um, uh, but then, like I don't know, like a couple months after that, we finally, we finally get made it fun. You, you uh, it out. So, yeah, yeah. They were, but, they but, were wrong ultimately. <laughs> well, well, I think I think it was good advice, but um, uh, uh, we lucked. I think we lucked into um, uh, a fun, like, but but it goes to show how how much those little those parameters that I'm talking about, that kind of tuning, can really mean the difference between like er, like this game is just no like people would they play it for five minutes and be like okay cool thanks versus um you know they play it and wouldn't give the phone back like they would just keep playing it it was a difference of such fine degrees um that it, it's really incredible that's fascinating all right thank you so much uh, yeah thanks so, uh, thanks so much for having me yeah absolutely um any other questions please take them to the discord thinkinggames.com slash discord um i'm sure alexander will be in the discord and we'll be able to answer those questions um all right we are going to take a break now we've got 20 minutes uh so see everybody in 20 minutes for the next talk and once again thank you alexander all right
All righty, folks. Welcome back to ThinkyCon. It's the final part of ThinkyCon. I can't believe it. Three days. It's the third part of the third day. And we're here for our final three talks. Wow, there's a lot of threes there. <laughs> I didn't even <laughs> realize. Um, and it is a great set of three talks to send us out. So that's amazing. And to begin, uh, we are joined by uh, Clara Fernandez Vara here uh, to talk about crossword construction, uh, which is very exciting. Um, as always, if anybody has any questions, please do leave them in the chats, the YouTube live chats, uh, and uh, make sure to tag Thinking Games so that I see them, uh, and we'll try and get around to some, asking some questions at the end. Alrighty, uh, over to you, Clara. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's very exciting. Um, hello, ThinkyCon. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I love Thinky Games. I love puzzles, and I'm going to tell you uh, all about my latest um, obsession uh, with crosswords. Um, uh, but before I start with my talk, uh, in case you don't know me, uh, I'm Clara Fernandez Vara. I'm uh, I, I'm associate arts professor at the NYU Game Center. Um, on the one hand, I'm an academic. That was my my. Tr Training. I wrote a very popular textbook in the field of game studies, Introduction to Game Analysis. But I'm also a narrative designer um, and game writer. And uh, in at the beginning of my career in games, I wrote my dissertation on adventure games. I have written about adventure games. I had made adventure games. I have uh, designed many puzzles and thinky games myself. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today relates to my practice, but it's something that I've been doing for the last year and a half um, because I got into crosswords. Well, it's not that I got into crosswords. I wanted to show this image because um, every summer uh, when I go back to Spain, where I'm originally from, uh, I go to the beach and my favorite thing to do, apart from being there with, with my family, is to get a book of crosswords, sit on the beach and just solve crosswords. That is my happy place. And I've been doing that for many years. And I've been solving crosswords in Spanish for many years. Um, and uh, I can also solve crosswords in English. But one of the things that I came to realize is that, you know, I was having trouble uh, figuring out the, for example, the New York Times crossword, uh, which I'm going to talk about quite a bit today, uh, because it's its own kind of uh, beast, so to speak. Um, and th the thing is that being able to solve word puzzles in two languages, not only crosswords, um, but I love word puzzles in Spanish and in English, and I can solve both. But crosswords uh, were one of those things that uh, in English was still a, a bit tricky. So I set out, you know, a bit over a year and a half ago to uh, get to doing the New York Times crossword every day and getting better and better at it and learning its conventions. Uh, because really, one of the things that um, I want to get across today is that crosswords is not only about knowing words, it's also the cultural references, is what makes them a very special type of thinky, um, thinky game, so to speak. Um, so, so what I want to talk about today is things that I've learned not only by solving puzzles, but actually, uh, excuse me, also uh, by uh, constructing them and building them and learning what the, the entrance to doing that uh, were. Because as many of you probably already know, um, we can love uh, thinking games, but there's a point where we also get into designing the thinking games and you know, designing a puzzle can be as much fun, if not more, than actually solving them. So this is kind of like an introduction to resources, to concepts that should help you understand how to construct your own puzzles. So um, you probably already know what a crossword puzzle is, right? Um, we have the grid uh, that has different squares. Um, and in each square, usually there's a letter, uh, the white squares. Um, some. Um, some grids might have syllables, for example. Um, they might have, you know, the black squares tells us where there's no uh, letter. Um, but, you know, there might be some crosswords that don't have black squares. They might be blank, as we're going to see. Um, so we have the grid, and then we have the clues. Uh, we have to give the solver the information to know what to put in the grid. 
those are the two basic things to create a crossword. And each one takes different tools and different skills. Um, they're different types of puzzles, so to speak. Uh, the, the pleasure of creating a crossword is to incremental, incrementally figure out the solutions. You know, We have uh, a word, and with the letters that we put in the grid, we already have letters that will uh, let us know what the actual uh, word would be in other uh, definition, right? So we get like more and more uh, information as we go. It gets a bit easier whenever we find a word, we have information for another uh, for another one. Uh, but it's also uh, incremental in the terms of the design that in designing the grid and designing the clues, we have different types of uh, strategies that will allow us to create a crossword. And again, this is very basic, so to speak. Maybe some of you are already designing crosswords, uh, but one of the goals of, of this talk is basically getting people interested who might not have done this before, uh, because one of the problems that we have in the crossword world is that we don't have enough women, we don't have uh, enough uh, people of color, for example, we don't have enough people with, with interesting lived experiences that can build crosswords, and because crosswords are also part of culture and sharing culture. So... This is like the basic of what a crossword is. Um, and then there's many different types of crosswords. Um, again, one of the things that I've learned by being someone who can solve crosswords in Spanish and in English is that the types of crosswords that I was solving in Spanish are different from the conventions of the crosswords that one solves, for example, in the UK or that one might solve in uh, the United States, right? And probably those of you who speak other languages and can solve cr uh, crosswords in other languages might know that there's a whole uh, variety of crosswords that we can tackle. Um, I'm going to explain these from the um, easier type of crosswords to the most difficult ones. Uh, to begin with, I wanted to, and by the way, um, Wikipedia has a different kind of breakdown and classification. Um, I'm kind of like going through milestones, but but there are other ways to to kind of classify crosswords. This is not quite a classification. This is more like a an examination of different types. Uh, the first one is arrow word, which is also called Scandinavian crossword because supposedly the, the original um, uh, format was born in, in Scandinavia. Um, in Spain, we call them autodefinidos. Um, in France, they're called mot fléchette. Um, I'm sure that there's other names in other languages. Uh, and this is a grid where we have the definitions. They're very, very short. The clues are one word, two, three words, not a lot because they're in the grid itself. If you can see it here, you know, like you can see how um, that's where the, the, the clue is. And then there's an arrow, hence the name, that tells you which direction you have to write the word. Um, this is extremely popular in, in Europe. This is like the casual type of crossword um, that I love solving at the beach, for example. So this is very accessible. This is very popular. Um, and, you know, like it's, it's, it's very fast as well. Um, then we have the kind of classic American newspaper crosswords. And this is the kind of uh, crossword that I've been learning a lot about in the last couple of years. Um, the origins of crosswords, of modern crosswords, as we understand it, uh, come from a uh, puzzle that Arthur Wine uh, wrote for the New York World in December 21st, 1903. That's uh, supposed to be the first uh, crossword as we understand it. We've had uh, word squares, for example, for centuries, you know, like that's that was not new. But the grid with the numbers and the clues was something that was invented at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, this convention, you know, like this format, uh, it, and specifically in, in American crosswords, we see how words have to have at least three letters, something that, for example, is not true of, you know, the arrow word. And we're going to see other formats where it's okay to have columns that are um, surrounded by black squares. Um, and they're also symmetrical, uh, where you have a bar here, you have another bar on the other side, right? So like you see how this is uh, symmetrical, um, uh, rotational symmetry, right? And there's something that we can do with, with tools as we're going to see. Um, one of the things that uh, took me uh, a while to figure out how they work is this idea of the theme. Um, because uh, some of the uh, kind of uh, 
American classic puzzles have a theme uh, that uh, unites several of the clues. Um, there might be one clue that is called the revealer. The revealer is the key that tells you what the theme might be. Um, and then we have the clues that might be related to each other. They're usually marked in the clues with an asterisk, for example, or with italic words, um, italic form. And um, these are, for example, this is a, a, one of my favorite themes because on the one hand, this is not a symmetrical grid. Um, we have a grid that has the, the shape of a spiral. Uh, I love movies. And when I went to solve this and the, I saw the clue uh, where the, uh, the, the answer was dolly zoom, I was like, oh, this is vertigo. And there it was, you know, this was imitating the poster of vertigo. So I was really excited about this. I really, really like this. Um, but this is a, a crossword where the theme also is reflected in the shape, uh, less, uh, Thursday, uh, the New York Times had one where the theme was a cocktail and the um, crossword had the shape of a, a cocktail in the middle. Um, so, so this is kind of like what a theme means. It's, it's a bit tricky to figure out, you know, what how themes work until you've done quite a bit of these crosswords. Um, and um, these uh, crosswords, American crosswords, they appear in newspapers one each day. And as you go, the crosswords get harder and harder. So um, uh, the, the way that they can get harder, for example, is that the clues can get shorter, more ambiguous. They can be more than one thing. They can have more punning. They can have a bit of like cryptic clues, as we're going to see in a minute. Um, and that's kind of like the model that that newspaper crossword puzzles follow in the US. Uh, but the 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 thing that is also very um, key of this kind of uh, crossword is that they're trying to appeal to a wide audience and the kinds of clues and the kinds of references that the words are referring to can um, have like references to current TV shows, sports. I hate when it's sports, like sports always lose me. Um, or, uh, you know, uh, ads, you know, commercials, you know, advertisements, um, you know, like all of those can be clues because they're trying to cast a white net and attract as many people from like as many different backgrounds as possible. Um, but the truth is, is that a lot of these um, uh, crosswords, the uh, audience tends to be very homogeneous and very kind of like American middle class white, at least here. And it would be very interesting to have this format to be appealing to more people than that, you know, like all over the world. Um, then, you know, this is the American crossword. This is the the the, the British crossword. Um, I have not tackled many of these. They scared me. Probably some of you uh, watching or in the Discord are very adept at solving cryptic crosswords. I find them very scary. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the the kind of um, British. Um, uh, kind of typical crossword, or like, not typical, but like it's more white standard um, in that the crosswords have more of a lattice shape. So if you can see here, you know, we have uh, columns that alternate between black and white and black, uh, which we couldn't see in the in the previous grids, right? So they're more of a lattice. Uh, each clue has is not only a clue; it's a word puzzle, and it's the, the 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 information is encoded twice. I don't know how to explain it. Well, I'll give you an example in a second, uh, because on the one hand, we might have the definition of what it is, and how to read the clue, um, and there can be even more layers than that. There are some cryptic crosswords uh, that might also include clues um, that are the key to certain clues, or even every clue in the in the crossword. They're super elaborate. They're super uh, complicated. And again, you know, this is something that I find, you know, extra challenging. Again, I can solve um, crosswords in English, but the key is not just to know the language, is to know the conventions and the cultural references. So uh, in order to explain what cryptic crosswords are, uh, the best explanation that I found is actually by Stephen Sondheim, uh, the, the musical 
uh, composer and lyricist, uh, who was also a, a Thinky Games super fan and also uh, constructed his own uh, puzzles and published them in the New York Times as well. But he was a fan of cryptic uh, crosswords. And this is how I explain how the clues work in cryptic crosswords. Um, he said, uh, the problem for the solver is that the words in a clue may, if taken literally, mean something quite different from their apparent meaning. Here's a clue, for example, stairs at torn pages, five. Five is the number of letters in the convention of, of cryptic uh, crosswords. Uh, stairs at torn pages may suggest at first glance some obscure term in bibliophilia. But the phrase really mean, what the phrase really means is a word meaning stairs at whose letters are those of pages out of their normal order. So that's how we decode the clue. Uh, how do we get to that conclusion? In however veiled a way, that is literally what it says. Stares at is a synonym for gapes. That's the solution. Torn in this context means separated with violence so that the parts are out of their normal order. So there are two separate and distinct references to gapes. One a definition and one an elliptical description of the way the word is formed. Your problem is merely to punctuate the clue in an odd way. Stares at torn pages. So this is why cryptic crosswords are an extra layer of complication. And again, probably for those of you, you know, in, in, in the UK and Ireland and in other uh, countries where cryptic crosswords are, are uh, popular, you, you're used to this. But culturally for me, this is like a barrier that I haven't got yet, but I'm reading up on it. It's very interesting and I find it fascinating. Uh, very quickly, I also want to go through other layouts um, that we can use in grids in uh, crosswords. Uh, and these come from my collection of uh, books of crosswords in Spanish because I love these. So we can have crosswords, you know, like arrow, arrow words, for example, with syllables, but they can also be like regular crosswords where we can fit in a syllable instead of just a letter. Romance languages um, make it a lot easier to actually do this. Uh, we can have honeycomb um, layouts where if you can see here um, in this honeycomb um, uh, grid, uh, we have uh, the definitions are here, the clues are here, and the words are written in a line. But in this uh, other example, we have uh, a, a basic uh, honeycomb shape. There's the clue in the middle in the black cell, and then the, there's a little arrow that tells you how to write the clue in which direction where it starts and in which direction to write it. Um, these are like extremely satisfying and they're like, you know, it can be challenging, but but they're really, really fun. They're also easier to do in Romance language, for example. Um, and then there's white crosswords. I love these. Um, here you have the clues, you have the grid, no uh, black squares. And the only thing that you have to go is telling you how many black squares there's going to be. Um, and you have to figure out where they are. Uh, I find these like really fun, um, but it's, it's also like something that might be easier depending on what kind of clues one writes. Um, I, again, I find Spanish uh, is particularly conducive to have uh, grids like this and making them very accessible. And now, you know, the, the main thing that I want to kind of talk about is like how to construct the grid. Again, we like thinking games, uh, we like thinking in puzzles, um, if we think in puzzles, making them is also not so far away. So um, one could start building a crosswords with, for example, Scrabble tiles. If you have a Scrabble set, if you like thinking games, probably you already do. Um, you can actually start doing it manually. Uh, Scrabble tiles, the, the, the points uh, in each tile are also telling you how frequent or um, unfrequent, uh, unfrequent uh, a, a letter can be. So that can be very useful. Uh, and actually you can buy online whole bags of these tiles because they sell them for crafts. So if you like the analog way, you can do that. You can also use pen and paper. That's something that I've used you know, to uh, construct uh, crosswords in Spanish myself. Um, because that's kind of like the traditional way. But it turns out that we have a lot of grid construction tools that can make your lives so much easier. And this was for me the real epiphany, like, oh, I can use these tools. Um, and basically these tools um, help you 
uh, as a constructor, a setter, as, as they call them in the UK, um, you know, to create your crosswords very easily because they facilitate their formatting. You can have your grid and your clues um, appearing in a template in a very neat and clear way. So it's very easy to just write it out and print it out and give it away. Um, um, there are tools that help you put in black squares if you need symmetry to make a uh, uh, a crossword, they can, uh, the tools can help you just place the uh, uh, black squares in a symmetrical way. Um, you can also uh, write the clues and it will uh, match the number in the grid. It, you can number the clues. It does it all, all for you. It's really great. Um, but the main thing that you need the tools for is that it really gives you different options uh, of words and how they might fit a pattern. Uh, these tools have a dictionary. Uh, the dictionary can tell you, for example, how frequent or infrequent uh, a word is by displaying a word score, as we're going to see. Um, but um, because they have a database, it can already tell you which words might actually fit a specific pattern. And you already have, you know, some other letters in place. And that is amazingly helpful. Um, and also tools make it very easy to share your uh, your crosswords. But the main thing that you want them for is having a dictionary, having tools that can uh, uh, help you uh, visualize and uh, kind of predict what kind of words we can put in. So very quickly, I've prepared a handout uh, with a lot of these uh, links. So uh, at the end of the talk, I'm going to put it in the, in the Discord and share it. So you don't have to uh, start taking notes, you know, relax. Uh, the first tool that I used was Crosserville, which is online and is free. Um, and it has a decent dictionary and it helps you basically come up with a grid at the size um, and like write your, your um, clues. And as I said, you know, anticipate what is going to happen. It's very good if you want to just like dabble and see how far you get. You know, this is, this was my hook. This was the point where like, oh, I really want to do more of this. Um, some of you might be familiar with Puzzle Me, probably because you're in the Thinky Games community, where you can create your puzzles and uh, put them online. It also has a pretty decent uh, crossword maker that you can uh, export, for example, to your blog and put in your puzzles. Um, Crossfire is the tool that I'm using now because you can customize your dictionaries and, and it's pretty powerful in, in making you come up with your own list of words and, and customizing them. Uh, it's available for Windows and Mac, but it's a paid app. It's not free. Um, same with crossword compiling compiler. I didn't use this tool. I'm, I'm a Mac person, um, but uh, this was in, in for Windows only. But again, these are professional grade tools. This is what uh, professional puzzle constructors actually use. Um, again, I have a list of these that I'm going to to post in the Discord uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but again, like the, the the trick, and this was the 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 big, you know, trick of how to build crosswords in English. But I'm sure that in other languages is very similar. Is that dictionaries are really the main resource that you uh, want. You want to have a large database of words that you can use that the tools can help you navigate and, and select uh, words that can fit the words that you are already in your crossword. Um, you know, like, for example, if you ha have a, uh, a, a pattern that is like a letter U, uh, Z, Z, and two other letters, like you can put that in and it will tell you different uh, options that you could fit in a specific part of your crossword. Um, you know, there's databases online that can tell you how many times a word has appeared in a newspaper, for example. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge database of like the New York Times and the LA Times, for example, and how it's been clued, um, which is going to be important in a second as we're going to see. Um, they can also tell you the score of a word, how common or uncommon is, uh, because you want to find words that are accessible. They're not like too obscure, um, but they're, you know, you, you want to find words that people can guess. Uh, although it's also fun to have uh, words that might not have appeared, but that are becoming part of the popular vocabulary. So for example, techno bro, I was checking, has not appeared in uh, the New York Times yet, but Hate Watch uh, was actually uh, has appeared uh, three times by now in the in the um, 
in the New York Times uh, crosswords. And all of these is in a database. So it's an amazing resource to know what's been done before, how a certain word might have been clued. Can you come up with a new word of cluing something? Um, Again, this is a list of different uh, databases where you can look up uh, words and clues and patterns. Uh, some of them, you know, the ones that have premium access, uh, they basically sell uh, the database of, uh, of words, for example. But you can actually get by uh, and make your own crosswords with things that are free and online already. So, you know, again, I'm going to share these in a second. Um, and also, if you're a programmer, um, if you have a database, you can also uh, write scripts to look for things in that uh, database. For example, you know, words containing uh, certain letters or like, can you find palindromes? Um, I recommend Python. If anybody's learned Python here, the first thing that uh, most Python courses out there will teach you is how to parse texts and, and databases. So you only need an introduction to Python to actually create one of these uh, scripts. So, you know, like it would be like a good thing to look into. Um, all of this is provides it with really powerful uh, tools to create your own uh, crossword puzzles for others. And then there's the art of writing the clues. This is the part where I have fun because as a game writer, somebody who's written the the te text for many adventure games and a lot of what I did was cluing puzzles through part of the story and part of the, the, the world and part of the descriptions. You know, this is the part that relates to something that I've done many, 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 many times for many years. So um, this was the part that I have become like fascinated by, like how is this different? What is the art of writing the clues? Uh, because, you know, in general, you have to keep them short. You have to keep them snappy uh, at times because there might be not a lot of room to actually print out your uh, your clues. Um, you have to let the 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 solver uh, know what they have to find. What is the word that they have to put in? Anyway, many of them they're riddles. In the case of cryptic, cryptic crosswords, they're like really elaborate riddles. Um, but there's also some clues that require you to know specific information. You know, like geographic names. That's something that Spanish crosswords love too much and they give really obscure references to, to uh, geography that I never know. Uh, sports teams. Um, I don't follow American sports on this. So whenever there's a sports team reference, I'm just like actually looking things up, like actually looking and Googling things because I don't know any other teams or very few teams, um, you know, slogans and things like those. Um, so this kind of encyclopedic knowledge depends on somebody's education, the background, you know, like what is it that they know? What is the groups that they hang out with? What are the things that they might know? You know, there might be people who like, like sports and the sports clues that stop me might be so easy for them, right? Um, but, you know, they're also kind of like refer to trivia that is also very ephemeral and can date very fast. So how, how long do you want your uh, crossword puzzle to be solved, right? Like to be available. Uh, but this is one of the keys here that, you know, depending on what you're making references to, you can attract different audiences. You're appealing to the knowledge of, of different people, right? So, so this is where like knowing what is in the grid and how you're appealing to it. And maybe there's a, um, you know, like the same name and you might uh, refer to a sports person or to a literary author. And that is appealing to different types of audiences and different types of knowledge and different types of backgrounds. And this is where uh, crosswords cross words can become kind of elite, for example. So, um, you know, when we write the clues, you know, there are times where like when we're building the grid, we might end up using what we call crossword Ds. You know, like there are words that we don't use in everyday life, but that appear in uh, crosswords a lot. Oreo appears almost every day in American crosswords and is so difficult to clue it in original ways because it's being done to death. Uh, the Swiss River R also appears a lot, appears a lot in Spanish crosswords, for example. Um, it obscured geographical reference, but it fits grids very well. Same with Epe, with the saber that one uses in the Olympics, right? All of these, if you do a lot of crosswords, you know them. They, not the case of Oreo, but like R, for example, is obscure. But if you do a bunch of crosswords, you know this, right? It comes up. Um, the fun thing is writing a, a, a clue that obscures crossword Ds and, and makes it fun when you realize, oh, it's Oreo again, right? 
Um, this also knowing the different conventions of each publisher. Um, the New York Times, for example, um, they kind of have a clue that has uh, where the, the word uh, or part of the, the word uh, of, of the uh, uh, solution appears in the clue, uh, whereas in Autonefinidos, the, the arrow words in Spanish, um, they will expect you to actually conjugate a verb and have the same word just with a different form. Um, American crosswords can also include short phrases, you know, like, let me go, whereas in Spanish, for example, we only have words. It's very, very weird that you would have an actual phrase, you know, several words. Um, and as we've seen, you know, cryptic crosswords have their own world of writing the clues. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up, you know, I only have a couple more slides. Then you can share your crossword. Um, you can print it out as a PDF if you use the tools. Um, in blank with the clues is very neat, it's really great. You can post it on your website if you use something like Puzzle Me. Uh, you can also export it to Across Light, uh, which is an app uh, that works in Windows and Mac, uh, but it can also be run in iPad. Uh, and it's a file that you can open. It's like a document file that you can open and solve uh, any crossword as if it was, you know, like a, a crossword for the New York Times, the LA Times, or one of those. And you can share the file. It's a standard uh, crossword format. And you can also connect with other crosswords uh, fans uh, in the crosscord. Uh, they're mostly North American, but you know it is a place where you can find people who are fans, you know, people who are constructors, people who are willing to mentor you uh, and you know test your your um, your puzzles. So I have here a bunch of other reading that I can recommend from articles that deal with. Uh, solving other puzzles, you know, like how to construct uh, puzzles, but also the history of puzzles, um, the history of, of uh, crypt, uh, cryptic uh, uh, crosswords, the history of, of uh, uh, crosswords themselves, and also the last title, The Riddles of the Sphinx, is a feminist history of, of crossword uh, constructors, which is very interesting. But again, I'm going to share this in a minute. Uh, and that's all I have to say for today. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is my, my fun thinky game obsession. Uh, and I hope that this has inspired you first to maybe solve crosswords, but also to um, maybe start building your own. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. That was wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, it was great to see so many different examples of crosswords and all the different tools that are available. Uh, it's like, it's that kind of stuff that unless you're in it, it's hard to know about all that stuff. And yeah, exactly. So you sharing it is amazing and hopefully will inspire people to make some. I think sadly we don't have time for questions right now. Um, there were a couple in the chat. So uh, those who had questions or if people have extra questions, um, please do take them to the Discord, thinkygames.com slash Discord. Mm -hmm. You'll find a thread for this talk in the Talks channel uh, where you can ask the questions and I think Clara will be there to answer them. Yep. I'm yep. going to be there right now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, folks, we will now set up for the next talk uh, and see you very soon. Thank you, Clara. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, time for the next talk, which is coming from Alex Dina, one of my favorite people on YouTube. In fact, during, <laughs> during the breaks, I might have been watching some of his videos. Uh, <laughs> and also, the topic of this talk is very relevant to me as well. Um, it's all about how to make your thinky games uh, kind of better for recording and putting on YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, all right, so if anybody has any questions throughout the talk, as usual, please leave them in the chat uh, and tag Thinky Games so that it helps me see them. Um, and if we have time at the end, which we should do, I think, um, we should be able to ask a couple of them. Um, all right, that's pretty much it. So over to you, Alex. All right. Hi, my name is Alex Diener. You might also know me as Them's All Took. I'm in the unique position of being equal parts Let's Player and game developer. And in this talk, I'd like to share some insights that doing both of these things has given me over the years. On screen is a link to my YouTube channel, my personal website, a place where you can play my games, and my contact info. This will all be at the end of the talk, too. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define a Let's Play as pre-recorded gameplay video with commentary. These videos are usually split into multiple episodes for the game being played. Live streams are a similar concept, and a lot of the points in this talk will also apply to them, but my primary knowledge is of material recorded ahead of time and uploaded to YouTube. Why should you care about Let's Plays? From a developer's perspective, video can be invaluable for learning how your game is perceived. You can see what catches a player's attention, where they get stuck, and hear their thought process if they're good enough at sharing it, and Let's Players usually are and often spot things that might not be visible in your own playtesting. A Let's Player brings their own audience, potentially putting your game in front of people who haven't seen it. These days, it's common for a viewer to get most of their game recommendations from Let's Plays. If you make a good impression, you might make some extra sales. Let's Plays offer an opportunity to interact with your player base. I've often seen the developer of the game I'm playing show up in my comment section and have productive conversations with other audience members. Puzzle games are sometimes a tricky genre for Let's Players. It takes extra effort to entertain an audience while solving logic problems. The very act of speaking requires a surprising amount of mental effort, which can make it more difficult to work out a puzzle. However, the reverse can also be true. Talking through a problem can often help solve a puzzle by making it easier to spot missed observations or logic errors. If the puzzle is readable enough, the audience has the opportunity to work out the solution ahead of the player. This makes puzzle games especially sensitive to spoilers, so players who want to apply their own solving process to everything may have to be cautious about interacting with their audience. On the other hand, for the right player and the right audience, this could lead to a fun collaborative solving project where they put their heads together and work out something really tricky. It just depends on the game and the individual situation. Let's Plays have different environmental dynamics than solo play sessions. Let's players have to be care uh, uh, have extra concerns and time constraints to think about. Some games lend themselves better to let's playing than others. Let's plays exist for almost every imaginable game, so if someone really wants to make a video about their game, they'll find a way. But as a developer, there's a lot you can do to help with the process. Many of the suggestions in this talk can be seen as not only assisting let's players, but also improving your game for a general audience. So even if you're not specifically optimizing for video, consider doing these things anyway. So with the introduction and setup out of the way, let's get into some specifics, starting with communication. If you were to take just one idea from this talk, I want it to be this one. Let the player see their mouse cursor during gameplay. The cursor is an indispensable tool for talking through ideas, counting out spaces, calling attention to particular spots, and so on. It makes sense to hide the cursor when keyboard or gamepad input is made. But if I'm moving my mouse on purpose, it means I want to see my pointer. A custom cursor themed appropriately for your game is often nice, but just letting the system cursor remain visible is sufficient. Going beyond mouse cursors, a video watching audience wants to understand what inputs are being made by the player. For puzzle games in particular, it's sometimes hard for a viewer to tell the difference between making a move and undoing a move. I'd suggest having different animations for these two things, and ideally a unique sound effect that goes along with undoing. Now something more for the player's benefit. It's important when recording to know exactly when progress is saved. Expect your game to be played in multiple short sessions. The player needs to know when it's safe to stop and quit without losing anything they've done. 
Later in a playthrough, if your game has any kind of secrets, a Let's Player will want to know when they have more to find or if they're done. Let's Plays usually aim to see most of the content available in each game, and spending time trying to find something that might not exist doesn't make great video. Investigating mysteries is good to a point, but an investigation that leads nowhere might get edited out of a video entirely. There's a balance here. Just try to be aware of how long dead-end paths might be and whether conclusive answers can be found at the end of them. For video length and episode boundary reasons, a Let's Player will want to know if they're starting a section of the game that will take a significant amount of time. This isn't always predictable, but little things like difficulty ratings can help with the decision of whether to continue playing near the end of a recording session or to leave off and continue at, uh, for the start of the next episode. Some more minor points. During a Let's Play, the game activity is going to be discussed out loud, so it may be necessary to refer to game elements by name. If the game doesn't provide names for the things in it, the Let's Player will likely make up their own terminology. Providing the player with a vocabulary to describe your game makes communication much easier. If a game has identifiable characters, when a Let's Player wants to say something about them, they might trip over pronouns if the game doesn't specify genders. Showing them how to refer to each character makes it easier to talk about them. Similarly, if your game has dialogue but no voice acting, some Let's Players may want to read out loud and potentially give each character a unique voice. To do this, they need to know which character is talking at all times. I'd suggest a nameplate and maybe a small character portrait for text boxes, especially if the speaker is off screen. This also helps for generally following what's going on, not just for doing funny voices. A few more points about character dialogue. If a piece of text is not voice acted, it's important to allow the player to read it at their own pace. Some Let's Players like to read everything out loud, some prefer not to, sometimes it varies case by case. The commentator might also want to take a moment to speculate about the text. Text that advances automatically is very disruptive to this process and should be avoided if possible. Auto advancing can also be a problem if it happens too slowly. It's common for text to appear letter by letter, and if you're doing this, make sure it happens quickly enough that it keeps up with the player's natural reading speed. Even better if they can press a button to immediately make it finish appearing. A related hazard is accidentally skipping an entire text box before getting the chance to read it. For example, I've seen platform games where text can appear in the middle of the action and the jump button dismisses it, which causes frequent accidental text skips. Being able to scroll back through already seen text is great for accessibility, both in cases of accidental skipping and for reviewing things previously read. Let's move on to more general readability concerns. The output of a recording session is a fixed size video file. A Let's Player will usually want to fill a 1920 by 1080 video frame, so it's ideal if your game can fit exactly within this size. There are other common resolutions and aspect ratios, but there are reasons to use specific ones. When a video is uploaded to YouTube, it needs to meet size and format requirements in order to be presented at the highest quality. A video at something other than one of the YouTube approved sizes may get downscaled to 480p at 30 frames per second. So Let's Players usually try to avoid this, even if it means rescaling the game footage. If your game runs at an unconventional size, be aware that it's not likely to be presented at that size when on video. Since video data is very large, it's necessary to apply lossy compression algorithms to it, usually H.264 or something similar. Because of this, the footage you see will have been run through a filter of sorts, and certain details might not survive the transition. Anything particularly small or low contrast is at risk. Visually noisy scenes can also be a problem. Random static is the most data-intensive thing to encode, and some patterns that show up in games look a lot like random static. Aggressive rain effects are a common one, and certain types of visual filters might not look as good on video as they do in game. Generally speaking, video quality is proportional to how much of the screen is moving at a time, and too much motion can turn the whole thing into a blurry mess. Beyond the technical aspects, there are also layout considerations. Some players will include a video of their face over top of the game screen, often in the lower left or lower right corner. If it's compatible with your game's layout, consider having a safe corner where relatively few gameplay details would be covered up by this. Also, the very bottom of the screen is a bad place for text or other things that need to be clearly seen because playback controls may cover that part of the video. Playback controls usually disappear while the video is playing, but when paused, it might be impossible to see something if it's too far down. 
Going back to video compression, there's something I want to show in detail. Certain color combinations can be problematic for compressed video. On the left is an uncompressed test image. On the right is that same image run through the video encoder I personally use. This example is scaled up to double size after compression. Notice how pure red or blue text on a black background becomes much less legible, as does green text on a white background. I only have a rudimentary understanding of why this happens, but from what I know, H.264 encodes color information at half the resolution that it uses for luminance data. So anything that doesn't have a strong brightness contrast might turn out really muddy in the resulting video. I'm showing this example specifically because small red text is somewhat common, and orange is a reasonably safe alternative. This might get better in the future as video codecs improve, but since H.264 is still in widespread use, I think it's a good idea to be aware of this. Hopefully this is visible, since there's also a video encoding step between where I am and how you're seeing this talk. Either way, I'd suggest making a video recording of your own game and paying attention to small details and text to make sure they come through clearly. Moving on to more technical matters. OBS, which stands for Open Broadcaster Software, is a free screen recording program that, as far as I know, the vast majority of Let's Players use for recording. It's pretty user-friendly and freely available, so I'd recommend trying it out on your own computer to see how your game behaves when it's captured by OBS. Common game engines will be pretty well behaved, but if you're doing something more unusual, it might take extra effort to get it to play nice with video capture. Ideally, you'll want to render your entire game to a single fixed-size hardware-accelerated graphics context, whether that's OpenGL, DirectX, Vulkan, Metal, or some equivalent. Changing resolution or video size can be a problem for recording. Players expect everything to stay in the same place for the whole play session once recording starts. Personally, I strongly prefer to play in full screen mode, but I know other Let's players who strongly prefer to play in a window, so offering both options is ideal. If I'm playing in a window, I don't want to have to mess with its position or size every time I launch the game, so ideally it should remember how I configured it and start the same way next time. As a side note, this, game's ma this, this makes games that are exclusive to a web browser especially challenging to record because my browser window isn't always at the same size, position, or zoom level. Offering a downloadable version of a web browser game makes it much more accessible for video recording. Another small point. If you're using pixel art, an option to force integer multiple scaling can help your game look better on video. I'd also recommend choosing a base canvas size that cleanly scales to 1920 by 1080. For example, 640 by 360 scales perfectly to 720p, 1080p, and 1440p sizes. Now, let's get even more technical. This slide is for the graphics programmers here. If your game doesn't use a low-level graphics API directly, you might not need to concern yourself with these things, but if you are, be aware that OBS tends to capture one frame behind what you see on your screen. If you hold on a still frame for some time without doing a buffer swap, what gets shown on video might actually be the previous frame that was rendered. For an example of why this matters, when I did a Let's Play of Legend of Grimrock 2, there was a hotkey I used to load my last save, which instantly switched from the game screen to a loading screen. And then it took some time before loading completed and the next frame was drawn. What this meant was that although I would always see the loading screen on my own monitor, half the time the video would instead be showing a freeze frame of the gameplay just before the loading screen appeared. Speaking of buffer swaps, when OBS is initially hooking onto the graphics context, it has trouble making the connection if no continuous buffer swaps are happening. This can be a problem if, for example, the game's main menu is a static screen with nothing moving. A Let's Player will want to make sure the capture software is connected before they start talking, and this is usually done at program start time. Again, I'd recommend trying your game with OBS to see how it behaves. One more little thing I want to mention. I ran into an issue specific to Windows OpenGL where my game would crash on exit if OBS had ever been hooked onto it. As it turns out, the graphics context needed to be explicitly deleted at the end of execution. I used an at exit handler to call WGL delete context and the crash stopped happening. This was years ago, and I figured it might have been a bug in OBS that had since been fixed. But I tried disabling my ad exit handler just the other day, and the crash actually still happens. Explicitly freeing resources on program exit is usually a waste of time since the operating system reclaims them more efficiently than anything your code can do. But WGL contexts that have been hooked by OBS are a specific exception to that. Moving on to other matters, let's talk about audio. Since the player is going to be talking while playing, 
You should expect your game audio to be much quieter in the final mix than the player's voice. They need to make room to be heard without getting drowned out by the game. One possible exception to this is voice acting. It may be desirable for voice audio to be somewhere around the volume of the commentator's own voice. Something I've seen a lot is when a, the game's own audio mixing makes voices too quiet by default. For example, when I'm playing Drod, I have to turn the music and sound effects way down and set voice audio volume at maximum in order to hear speech clearly. If sudden interjections can happen during the game, expect that the player might be in mid-sentence when this happens. Sudden voice clips or sound effects are likely to be talked over. Some kind of noticeable signal before this happens, like an empty text box coming up and waiting for a brief moment, can help avoid the game and the player talking over each other. Make sure your soundscape is evenly balanced. Ideally, the player should be able to calibrate their audio settings before starting gameplay and not later encounter much louder or quieter sounds that make it necessary to readjust in the middle of the game. Usually it's not a problem, but a few games I've played have been so chatty that I've had trouble getting a word in edgewise. If your game has a lot of voice clips, just be aware that this can get in the way of a commentator's ability to share their own thoughts. Sometimes it's necessary for the player to talk over top of the game's voice acting, but it's never ideal when it has to happen. On another topic, in the modern age, a hazard of putting videos on the internet is the threat of copyright holders imposing restrictions based on something heard in the middle of the video. If you have any non-original music in your game that might run afoul of copyright claims, I'd recommend giving the player a clear warning about this and providing an option to disable copyrighted music during gameplay. Thumbnails. Every video on YouTube comes with a thumbnail image. This is the public face of the video and will be seen by a far more people than the number who click through and watch the video. The uploader usually has full control of what their thumbnails look like, though new YouTube accounts are sometimes restricted to automatically generated choices. For game video thumbnails, you might see a fully custom image or an unaltered video frame in the episode or anything in between. Personally, I prefer to use unaltered video frames for my own thumbnails. For puzzle games, it's sometimes hard to choose one that doesn't reveal too much. Occasionally, I've found it necessary to blur out details that I feel shouldn't be made too visible, especially to someone who hasn't played the game yet. There's some tension between showing too much and too little. I look for something that evokes curiosity about what happens in the episode. Visually striking things are often the most revealing, which can make this a difficult process. However, puzzle games sometimes have the opposite problem. Important things are in the small details, and in some cases, every thumbnail for a video series ends up looking about the same. I enjoy it when different sections of a game have distinct color palettes or other large details that show up clearly on a thumbnail, showing progression over the course of the video series. Pacing. Depending on the player, an episode of a Let's Play might average 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or some other length. Those are the most common target times I see. A let's player who wants their play sessions to uh, a let's player wants their play sessions to divide cleanly into chunks of their preferred length. Repetitive tasks like traversing the same terrain multiple times don't often make good footage, and the let's player might opt to edit the video to skip ahead to when they reach their destination. The tedium of repetitive tasks is amplified because on top of the time spent in game, it's extra work editing the video afterward. Keeping downtime to a minimum makes the player's experience more pleasant and allows videos to be edited more lightly, thereby more accurately representing your game's overall experience. Any kind of setback or punishment is felt more harshly while recording or streaming because there's external time pressure on top of what's happening in-game. Players like to be able to finish what they've started in the same episode if possible, and when punished with a setback, this can mean significantly more recording time than what goes into the final video. Speaking about puzzle games in particular, it feels bad to end an episode in the middle of solving a puzzle. I've played plenty of puzzle games that require longer so solving sessions than I can comfortably fit into a normal episode, and sometimes it's worth it, but my preference is always to be able to stop after around half an hour of play with the knowledge that I've made appreciable progress. Missable things. Sometimes things go wrong that make it necessary to throw away an entire video and start over. When this happens, the best that can be made of a bad situation is to restore the game to how things were at the beginning of the recording session and redo it. Ideally, this would return all progress to an earlier state, including meta progression like unlocks and achievements. Being able to easily backup save data is a good start, better if it happens effortlessly or automatically. 
In games with multiple save slots, you'll often see Let's Players choosing to save to a different slot each session. If saves always ratchet forward and an earlier state can't be restored easily, it makes video recording feel a whole lot riskier. A different kind of missable is things that happen too quickly after program startup. Even on the most aggressive settings, OBS takes at least a few seconds to start capturing, so the very first thing your game shows might not be video capturable. Intro cinematics are a common offender. If you have one of these, I'd suggest providing a way to watch it again somewhere in your main menu. It's helpful to give the player a safe staging area where they can set up recording before anything important happens in the game. The player might have specific hotkeys they press to start, stop, or otherwise control their recording setup. Personally, I use numpad asterisk, minus, and zero for various recording controls, but I've heard of keys as common as the tab key being used for this. Ideally, it should be easy for the player to find hotkeys that can be freely used without side effects in the game. Playing a system beep counts as a side effect. Make sure pressing an unrecognized key doesn't do that. One more thing I'd like to advocate is to provide an optional, effortless way to unlock everything in your game. This doesn't have to be a compromise. Players who want your prescribed experience won't use this option, but players who have already completed the game will appreciate it in case their save file has gone missing or they're done playing the game and just want to see if they've missed anything extra. This is definitely not applicable to every game, but I'd encourage you to think about whether it can apply to yours. Staying in bounds. Sometimes a game's expected experience involves taking notes. If there are ways you can provide in-game note-taking facilities, Let's Players will make good use of them. For example, Legend of Grimrock allows the player to click any map tile and write arbitrary text on it, and then later refer back to those locations and see what was written. If a Let's Player has to resort to writing things on paper or in a separate text document, it takes extra effort to show those things on video. Similarly, if the player might want to take a screenshot and refer to it later, you can help them by providing a way to do this without leaving the game. For example, Quern Undying Thoughts has a diegetic way to do this by giving the player a notebook item and a hotkey to draw the sk a sketch in the notebook, which can be reviewed later, later at any time. If the Let's Player has to resort to saving image files outside the game, it takes extra effort to show those on video. This is rare, but once in a while, a game might do something unconventional by putting important information outside the normal play area, like the window title or menu bar. If the expectation is clearly set up front that the entire screen needs to be captured, this sort of thing might get recorded, but normally only the content area will be visible, and anything beyond it takes extra effort to show on video. Overlays like Steam achievements may or may not get captured, depending on the Let's Player's recording settings and personal preferences. If your game has achievements and earning them is an important part of the game, I'd recommend showing an in-game display in addition to letting Steam do it. This has several benefits. It's repeatable on replays, it ensures that the achievement is captured on video, and it makes the achievement feel more at home in your game. A Steam pop-up showing a second copy of the achievement isn't, uh, doesn't really get in the way of anything. One last thing, privacy. A Let's Player shows the world what they see, so it's worth thinking about whether you're showing them anything that shouldn't be seen by the world. There's obvious stuff like IP addresses, account names, and passwords, but times and dates can actually be sensitive information too. A personal example. Sometime last year, I made a change from recording everything the day before it was published to recording it significantly in advance, and at the time, I wasn't ready to disclose this to my audience. However, one of the games I was playing showed the current date when a save file was created, revealing this information before I was prepared to talk about it. I could have blurred it or cut it out of the video, but that would still call attention to it. Some games provide a streamer mode setting to prevent sensitive information from appearing on screen, and I would advocate for hiding times and dates when in this mode. Earlier, I mentioned that OBS provides the option to capture the player's entire screen. Since your game might be captured this way, Quitting abruptly, or exiting full screen mode, or messing with the window size or position risks revealing the player's desktop and whatever else, else they have open. This is a less serious issue for pre-recorded video than for streaming, but it can still introduce extra video editing work that needs to be done. That's it. That's all I had. Here's my contact information again. I hope you got something useful out of this talk. Remember, if you have just one takeaway, I want it to be to not hide the mouse cursor during gameplay so that I can point at the things I'm talking about. Thanks for listening. I'll kick it back over to Joe. Do we have any questions or are we moving on to the next talk? Thank you so much, Alex. And yes, please, mouse cursors, they are so useful.
or we both had the experience so many times of like, oh, I want to point to, oh, there's no mouse cursor. I can't <laughs> fix. Uh, there's since the next next talk's going to be pre recorded one, so there's time for a couple of questions, um, and a couple of questions did come through. Um, so um, this was in relation to. Uh, you know, when the game starts up and it has like some intro in cinematic or whatever. Um, they, uh, so this is from Imaginatory in the chat. Uh, speak of safe staging areas. What's your regular procedure for booting up a game you plan to record when you don't know whether it has one? Mm. So usually I will give a game a first boot before I even start recording. So like I'll know what sort of parameters I'm dealing with. Like I'll launch it, I'll make sure the video comes through, I'll see what kind of uh, what kind of intro is going on, and then I'll actually quit the game, start the recording, and then start the game again. And usually uh, I have like a, a specific point in a game that I look for to uh, to start talking and say, all right, I'm actually in the episode now. Like for Celeste, for example, there's this real nice splash screen. You see the, the game name in big text and I can press the A button to continue to the, the, the mode select. And just having something like that is a real good place to, uh, to hang out and uh, just make sure everything's good. Like for as long as I need to, if I can just sit on that screen, it's, it's very useful. Uh, I guess something for, for, to note from my experience as well is that often games will start with like a company's logo or something mm -hmm. and begin the studio's logo. And often that just won't, that's just not going to show up in people's videos yep. because that first bit of the game won't get captured. Exactly. Um, all right. So there was one other question from uh, Jagriff in the chat. Uh, would you consider time played to be sensitive information? Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> It could be, feels a lot less sensitive than time and date because I guess the only thing it feels like that could reveal is if the player has played the game a whole bunch before. Mm, I can imagine situations where it would be. Hmm. I don't know. I'd have to give that one more thought. Uh, it's not something I'd probably personally worry about. But I have seen Let's Plays where uh, somebody will see a time display and go, oh, ha, I guess I tabbed away from the game and left it running all night. So situations like that do sometimes come up. But in terms of whether it's a problem to reveal, I think it's more just like a fun little curiosity. But yeah, it's something to keep in mind. It, it could potentially be. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. Um... I think that is all of the questions we have had through in the chat. But if there are any more questions, uh, please take them to uh, Discord, thinkinggames.com slash Discord. There is a thread for this talk in the talks channel. I will be there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, thank you for doing the talk. I am going to go set up for the next one, uh, and we'll be back in a minute. Thank you once all right, again. Thanks for having me. See ya. Alrighty, folks, just me again to introduce the next talk, the final talk, the last one. It's going to be over soon, and we'll have to wait until next year for another one. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> uh, but for our final talk, we have a great one from uh, Jason Newman, 
uh, who is working on the game uh, Isles of Sea and Sky, uh, and it's a pre-recorded talk, as I mentioned before, um, and uh, it's it's a wonderful one about tutorialization and textless tutorialization in particular. Uh, so uh, I think I've set everything up. We'll see what happens. So uh see you well, obviously i guess just to mention obviously because uh it's a pre-recorded talk it's very early in the morning for jason right now um i don't know he potentially he's like gonna be in the chat or something but i assume not uh and if you have any questions you can take them to discord afterwards uh, but i'll repeat that again at the end uh already let's go to that talk in just a moment Hello, my name is Jason Newman. I am the creator of Isles of Sea and Sky, as well as a small game called Triga. My studio is Cicada Games. Um, today, today I'm talking about tutorialization without text, um, how I do it in my game, Isles of Sea and Sky. Uh, so say no to tutorial walls of text. So this is probably the classic example that people think of when talking about tutorials without text, tutorials through gameplay, the sort of idea of show, don't tell. Uh, so we can see uh, on the left, when you start out in Super Mario Bros., you can't go left. All you can do is go right. So the player is going to go right. They're not going to turn off the game. They're not going to give up. Uh, and once you go right, you see things like this, this question mark block. And uh, you see your first enemy. And if you don't jump over the enemy, you die and you have to restart. And if you jump and hit the block then the coins gonna come out and if you jump over the enemy maybe you'll hit that other uh, question mark block and the mushroom will come out and if the mushroom if you get the mushroom and it falls down and it goes back to the left which is a you know mechanic of the game this is how they work in the game so the player is going to learn um if they jump over the mushroom and miss it then they're going to learn once that thing goes off screen there then they've missed it but if they get it they're gonna um, grow big and that's a major mechanic of the game the player learns about right away and then you have to jump to proceed so you basically learn all this um, very essential uh, pieces of the game right away just through gameplay no text super simple no hand holding um, and yeah it's a very simple example because it's a very classic game but um i think it's very relevant still today what i'm trying to do is have respect for the player uh, respect their intelligence and so for instance i assume that they're gonna know to press buttons on a game pad or on a keyboard i'm gonna assume that the player knows the basics the very basics of video games but of course, as game devs, we have to uh, tell ourselves that we have the bigger brains, even if it's not true. And um, so here we have this sort of funnel that you see often uh, with like marketing type stuff, this marketing funnel. Or uh, if you have a website, then this is people coming into your website and there's these different stages that you need them to go through to get to the end. Um, which may be like buying a product or something like that, signing up for an email list. Uh, and basically you have people bouncing out of this process the whole time. Um, and so, you know, we talked about this with marketing with um, on Steam and things like that, where you want to funnel people in with, with your marketing, um, making them aware of your game and things like that. And they get to the end where they actually buy your game on Steam. But I think that this process continues. Yay! That's when they buy the game. I think this process continues into your game. Your game has a funnel, obviously, where um, 
even after people buy your game or maybe they're trying a demo, playing it for free, whatever. Once they start playing, if they're hit with this wall of text, imagine if you went to a website that was like that it would be insane you would just immediately bounce off of the website like you you know what you want to do you want to go buy something and they just hit you with this wall of text that you must click through in order to get what you want um so that's what some people do in games and a lot of people are just going to immediately bounce off of that i think you should make your process of getting the player into the game as smooth as possible just like you would with a website yes makes us sad if we bounce all our players away and um so you know textless communication existed for thousands of years humans intrinsically understand imagery it's been around longer than um symbolic characters in alphabets so i think it's like it's like a genetic level understanding and then um, you can see how the latin alphabet evolved from pictograms um like many languages have and um, i think the same is true today of video games where video games have a built-in language that people have come to understand without characters or text that's sort of natural to many gamers if not most gamers so things like you see a crack in the wall that's very suspicious and you think maybe i can break it uh you know healing potions mana potions they're they're blue or red you know uh spikes lava uh glowing poison is always green and glowing for some reason vines you you probably can climb up them there there's countless examples of this kind of language and i and i want to lean into that uh it makes communicating um and teaching the player your game a lot easier if you can lean into that because they probably already have this um language built into their heads if they've played a lot of games so now for my own wall of text, what I try to do or um, keep in my mind when I'm building tutorials and things like that, um, communicating with the player without text, the most important things are that I need to be consistent, um, allow for safe experimentation. So uh, I think players, they want to explore and experiment. Um, if you punish them for that, they're not going to trust you. Uh, they're not going to be able to learn as everything that you want them to. Then that leads into the maintaining a strong player developer trust relationship. So, um, the game works a certain way. And, and of course you have these aha moments and pleasant surprises and things that are like twists on the expectations. But, um, I, I don't want to pull the rug out from the player and do something that feels unfair or cheap or like a trick. So I think that's an important part of communication, setting up those kind of expectations. Um, don't forget the show part of show, don't tell. But also, um, I think it goes both ways. You need both of them. Um, if you're just telling the player what to do with pop-ups pop and stuff, they're just going to click through it, not remember anything or care about anything. And if you don't show them anything, then they're just going to be guessing wildly and... Um, I have seen some puzzle games where um, the player just has no idea what's going on and they're just trying random moves and they might solve it eventually. So I, I try to uh, create puzzles where you can't just solve it by trying random inputs. I need the player to like really grasp um, what happened when they solve it. Not only is it super rewarding, but then, you know, they'll remember later on um, how to use that information and also i think um, you can provide as much optional text and information lore everything like that as you want as long as it's optional you know players that are interested are gonna they'll spend time reading all that stuff but most people just want to dive into the game and see what it's about the most important thing about all of this is that 
when you allow a player to the freedom and safety to experiment it it makes what the player discovers um infinitely more memorable for them um because they're the ones that discovered it and instead of you just presenting them with a bunch of text explaining something that first of all they're probably just going to click and close right away because they want to play the game but if they do spend all the time reading it it's like you know just like weird rote memorization of text that you have to think back to later when you're playing um as a way less uh it's, it's way more difficult to recall that information i think than if you um are playing around in a sandbox or you're um, forced to learn a mechanic through a puzzle, through solving a puzzle. That's why I think text list uh, tutorialization is so um, important and impactful because the, the player is the one that discovers it. And um, I think that really makes it stick um, in their heads. And also it makes the tutorial actually rewarding. So this is the opening screen of Isles of Sea and Sky. Um, and this is a few iterations that it's gone through over time. So in the top left, it was uh, very straightforward. There was uh, just a button that you needed to press to get through this area and go to the next screen. And um, to do that, you had to move some blocks around. So you would learn moving blocks around, pressing the button, and then you would learn about this weird pit thing that you had to cover up to move past which is no longer in the game uh the next iteration was moving to these these bells you ring and uh this stone will on the right side that's blocking the key will like sort of evaporate you can get the key and then you have to use the key to open the lock and then you have to push these arrow blocks that will uh open up the path permanently um and so in order to do anything on this screen you you can run around and push against everything and see what everything does the only thing that um is interactable is the block so first of all the player has to learn that this is a block pushing game and that you know blocks move when you push them so then they'll learn that they have to push this bell and so basically this kind of tutorialization is um you know this gated process where the player has to do the mechanic in order to proceed so the reason that I had to keep iterating on this screen, though, is that um, that's not necessarily good enough for for every player. Uh, I saw over time various players that would push the blocks into the wrong, you know, incorrect positions so that the bell was blocked so they couldn't proceed. So then I added these little arrows. If you push the block up, there's an arrow underneath that one, which tells you to push the other block to the left. So it, it kind of um, holds your hand a little bit on the first screen. But surprisingly, like some people just literally don't see the arrows. Um, I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. So then I added um, on the bottom right screen, you can see there's like carving in the wall showing the, um, the buttons for undo and reset and um, the player wouldn't know it's undo and reset, um, but you know, it's kind of a hint. And if you push the blocks into a fail state, then um, that starts flashing and making sound to hopefully uh, give the player a hint that they can undo or reset. If they press uh, pause, uh, there's the option in the pause menu that says reset. So yeah, even though it seemed like that second uh, iteration was simple enough. Um, it just really wasn't. And I want as many people as possible to enjoy the game. And you can't make assumptions about uh, player perception because everybody perceives things differently. It's interesting because I've seen a lot of uh, really skilled uh, puzzle game fans get stump on, stumped on something that... Um, was really simple for somebody else who was not into puzzle games and maybe they couldn't solve the harder puzzles. So it's everybody's perception is different. So you have to, I think, try to make like a very wide open approachable 
funnel into your game loop so that you can get as many people up to speed as possible. Here's a more detailed uh, look at that first room. As you can see, the, the first room teaches like five or six mechanics. This is what I was talking about when I said that I, tr I try to like respect the intelligence of my players because I don't think it's necessary to have like a whole screen that teaches the player, oh, you can push a block and then and then the player moves on to the next screen and then the next screen is just ringing a bell and so on and so forth. All of this initial stuff is so simple that I think it, it, it works in one screen. This is a more complex example later in the game where I'm introducing these new mechanics on this new island, uh, these rivers that flow in one direction, um, how blocks interact with them, a new type of block, which is a, a water block that does all this weird stuff like float on water and uh, extend rivers. And so there's a lot to teach. Um, and I will uh, show some gameplay explaining how that all works. Something that's important here is how many little puzzles there are in this opening area. By the way, this is like uh, four different screens. So it's not like this is all crammed into one screen, but um, the fact that there's so many um, little puzzles allows the concepts that the player learns from the introductory basic sort of tutorial action, they are reiterated in other places so that, you know, to sort of drive it home, uh, give the player practice. And also there's like little twists on the mechanic to make it uh, more fun and interesting. And so when the player arrives here, they um, must enter these rivers in order to proceed. If you go into this one, you learn that, oh, can't go that way. Go into this one, then you learn that you float down the river uh, in that direction and you can't change direction or step out of the river. Here you're going to um, learn what blocks, that blocks do the same thing in the river. They can be transported. Um, and then now this is a puzzle. So um, the player is going to learn um, about the rivers and, and the blocks and um, get a reward too. So open up this path. That's the basic um you know introduction to these rivers you can come over to this screen here um, and there's a puzzle there um some players who like to like try to explore everything they can in a room before moving on will um realize that they can open up this path by solving the puzzle in a different way um so once we have this open we can clear that out of the way and then I can clear the blue uh, stone out of the way. And that lets us enter through this path. Um, push this block to fill this hole so we then we can enter here. Now this is open. Okay, sorry about that. So, this might be the first introduction to the water block if the player did that. Um, all they can do is push up and see that it extends the river covers that spike pit because if you enter without doing that then you get killed on the spikes so um then you know this player can go this way um you have to enter, learn more about these water blocks um, to proceed this way if we go back and let's say that player went left first if they go up um there's nothing you can do yet but you can sort of scout out this room here so they have to go this way or left or right um there's more um you know interacting with the rivers and the blocks and uh, again this is a puzzle so it's not just like forcing the player to go through some motion that's not fun or interesting it, it is a discovery um so the tutorials have these, you know, eureka moments that make them really effective, I think. And then, um, you know, there's a whole puzzle here. 
two puzzles in this room. Um, this is where you learn an, a new aspect of the water block, which is that it can float on water, uh, which is important because you, you need to put a block on that button there. There's a pit in the way. If you try to cross like a normal block, you're going to fall in the water. But if you push this up and then you think, oh, okay, it can float on water. Um, then I can push it over there. Sweet. And um, so, and then there's a lot of optional puzzles um, in Isles of Sea and Sky. So, um, you know, they could try to go for that one or they can just move on. They can go back to it later. Um, so yeah, I will, uh, let's go back to the other side. And um, here you build um, like a circuit with the with the water blocks in the river. So that's another important um, part of the or mechanic on this island. And so yeah, and then um, you know here's more um, water blocks with with um, rivers, and it's just sort of like reiterating some of the puzzles are more difficult than than others um and so not only is it part of the game with rewards um but it but it is uh teaching the player too because they have to um you know interact with these things to to proceed so So there are many other examples uh, and ways of doing textless tutorials. The way that I do it in Isles of Sea and Sky is um, gated or player led where they have to, um, the player has to learn the mechanic initially in order to proceed, but then there are lots of opportunities to explore and experiment um, and do optional puzzles and things like that. In the game portal, in the opening area, um, you can grab these objects and pick them up while you're listening to um, the narrator. So that's sort of like the player opting to interact with things. And it's an important mechanic later because you have to use the same um, method to actually pick up the blocks that you need to use in the puzzles. And then after that, it becomes gated initially where um, you need to put a block on the red button in order to see what the red button does, which it opens a door. For Super Mario 64, um, it's this sort of like playground tutorial where you're just given this wide open space right away. The control set is and move set is super fun on its own. The player is just thrown right into this amazing interactive experience right away that they want to experiment uh, with. And you're gonna learn very quickly how to do all these flips and all this crazy stuff. Uh, then you have um, in this Kirby game, which uh, somebody in my Discord community um, pointed out to me uh, because I haven't actually played this game, but um, this game has these, uh, a few of these newer Kirby games, I guess. They have these uh, very dynamic signboards that um, you know show you a button to press and actually show what the action is going to do, and then they out they will actually change um, once you once you do the thing, uh, which is really cool because um, this doesn't actually stop the player. Um, this is a totally optional thing, and so a experienced player that's just going through the game again doesn't even have to do this they could skip this one up if they want they could also um, they can also just blow through the opening area without um, paying attention to any of these signboards so i think that's that's a very excellent um, example not sure how it would work with the puzzle game uh, but it definitely works for this action game so and um, there's another uh, one that i encountered with when doing research which i would call sink or swim which um 
seems to be in some action games where the player is just like thrown into like an initial fight or a boss battle or something and they have to learn the controls or they just lose <laughs> and um that's really cool and i think it works for for that type of game i'm not sure how it would work with a puzzle game unless it was like an action puzzle game um or a thinky game but um i'm sure there are many more amazing examples and i would love to hear about them so um thank you so much for for watching my talk and if you have any uh, great examples of textless tutorials um, or any ideas uh, for how I can improve this um, slide deck, let me know. Um, thanks for watching. All right, there we go. Thank you, Jason, for sending that talk over. Uh, that was wonderful. If anybody has any questions for Jason, um about textless tutorialization about Isles of Sea and Sky or anything. I can't wait for Isles of Sea and Sky. I kind of had to like stop watching a bit of that talk because I didn't want too many spoilers. <laughs> so there's some bits I was like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna listen, I'm gonna watch for a bit, and then I came back in towards the end. Um yeah, thank you so much for Jason for doing that talk. Um yeah, so since since that wasn't live, if you have any questions, please head to the appropriate thread in Discord, thinkygames.com slash Discord. It's the final time I have to say that. <sighs> because it is the end of ThinkyCon. Whoa, day three is over. We have done all of the talks. It has been amazing. Thank you so much to everybody that joined. Thank you so much to the speakers. It's one thing that's become like really apparent to me is how amazing it is to have such like a diverse range of speakers talking like we've got everything from like the super mathy stuff to things about like there's almost there's almost conflicting ideas like here's the super mathy stuff the super niche and it's like inside thinky games thinky community stuff and then we've had the people saying like oh if we want to reach an audience we've got to break down some pieces and i think having those two things together is like how we go forward with thinking games and how we get more people to you know love thinkiness and exploring thinky games and playing more of them and yeah so seeing this is is i think it's, it's wonderful um also thank you to luis who i just saw in the chat with the love hearts thank you luis uh for so to be clear so i've done all the like running the the streams and everything but luis was the one to contact all the speakers and get them arranged get them scheduled all that stuff so big thank you to Luis. also big thank you to corey for posting uh various uh articles and things uh on the website and sharing some links in discord and all that kind of stuff um and yeah, once again, thank you to, to, to everybody that joined. Oh, I'm also going to shout out. So Luis recommended the tool that we use, Video Ninja, VDO dot, this VDO dot Ninja. It's an amazing tool. And it's what we use to like have everybody join a call and stream it through OBS to YouTube. And we've had like no technical problems at all. Like, not at all. It's been amazing. Uh, and that's kind of crazy over however many hours it's been. So, yeah, shout out to that. Shout out to everybody that's helped. Shout out to everybody that's joined. Thank you so much. And please, once again, like, I think so many developers could learn so much from these talks. Please share them. If you're in communities that do game development, if you've got a local game development community, if you're in, like, subreddits or... Uh, I don't know, it's different social media things where you, there's like people you could share this with, please do. Um, I'm sure they would appreciate it. As I've said multiple times, there have been, um, uh, we will definitely be putting up um, individual videos of each talk. So if you do want to wait until those are out before sharing them, that is totally fine. I'll try to get to that as quickly as possible, but you might have to be a little bit patient. Thank you for all the thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that is everything. Time to have an actual weekend day tomorrow. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and time to sleep as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you, folks. Uh, and hopefully see you next year for ThinkyCon 2025. Gosh, that's scary. All right. <laughs> Goodbye.